Hello everyone and welcome to our Selenium course. We're really excited to have you here. My name is Ben and I'll be your instructor. I have over five years of Python experience. I've taught programming courses on Udemy in the past and I've also taught them in the community. In my free time, I love to play guitar. So why should you take this course? First, you'll learn how to use Selenium for web testing automation. You'll also practice scraping data from real websites. And we'll use the page object model design pattern in order to structure our web testing. All of this will help you level up your Python skills and help you move forward in your career. Now, what will you get from this course? We have comprehensive video lectures on Selenium functionality with example code that you can download or follow along with. We have three guided projects to help you put your Selenium chops to work in the real world. And on the Udemy platform, you'll find a community of fellow students. And once you finish the course, you'll get a certificate of completion that you can post on your website or on your LinkedIn page. If all of that sounds good to you, we hope to see you in the course. Hello everyone and welcome to this video where we'll talk about some of the curriculum that we'll be going through in this Selenium course. We're going to start off with some of the basic elements of Selenium and the first one is really locating page elements so for example links or images on a web page. We'll learn how to do this for example using CSS or using XPath as a way of finding these elements. We'll talk about page navigation and also how to fill in forms with Selenium. We'll learn how to interact with text boxes, drop downs, radio buttons, and all sorts of other web elements. Next, we'll talk about weights in Selenium. So there's two kinds, explicit and implicit. And if you're not sure what those are, don't worry. We'll cover those in that section. And then we'll talk about the page object model, which is a Python design pattern specifically for Selenium. Finally, we're going to be using the page object model once we've learned about it for web testing. Our course is structured in a straightforward way. We'll have video lectures with slides that we'll go through, and then we'll head over to either VS Code or our Jupyter Notebooks to go through example code for demonstrating the concepts or functionality that we've just talked about. There are also three guided projects throughout the course that will help cement your knowledge. In terms of the course requirements, we expect that you know some Python and that you have it installed already. We also expect you have an integrated development environment, something like Visual Studio Code, which is what I'll be using, but any other Python IDE will be fine too. We'll be using Jupyter Notebooks for a fair amount of the course as well and we'll be using Google Chrome as our browser for Selenium. So you should have those installed, although we'll go through some of this in our setup section. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture where we'll go through our Python environment and web driver setup. For this course, I'll be using Python 3.8.10, but other versions are probably okay to use. You can download Python if you haven't already from the link provided on this slide. Because we'll be using Selenium to interact with Google Chrome, you'll need to have Google Chrome installed. The version that I'll be using is Google Chrome 108.0, and this is an important note. You'll need to make sure that the Chrome driver that you download matches your Google Chrome version. If you're using a different version of Google Chrome, make sure you download the appropriate Chrome driver, not just the one that I have downloaded. In terms of Python package requirements, you should see the requirements.txt file on the GitHub page, the GitHub repo rather, for this course. If you'd like the link for downloading some of these web drivers, we'll be using Google Chrome, which you can download on the link provided here 
But if you'd like to go through the course using a different browser, you can download the appropriate web driver from the links provided here. In the course, I'll be using the settings.py file in the GitHub repo for a number of different things. The first one is that I use it to store the URLs that are used in this course so that you can just import them into your Jupyter Notebooks. I'll also use it to store the path to the Chrome driver executable so that we don't have to write that out all the time. It also stores some other useful or shared information that we'll use throughout the course. And just a note, if you find any of the websites in the settings.py file or the websites that we use in this course are out of date when you take the course or they don't look like what they look like in the videos, you can try using the Internet Archive or the Wayback Machine to find a version of the website that's close to what we're using. I'll show you how to do that in the following part of the setup video. So now we'll head over to our desktop to get our environment set up. All right, so here we are. We're going to get started with setting up our Python environment. And I'm going to be doing this on Windows, but it's pretty similar uh, for the other operating systems too. So like a Mac or if you're on a Linux operating system, the steps should be more or less the same. So first I'm going to go to my documents folder, uh, and then I'm going to make a directory for the Selenium course. So, so I'll call this Selenium Udemy and then I'll go into that directory. Now, the next thing that you want to do is you want to set up a Python virtual environment uh, for this course so that you're not having a whole bunch of problems with dependencies and all that. So you're gonna, you can run python-m uh, vn and then call it whatever you want. I'm gonna say dot selenium vn. So that's gonna go into that dot selenium vn uh, directory. So you just got to wait for that to get created. Okay, so now that's done. We've got our virtual environment. To activate it on Windows, uh, you have to call the activate script like this. Uh, so on Mac or on Linux, I think it's a source, and then you go to the uh, bin bin slash activate folder uh, directory in that virtual environment. Uh, so now we're inside this virtual environment. You can see that here with the dot selenium vn. So the virtual environment is activated. If you want to deactivate it, you just have to write deactivate and then we're out of it. Uh, so I'm going to activate it again. Uh, so scripts slash activate. So now we're back in here. So we want some things, one of which is Jupyter Notebook. We don't have that, so if I try to run that, it's not a recognized internal or external command. Uh, so that's okay. Uh, we'll get our requirements installed. So let me open up, let's see, do I have VS Code? I don't have VS Code open. So let's open up VS Code. I'm just going to set up a couple files in here. Uh, so let me open up a folder. Uh, we'll go to the folder we just created, so that's in Selenium Udemy. So select that folder. All right, and so here we are. Basically, there's nothing in there. We've just got the virtual environment folder. So there's a few um, files I'm going to set up here. You can clone the Git repository. I'm not going to do that for now. I'm just going to do this as a one-off, but if you'd like, you can also git clone our, our repository to get some of these files. Um, so I've got a requirements.txt, settings.py file, uh, and then I also use a environment file, but this is optional, so you don't have to do this one, and I'll show you why in a second. So first things first, requirements, we need to install all of our packages. If you go to the GitHub, for this course, there's a requirements.txt file. It has all of the Python requirements, the package requirements that you need for the course, uh, along with those versions that you need. So we can just take a look at that. Just control all, control copy, 
and then come back over here to the requirements. And I think most of this comes from Selenium and Jupyter Notebook, uh, or Jupyter rather, because Jupyter has a lot of stuff that comes along with it. So then what we can do, we can do pip install dash r, and then requirements.txt, and that'll install, start to install all of our requirements. Uh, so for now, I'm gonna fast forward ahead until this uh, is finished. All right, so now we've got everything installed, all of the packages that we need for the course. We can check this out. Let's try to run Jupyter Notebook this time, and it should open up in our browser now, and then we should be good to go, and we can start um, start setting up uh, Jupyter Notebooks, right? So we can open up a Jupyter Notebook and work in there uh, if we'd like. Now there's a couple more things to do with the setup. So the first one is this settings.py file. Uh, so all this is, is this just stores some constants that are useful, things like the URLs for the course. So all the URLs in, are in there, um, as well as the path for the Chrome driver. So I'm gonna copy this. Uh, we can s copy that and put it in our settings.py file. And again, this is just so that I don't have to type out these URLs, or you don't have to type out these URLs, you can just import the constant, right? Because the URL is not gonna change. So then we can save that. Uh, the last piece here is this environment variable. This is optional. I did this because I was programming on, um, programming on a Windows machine and a Linux machine, and I didn't wanna have to keep changing the Chrome driver path. So if you're only using one machine, you can just say, you know, Chrome driver path is equal to whatever the directory is, right? Uh, some directory path, right? You can do that if you're only working on one machine. Um, so I'm gonna keep this as is. Uh, and all this does is it gets the Chrome driver path variable from this configuration file. So just Chrome driver path, and then you have some sort of uh, string there for it. Uh, so we've got our Python environment set up. The next piece is you should download the Chrome driver. So make sure that you check to match the version. So for example, if you have Chrome version 107, download the 107 Chrome driver. I've got Chrome version 108, so I downloaded Chrome driver 108. Uh, so the way you can check that is you go to Chrome, then you can go to your settings, right? Just this triple dot here, check the settings about Chrome, uh, and it'll tell you the version there. So I've got version 108, so that's the one that I'll have to download. Uh, now, in terms of the where the Chrome driver is, the Chrome driver path, I just stuck mine in a folder called web drivers. So if I click on this properties here, it should tell me the, the path for it, right? So then I can just copy this. Let's copy that. And then if I go back to my environment file, uh, then it's, um, what is this? Uh, Chrome driver. Right, that's the name. The name of the executable is just Chrome driver. So I can save that and then that'll be, that's my environment variable, the one environment variable that I have. Uh, so we've got all the constants in our settings file. Uh, let's go back over to uh, the Jupyter notebook. Now you should be able to, from, from that settings file, so from settings, you can import uh, let's say the Chrome driver path, right? So now we've got that path variable. So if I print Chrome driver path, then it'll give me some sort of string, right? And that's where the Chrome driver is. And then I can use that when I need, um, when I need to use it with Selenium and we can check. So from Selenium import web driver, right? Okay, we've got Selenium there. So we've got everything that we need. Uh, a few more things. If 
you have trouble importing the constants from that settings file, you can check, you might need to change your uh, environment variables. So you can edit the system environment variables on Windows. Just look for this uh, or search for environment variables. This will open up the system properties. In the advanced tab, you can go to environment variables. Uh, and you can try adding a Python path. So this is the path to your directory. You can add that variable to the user. If that doesn't work, you can try adding it to the um, to the system variables as well. So you can see I've got a Python path in both places, uh, and that's why I'm able to do the imports here. Again, if you're on a Mac or a Linux, look up how to add environment variables there for your system. Um, okay, so that's one part. Uh, so you should be able to import all of those URLs. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is if you take this course and you find that the URLs don't look um, the way you expect them to. So let's say python.org, right? So if I go to python.org right now, uh, let's open that up and just say python.org, right? And it takes me here and it looks a certain way and maybe it looks the way that it does on the video. If you find that the website has changed uh, to maybe to such an extent that it no longer looks like what you're expecting it to look like or what it looks like in the videos, the other option is you can use something called the Wayback Machine on the Internet Archive. Uh, so if I go to python.org here and browse the history, it'll give me a calendar with the times that it's been scraped. So we're in December. Uh, so if you wanted to get a website or a, a version of the Python website that looks like something I'm working on in the course, you can go to one of these snapshots and it'll take you to um, a snapshot of the website, right? So let's just wait for this to load. Now the one thing is that the HTML will be slightly different, right? So the main thing is you'll just have this banner up here at the top that you'll have to work around. Um, but this is just an option if you find that any of the websites we use have changed um, significantly between the time this course was recorded and the time that you're using it. You can always go to the Wayback Machine and try to find a version of the website that more closely resembles what we're using. But for now, that should be everything for getting uh, getting set up for the Selenium course. So we've got our Jupyter Notebook working, we've got Chrome, we've got the Chrome driver downloaded and installed from the Chrome driver website uh, so we can get started with coding. All right, thanks for joining this lecture, everyone. And in the next section, we'll go through how to use Chrome DevTools as well as what Selenium is and how it works. See you soon. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on Selenium use cases where we'll talk about the things that you can use Selenium for. For an idea of how you can use Selenium for your work, we'll have three guided projects in this course. The first one will be a web scraper for Wikipedia data. The second one will be a form filler for a banned booking form on a live website. And finally, we'll write a Python unit test for testing a booking form using the page object model. To show you what these use cases look like, let's head over to our Jupyter Notebooks and VS Code to see some examples. All right, so we're gonna go through some of the use cases for Selenium that we're gonna cover in the guided projects in this course. Our first guided project is going to be a web scraper or we'll do some uh, data scraping from Wikipedia. So I've got Wikipedia up in the browser here using Selenium already. Now what we're going to go through uh, or go, go through and do is we can do this here. Uh, we're basically going to go through using Python. So I'm just going to run this code. Don't worry about what it's doing for now because we'll go through that in the guided project. Uh, but basically what we can do with this is collect a whole bunch of data from Wikipedia. 
So you can see here on this page, you've got links for the Low Memorial Library, Columbia University, and that's the data that we've collected using Selenium, uh, using the, the web scraper that we've built in Selenium. So that's one example of something that you can use Selenium for, is that you can scrape information off of a web page, a web page like Wikipedia. Our second project is going to be a form filler. So we're going to use Selenium to fill out a form. You can see how this might be related to automating things like making reservations or bookings for um, booking for flights or restaurants, whatever you want. Uh, so let me just get this Selenium, Selenium driver up and running. Uh, I'm going to move this over to the side. And so we've got this Goldbugs website. This is a band website. And we're going to use Selenium to fill out this booking form here where you need to fill in your first name, last name, email, subject, message, and all that. Uh, so what I'm going to do, let's just run through this. Uh, I'm going to run all these cells. Don't worry too much about, again, what's going on because we'll go through this in the project. Um, and keep going through that. And then we can submit the form. So just so that you can see here, right, I didn't touch this browser. We did this all through... We did this all through Selenium, so all of this stuff is filled out now. And then we can submit the form if we'd like uh, in order to book the band, right? So that's that's the uh, second use case really is for automating uh, things on, on the web. And that's the second guided project that we'll be going through. The uh, other use case, the last use case that we'll be going through is uh, to use it for testing, to automate web testing. So I've got VS Code up here and I've got three files up. This is going to be our last guided project. Uh, it's basically using something called the page object model to test the form that we just filled out, right? So this is like taking that form filling to the next level. We're going to test that if we don't fill out the required fields on the form, uh, the website will reject that submission. If we do fill out the required fields, then the website will take that submission from us. Uh, so those are going to be the tests that we're going to run. We have some other files that we'll fill out here, um, again, in that guided project. So that'll make more sense once you get to it. Um, and so let's just run this so that you can see what this use case looks like. We're basically running a unit hit test here on the form. So it opens up the websites, fills things out, uh, encounters an error, then doesn't encounter an error. And then we've checked our tests have run successfully. So we know that our booking form on this website works the way we expect it to. So that's the third use case for Selenium that we're going to be covering in this course. If all of that sounds interesting to you, we hope you'll purchase the course. And if you've already purchased the course, we'll see you in the next section where we'll start to go through Selenium and how we use it. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our introduction to Chrome DevTools. We'll be using Chrome DevTools a lot in this course, so it's important to understand what it is and how to use it. So what is Chrome DevTools? Chrome DevTools are a set of web developer tools built directly in the Google Chrome browser. That's from their documentation. Basically, it just makes your life a lot easier when you're trying to understand how web pages work. If you'd like to look at the documentation, we provided a link for you on this slide. We'll go through a couple of the useful tabs that are good to know about, and then we'll head over to Chrome to show you what they look like in the real world. First off is the Elements tab. 
This is useful for inspecting the DOM and DOM elements when you're interacting with a web page. In terms of our Selenium use case for this tab, it's basically everything. We'll be using it throughout the course from the start to the finish in order to find where elements on the web page are and how to access them. The console tab is also pretty useful. You can use it to view logged messages from the web page or to run JavaScript on your own. Our Selenium use case for this tab is mostly for verifying locators on our page, especially while using the XPath. If you don't know what that is, don't worry, we'll go through it in a later lecture. And finally, the application tab. You can use this tab to view and edit storage variables or cookies on the web page. In terms of our Selenium use case, we can use this to verify stored variables or cookies if we're using those for our testing. Let's head over to our Chrome browser now to get a look at the Chrome DevTools application. All right, so we're gonna take a look at Chrome DevTools. So the first step is to get your Chrome browser open. And I've gone to the goldbugs.com for this uh, section or this lecture so that we can take a look at this website. It's a pretty straightforward website. There are some sections, there's a booking form, uh, and that's about that's about it. You can go to really any website that you want to uh, to to get familiar with Chrome DevTools, though. So now, if I want to open up the Chrome DevTools console, I can right-click and then hit Inspect, and that will pop it open. And the tab I'll be open to is this Elements tab here, which is what gives us the DOM on the page. So I can click on any element on the page. If I scroll down to the booking form or maybe on this button, please read our blog. What I can do is I can use this select a element in the page to inspect it tool. And then I can click on that and it'll take me to that section of the DOM here. So I can see this button is actually an A tag. So it's an anchor tag. It'll take us to the slash blog section of the website. It has these classes on it. Uh, and some other parameters and then this text inside of it. So some things to know about the elements tab that's very useful. Uh, first you can double click on things uh, to select it. So if you want to copy the class here, right, or maybe you want to get an ID off of something so that you don't have to type this out, you can just double click on it and then, you know, control C to copy and paste that and use that in your code. So that's a good thing to know. The other good thing to know is that you can right click on these DOM elements, and then you have a whole bunch of options. So you can add or edit attributes. That's more if you're trying to mess with the web page. What's more of interest to us is this copy section. So there's a few things that we're going to be interested in here. Uh, the main one is really the XPath and the full XPath. If you don't know what those are, those are just ways of referring to this element using something called XPath notation. Uh, so we'll be covering that in a later section, which is related to how you select web elements on a page. Or you could copy, you know, the styles or the selector. So that's the CSS selector, which could help us find this element on a page as well. So those are just some useful things to know about the elements tab for uh, the Chrome DevTools. Uh, so the console here, uh, so this is where you'll get some errors if there are errors on the page. So it looks like there's a couple of errors on this page. But then you can also uh, use it to run uh, JavaScript if you need to. Um, so down here at the bottom you could do something, let's, um, not that, you can just do console.log, for example. This is JavaScript for just printing something to the log. So hello world. And that'll just print there, and you can see that. So that's one way of using it if you need to test out some JavaScript for whatever reason. The other way that we'll uh, use it sometimes is with dollar sign $x, and that's for checking that X path. Uh, so again, we'll go through the X path, and you'll learn more about it in that section. Uh, but just as an example, slash slash a will give us all the anchors on the page. So now we'll get this list and each one of those is some sort of 
um, some sort of anchor element on the page and then we can get inf information about it. So that's the other use case for the console here is that you can use it to test your XPath strings before you write them. And again, don't worry too much about how XPath works. We'll cover that in a, in a later lecture. Um, so sources, so this is just uh, sources on the page. It'll have some files or whatnot. We're not going to mess around too much with this one. Network, uh, network we also won't mess around too much with. Um, so there is, if you want to change the way the web page loads, you can throttle here based on certain presets or custom settings for throttling. Uh, but we won't worry too much about the network now. Uh, we also won't worry too much about performance or memory. Those aren't very important to us. Application is one area where we will go into a bit. So this is where you'll have variables for local storage or variables for session storage that you can access through Selenium, as well as cookies on the page. So I don't think there's any, I guess there are a couple cookies on this page. So you can see their names, their values, um, and other information about them. And we'll interact with this more when we get to that, that section on Selenium. And there are few, uh, some other things here as well. But again, it's not really important to what we're doing um, with Selenium. Security tab, uh, and then there's some other, some other ones here. Um, the other thing to go over is the dock side for the console. So I like to have it on the bottom, but if you want to have it on the side, you can have it on the right there, you can have it on the left, um, you can have it free floating if you want. Uh, I usually like to have it on the bottom. Uh, and then there's some more tools, but you know, the main things that we're going to be using for Selenium are really the elements uh, and maybe the console sometime, but elements far more than anything. The last thing to be aware of is this uh, device toolbar. So this is where you can emulate devices using Chrome tools. So we've got it on a Samsung Galaxy here. You can make it a an iPad and it'll show up with that that ratio, that aspect. So this is you know 820 by 1180, 30% because it's obviously not full size. So if you want to emulate uh, some sort of mobile device, you can use that with with Chrome Dev Tools as well. Uh, and as always, if you want to learn more about Chrome DevTools and how they work, uh, I'd advise you to go to the documentation because there's much more there than we're ever going to cover in this course. Again, like I said, the important things for our work with Selenium are really going to be navigating the DOM with uh, the Elements tab, as well as clicking on things on the page, uh, and then occasionally maybe the console and uh, you know devices or the application tab. But more than anything, it'll be the, the Elements tab. OK, so that's a quick uh, kind of rocket overview of Chrome DevTools and how it works and how you can use it. And you'll see more about how we use it with Selenium in later lectures. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our Introduction to Selenium. In this lecture, we'll provide you a brief overview of what Selenium is. Hello everyone, and welcome to our Introduction to Selenium. In this lecture, we'll provide you with a brief overview of what Selenium is and how it works. So what is Selenium and what does it do? From the official Selenium website, Selenium automates browsers. That's it. That's all Selenium does. If you'd like to read more from the official site, the link is there on this slide. And if you'd like to read the Python documentation for the Python API, the link is provided here as well. What are some of the use cases for Selenium? You can use Selenium for web scraping or for data collection from websites. You can use it for taking screenshots or captures of the way a website looks or certain web elements on a website. You can also use Selenium for website testing and automation. And finally, you can use it for the automation of any sort of 
browser-based tasks. So why use Selenium and not just use APIs or HTTP requests, things like that? Basically, we need to use Selenium whenever we need to interact with a web page to get information or to check that something works as we intend it to work. Selenium enables browser automation via something called a web driver. The way this works is outlined in the diagram below. So for us, we have the language that we're going to use Selenium with. In our case, it's Python. You could use it with Java or something else, but we'll be using Python. Next, you'll have the API or the package that will help you interact with Selenium. So we have our Selenium Python package. Next, we'll have some sort of web driver. The web driver is basically the interface between your Selenium API and the browser. If you want to work with a Firefox browser, for example, your web driver will be something called Gecko Driver. That's the web driver that allows you to interact with a Firefox browser. In this course, however, we'll be using Chrome, so our web driver will be the Chrome driver. That will be our interface between Python and Selenium and the Chrome driver, or the Chrome browser, rather. To use Selenium with Python, we need to have the following installed. Python, of course, will need a Selenium package, so this is python-selenium. We'll need a browser-specific web driver, like we saw in the previous slide, and then we'll need that browser, the browser that matches the web driver we want to use. And just a note, the browser software and version should match the web driver that you're using. So if you have Chrome version 104, for example, you won't be able to use Chrome driver version 105. You'll either have to upgrade Chrome to version 105 or find a version 104 of the Chrome driver. To start your Selenium session in Python, we'll have to do a couple steps. It looks like a lot, but it will be pretty straightforward and you'll get used to doing it pretty quickly. We'll have to import the web driver, import a service for the specific browser we'll be using, instantiate a service object using a file path to the web driver, instantiate the web driver using the browser or service that we've just instantiated, and then once that's up, you can get the URL that you want to go to. Finally, whenever you're done using your web driver, you should always quit your web driver. What this looks like in Python code is shown here. So from Selenium, you'll import WebDriver. From selenium.webdriver.chrome.service, you'll import the service class. And then you can set up your driver. So you make your service object with the path to your WebDriver executable. Then you set up your driver, and you'll just pass the service as the service parameter. And then you can get your URL of interest. Once you're done working with that URL, you can quit the driver. Let's head over to a Jupyter Notebook now to see how this works. All right, we've got our Jupyter Notebook open, so this is where we're going to start with learning just how you open up a Selenium web driver session. The first thing you need to do is you need to run through your imports. So that's what we're going to do. So from Selenium, we need the web driver. So let's import web driver. And then we'll also need the service class. So from selenium.webdriver.chrome.service, let's import uh, service. All right, so we'll run those imports. From our settings file, we're going to import some utility um, constants. So that's our Chrome driver path, which is the path to the directory where we're storing our Chrome driver executable. Uh, and then I'm going to get the URL for python.org, which is really all it is. You can use a string if you want, but I'm just going to do that import. Next, to start the Chrome web driver, you first have to do a service. First, have to start up that service. It used to be different where you could just do webdriver.chrome and then pass the executable path, but now you have to do it this way. So, service. We want the executable path. That's going to be 
the path to our Chrome driver executable, instantiate that, and now we can instantiate our driver. So all we have to do is webdriver.chrome, and then we've got a service parameter where we will pass that service object. And now when we hit shift enter to run that cell, we'll get a Chrome WebDriver session that pops up here. So you can see this banner that tells us Chrome is being controlled by automated test software. That's our Selenium, right? That's our, that's our Python that we're writing here. Now, if you wanna get a URL, all you have to do is driver.git. We're gonna get that Python URL. So I'll run that. It'll open up in the browser here. So it's taking us to python.org, right? And now if I wanted to, I could do whatever other stuff I needed to do in Selenium. So I could run a search, I could test some buttons, I could check things, verify that they're working as expected, anything that I need to do in Selenium once I've gotten that URL via driver.git. And as always, a good thing to do or to remember to have at the end of all your scripts or your Jupyter notebooks is driver.quit so that you can quit that web driver session. Uh, and so you don't have that Chrome browser just hanging out there. So if I go down to this tab here now, you'll see the Chrome, Chrome isn't there anymore because I've quit out of it. So that's the basics of how you set up a Selenium session. We'll be using that a lot so you'll get very familiar with it, but this is the bare bones of, of how you get a Selenium session up and going. Thanks everybody for joining and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our first lecture in the section on locating page elements in Selenium. In this lecture, we'll be talking about locating page elements using CSS selectors. In Selenium, we can use a CSS syntax or CSS identifiers to find elements in the web page. Some of the important parts to know are ones that you may have already seen if you've written CSS in the past. This includes HTML tags, so things like A for anchor, div for div, h1 for header one, so on and so forth. It includes class names, and you can specify this using the period notation or the dot notation. So if we wanted to specify a div with a class name of my div class, we could write div dot my div class in order to find that element in Selenium. And finally, we can use IDs as well. And these are specified with the hashtag or pound sign symbol. So if you wanted to find an anchor with an ID of my a ID, you could type a pound sign my AID to find that element. As I mentioned, if you've written CSS before, this should look familiar to you, but it's common in other areas as well. So you can see it in Emmet shortcuts or Emmet cheat codes for building HTML pages in editors like VS Code. From a broader view of things, all the ways of locating page elements with Selenium really depend on two parts. So first, we'll want to know how we want to find the page element. That's the by part of locating the page element. And then we'll have a string of interest. So what's the string that tells us what to find? In terms of locating page elements with CSS selectors, for example, our by would be a CSS selector, and the string would be whatever CSS selector is of interest. So if we wanted to find all divs, we could write div, pass a string of div, or if we wanted to find something with a class name or an ID, again, we could use that syntax from the previous slide as our string. In terms of the methods of interest to us, there are two web driver methods in order to find the element or elements on the page. So first we have find element, which will find one or the first element if there's multiple elements satisfying those locator conditions. And then we've also got find elements with an S, plural. So that will find all of the elements 
that satisfy those locator conditions. Let's look at some code examples to see how this works before we go into our Jupyter Notebooks. So to start with, we have to have a new import, which is that from selenium.webdriver.common.by, where we import the by class. And the by class holds all the constants, really, or, yeah, all the constants, in order to specify what way we're using to look for page elements. The other imports should be familiar to you from previous lectures. Once we have our imports, we'll set up our driver as before. And then we can get the URL of interest, so driver.git, and then you pass the URL. And then we can find elements by a CSS selector. So the examples are highlighted here in bold. So if we wanted to find an element on the page, we could write driver.findElement. Then the first parameter would be by.csSSelector. So that's the way that we're looking for things. And then we'll pass a string with some sort of CSS selector. And if we wanted to find all the elements satisfying or matching that CSS selector string, then we would use find elements with an S, plural again, but with basically the same parameters. So we'd still say by.css selector and then pass some sort of CSS selector string. Now that we've talked about how we locate page elements using CSS, select, CSS selectors and what those CSS selectors are, let's head over to our Jupyter Notebooks and get some practice with this functionality. Okay, so here we are in our Jupyter Notebook and we're going to start off with our imports. So from Selenium we need to import the web driver. Then from we need to import the Chrome service. So from Selenium dot webdriver dot chrome dot service. Let's import the service class. And then finally, like we saw in the lecture, we need to import that by class. So that's in webdriver dot common dot by and we'll import the by class. So that's everything we need from Selenium. From our settings file we can import the Chrome driver path and then we're gonna look at the books to scrape URL so this is a practice website. Finally we'll set up our service and our web driver so we have to instantiate the service object. So let's do executable path is the Chrome driver path. Set that up and then set up the web driver. Web driver dot Chrome and the service parameter is the service we just set up. And then we'll wait and we should get our Chrome browser pop up here. Let me just move this over so that we can see the code as well. Uh, and then let's get the get the URL that we've got that we're going to take a look at. So driver.git books to scrape URL and it takes us to our website. Okay so let's take a look at how we find page elements with CSS selectors. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is this alert here, this warning or this div. So we can open up Chrome tools. Let's pin this to the bottom and then select that div and let's go to the elements and pull this down so that we can read it. Uh, and so we've got this div here. So what we're looking at for this warning is we've got a div with a class of alert and alert warning. So if we want to find that in Selenium, what we can do, let's call it element one, is we can do driver.findElement. And what we want to search by is the CSS selector. And the string of interest is going to be div.alert.alertWarning. So we do that, we've selected that element. Let's verify that by taking a look at the text attribute. 
And so we've got warning, this is a demo website, blah, 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 which is what it says here. So that's great. We've got that element selected. Now let's take a look at uh, another element. Let's try this again with maybe something different. Let's take a look at this unordered list here. So let's click on this A. So you see we've got this unordered list. Um, and it's a nav list. So if we click on or if we click on this in the inspector, you can see we've got that whole list of book categories. And if we want to select that, we can select this unordered list, class, nav, nav list. So let's do that. We'll call that element two, driver dot find element. Uh, we're searching by CSS selector again. And this is gonna be, let's make this on a new line. UL, so unordered list, dot nav, dot nav list, because those are the two classes. So now we've got it selected. Uh, if we want to take a look at the text, there's no text there, or there is text, but it's that un, it's that list of things. So it's got the new line. It's not formatted very nicely. So let's delete this. Uh, let's delete that cell just so that it's easier to read. Um, and so we've taken a look at how to select things with CSS selectors using that class dot notation. But let's try, let's try looking for something with an ID. So what we're going to look for, let's do a control F, let's find by string. There's something in here, there's a div uh, messages, or let's look for messages. There's this div ID here, so there's a couple of divs under the page header. Uh, so we've got messages and we've got promotions, so we can select one of those using that ID syntax. So element by CSS selector. And then we want div pound sign messages. If we take a look at the text, it's an empty div right now, so there should be no text. So you see we've got an empty string. Uh, and then finally, the last thing we're going to take a look at, since we can do this with all um, all HTML tags, is let's take a look at the images. So I'm going to click on this. So you see we've got an image here, and it's got an alt uh, alt text. So let's select that image, or select all the images, rather. And we can use find elements, plural, for that. So image elements equals uh, driver.findElements doing it by CSS selector again and we want all the images so we're just going to search by the tag with no further selectors okay so we've got a list of things there so let's print stuff out and see what we can get so for element in image elements write this for loop for loop let's just print the element dot get attribute which is a method to get attributes off the HTML object and we'll get that alt text. So what we want, if you look here, we've got the image and it's got this alt text attribute or a property in the HTML. So let's print that out. And you see we've got a list of all the books or the alt text on all the images. So all the books on the page. So light in the attic, tipping the velvet, so on and so forth. As always, we should remember to quit our driver once we're done with whatever we're doing in Selenium. So driver.quit. And then we're back here uh, in our code. OK, so that was a lecture on how you select things, select page elements using CSS selectors. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on locating page elements using IDs. Some elements on any given HTML page will have an ID attribute associated with their HTML tag. We mostly see this with the important elements on a given page. For example, if you have a search box, 
the search box might have an ID of search. If you have a submit button for that search element, the submit button might have an ID of submit as well. An ID on any given element is unique within the HTML page, so it's a very useful tool if you want to select specific elements using Selenium. In terms of how you use this functionality to select elements in Selenium by their IDs, we start off with all of our classic imports, so the web driver, the service, and the by class. Then we have to set up our service and our driver like we've seen before. And next we'll get the URL that is of interest to us. To find an element by our ID, we'll use a similar method to what we saw with the CSS selector lecture. So we can use driver.findElement by.id and then we can pass the ID string. So in the example I mentioned before, if we have a search box with an ID of search, we can just say by.id and the string would be search. We can also use find elements to find things by ID, but this is probably not used very much in practice because as I mentioned, the ID on any element is going to be unique, so there won't be more than one thing that you can find using this method. Now that we've talked about how to find elements by their IDs, let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook to get some practice. So here we are in our Jupyter Notebooks, and we've started off with the basic imports, so the web driver, the service, the by class, and then for this lecture, from our settings file, we'll import the Chrome driver path and the URL to the Selenium website. So that's the website we'll be using to look at things in this lecture. The service, we set up the service, and the driver, we set up the driver. So we've got this going over here, full screen. We'll switch over to it in a minute. Now the website that we're going to get is that Selenium website. So let's do driver.get Selenium URL and that'll take us to the Selenium website. So let's take a look at this page for a minute. We're gonna be looking for things by ID. So if we inspect this search bar, actually, we can see it's actually in a div with an ID of DocSearch. So that's good for us. That gives us something to look for. So if we go back to the Jupyter Notebook, let's get that element based on the ID take off the caps lock. So element one is driver.findElement by.id and then doc search. Since that's the ID like we can see in our Chrome DevTools. Okay, so we've got that element. Now let's take a look at it. One of the ways we can look at it is we can use the tag name attribute. So that'll give us the HTML tag name associated with the element. And here you can see it's a div. So that's what we expect because it's a div with an ID of doc search. We can also get the inner HTML as well if we want. So we'll get the attribute inner HTML and this is just so that we can take a look at some of the other methods associated with uh, these web elements. Okay so the inner HTML is everything that's inside this div so you can see we've got that button we got a span, the SVG, all of that good stuff here that we can access with git attribute. Now there's also this logo element on the page. So if I inspect that, you can see we've got this SVG object or tag rather, and it's got an ID of Selenium logo. So that's another thing that we can select using an ID in Selenium. So we'll call this element two. We'll use driver.findElement again. We're looking by ID and we can just get the Selenium logo since that's the ID of the element. Okay, so we've got that. So we can check out the tag name again, which should be SVG. That's what we expect. Uh, and then what we can do, we can use that get attribute method to get basically anything on this tag. So you can see we've got data name, XML, NS, view box, all this stuff. So let's take a look at the data name, see if we can pull that out. So go back to Jupyter Notebook, and we want the attribute of data name. 
uh, and it's a selenium logo which which is what's on there um, and so you can select things a lot of things on the page using different types of methods so we talked about CSS selectors before and in this lecture we talked about IDs but you can combine them with the CSS selector method or, or by looking for things with CSS selectors so here we let's try to select that logo but we'll use CSS selectors instead of IDs so element 3 let's just make this driver dot find element we're going to do this by CSS selector and then what we want is the SVG pound sign or hashtag selenium logo so that's the CSS selector way of specifying both the tag and the ID so now we've got that let's take a look at it get that attribute of data name again to verify that we've got the same object same element on the page and now we see we've got the selenium logo on there as well so what you can see is that ID and CSS selector sometimes you can use one or the other to find the same element on the page depending on what you're looking for and as always make sure to quit your driver after you're done using it thanks everybody for joining this lecture where we saw how to select items in selenium using their IDs and we'll see you in the next lecture hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on locating page elements using the name attribute. Within a given HTML page, some page elements will have a name attribute associated with their HTML tag. You mostly see this with things like buttons, forms, form elements, and things like that. Unlike the ID, the name attribute is not guaranteed to be unique within the HTML page. In terms of practical use, the name attribute is mostly relevant for passing HTTP requests to the server, so you might use it more from that perspective if you're using a package like Django where you're making those types of server requests or API calls. For our intents and purposes, however, with Selenium, the name attribute really just provides us with another way of selecting data from a web page. To select a page element using the name attribute, you can import all of the normal stuff that we need to use Selenium. So our web driver, our service, and our by class. Then we'll need to set up the service and the web driver like before, and get the URL of interest, of course. And in order to find elements by the name, we can use driver.findElement, as we've seen before. And then the first parameter will be by.name and we pass the name string in the second field. So if we're looking for something that has a name of search, for example, we could say by.name and then pass the string of search. As I mentioned, the name attribute is not necessarily unique on a page, so there may, there may be more than one element. If we want to find all elements, we can use driver.findElements, and the first parameter again will be by.name, and then we can pass that name string in. Okay, let's head over to Jupyter Notebooks and get some practice using this functionality. All right, so here we are in our Jupyter Notebook, and we're going to take a look at how you can locate page elements in Selenium using their name. We start off with the imports as usual, web driver, service, by, and then from our settings file, we'll import the Chrome driver path and the URL for the Python website, so that's python.org, basically. Then we'll start the service, start the driver, and we'll be good to go. So let's get that website now so we can use driver.get, and we'll get that Python URL. And that'll show up in our Chrome browser here. So now we've got it up, one of the things we might want to find if we look at things that have names is we can expect this, and this actually has a name. So we've got this input that has an ID. So it's got ID search field. That'd be one way to select it in Selenium would be by ID. But it's also got a name, and the name is Q. And so if you were working on back-end systems, 
that would be the variable name that gets passed to the server. But we're not really interested in that with Selenium. We're just interested in grabbing the input. So we'll call it uh, element1. And we'll get it with driver.find element by, then we'll use name. And the name, as we saw, is Q. Not Q space, just Q. So hit that, shift enter, and we've got the element there. So now if we look at the tag name, like we were looking at in the previous lecture, we can see that it's going to be an input. So run that. Yeah, it's an input type of HTML tag. And then if we want to get the, maybe we wouldn't want to get the class to, let's look at the element one dot get attribute. So we're using that get attribute method again. And we're going to get the class attribute. So you can see it's got a class of search field. If we look at that here, that's what the class is called in the source. Uh, the HTML source file. Okay, so that's that. And maybe we want to take a look at the submit button as well because if we look at the HTML here, we've got a button. It's a type submit and the name has has submit as well and the ID is submit. So again, you could search for this with ID or with by name. But if you search, search by name, it's not guaranteed to be unique, right? So you could select only this with ID or anything with the name of submit using the name. But let's head back to Jupyter Notebook now and try to select this object just with its name. So we'll call it element2 is equal driver dot find element by name and we'll call it submit since that's the name of the element. Okay, run that and ran fine. Element2.text see what the text is, go. So if you look at that, that's what's inside here. That's what's inside the button, right? So that's what we're selecting with the text attribute. Uh, and the other thing we can select maybe is we can get the value. So element two dot get attribute, uh, and we'll get the attribute of value, which has nothing in it right now because it's not filled out in that HTML, in the HTML of the web page. Um, and just so that you know, you can also use these types of methods to get things out of the header of the HTML page. So there's typically a, uh, a body and then a head object. So if I look at his, this here, we've got all these meta tags, right, with names associated with them. So you can actually use Selenium to pull this information or these meta tags if you'd like to do so. I don't know exactly what it'd be useful for, but it's something that's there if, if you want to get it. So we can do this. Uh, let's see, what are we going to use this with? We're going to find the keywords. So we can do, uh, let's call it element3 is equal to driver.find element and then we're going to do by name and we're going to find keywords and the keywords let's try to find that in here here we've got the okay so here we've got the meta tag that we're going to be looking for and it's just basically a list of keywords associated uh, with the web page so Let's run this. So we've got that element. So if we get the element three dot tag name, we'll see it's a meta tag, right? And then let's get maybe the content out of there. So get attribute, we've got the content. Like you can see in the um, DevTools tab there. So get attribute content. And you can see it's a list of those keywords really associated with the web page. So this is a string and we're just going to play around for it play around with it for a bit to see what we might be able to do with it and the type of functionality you can use once you get familiar with Selenium. 
So one of the things you might want to do is we've got this list of keywords. Maybe we can make it into a, a Python list, right? So let's do get attribute content, uh, and then we'll split it. So the default split uh, splits a string on spaces. So this will give us a list of a list of the the keywords and a Python list of the keywords, not just a string list of the keywords. Okay, as always, remember to shut down your driver after you're done using it. Um, but in this lecture, as you saw, we took a look at how you can get elements off of a web page using the name attribute in the HTML tags. Thanks everybody for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on locating page elements in Selenium using HTML tag names. HTML tags are really the basic unit of web page setup. And Selenium lets us locate page elements using their HTML tag names. So for example, A for anchor tags, H1 and H2 for header one and header two, form tags, button tags, we can really select any HTML tag in Selenium. Usually if we're finding page elements this way, it's more useful for finding all of the elements at once. For example, if we wanted to find all the links, we might search by the A tag for the anchor tag. If we wanted to find something more specific, typically a CSS selector or an ID or a name might be a more useful way of searching for those page elements. In terms of how you use this functionality, you have to start with all the imports and driver setup that we've seen before, and then get your URL of interest. And then we can find the elements by the tag name. So we can write driver.findElement. And then the first parameter will be by.tagName. So we're searching by the HTML tag name. And then we can pass the HTML tag of interest. Maybe it's an A for an anchor, div for a div, or a button for a button element. Additionally, you can use the same way. Uh, you can use find elements to find all of those HTML tag elements on the page. Uh, if you're looking for everything and not just a specific one. Now that we've seen how to use this, let's head over to our Jupyter Notebooks to get some practice with using it in the real world. All right, so here we are in our Jupyter Notebook and we've gone through all the imports. We've imported from our settings the Chrome driver path and the website we're gonna take a look at is Books to Scrape. So we've imported the Books to Scrape URL and then we've set up the service, set up our web driver, and now let's get the website we're gonna take a look at. So we've got that books to scrape URL. So we'll get that, open it up on the page, and start taking a look at things. So we're interested in locating elements by their HTML tag. And what you'll notice as you look on this page is that there's lots of images because it's a book website, we're gonna be buying books or something. So maybe we want to collect all the images on the page. And the HTML tag for this, and you'll see this if you use the dev tools to click on these things, is that it's an image tag. So that's what's of interest to us. So we'll do driver.findElements because we want everything, not just the first one. By, we're gonna be looking by tag name and the tag of interest is image. So let's hit that. And now we've got all of those images. And let's see maybe what some of the attributes on them are. One of them is alt, like you can see here. So the alt submission, this is the alt text for the image. So for element in image elements. And I'll only do the first ones, or the first 10 or so. And then we can print the element and we'll get the attribute. And the attribute is that alt attribute. So let's do that. And then you see we've got the alt text associated with each image. And it's really just the title of the book. If you scroll through this page, you'll see it's just the, the title of the book. Now, the other thing maybe we want to collect is all the links. And this might be 
interesting for us as we take a look at it. So we'll do driver.findElements. We'll search by tag name. And we'll do it for A, since A is the anchor tag for, for the links. And then let's take a look at this list of link elements. So we'll do 0 to 10. So just to take a look at the first ones. And then let's print the, we'll do a link.get attribute. We'll get the title of the link. Uh, it actually, some links don't have titles, so we can fall back on the text. So we'll do that for one line. And then we can do the href. Let's get the href attribute as well. If you take a look at a link, an href is really what the link is linking to, right? It's the URL that it would send you to. So let's print this off for the first couple of link elements on the page. So you can see here, uh, we can scroll up to the top. So you can see the title here is book to scrape. That's what we've got. And it'll send you to the index. Home as well as the text. So that'll send you to the index and so on and so forth, right? We get all these links here. Now, let's do this for the last 10 links on the page. And this way we'll get some of the, maybe some of the books as well, since those have links. Okay. So now what you'll see here is something a little bit interesting, right? You've got kind of this weird list of things that isn't as nice as what we saw in the first couple ones. And if you look at the, let's look at this, um, let's look at this book here, for example. If you look at it, it's because really for each of these books, we have two links associated with them. The image is wrapped in an A tag, so we get that A tag. And then let's click on this link here as well. We've got a different A tag there as well. So for each book, we're kind of collecting two links, which is why we get so many of those, um, so many of those different links associated with the same book. So again, that's something to be aware of if you're scraping on a website and you're pulling all the links, you might get double counts of things depending on what you're doing. Uh, and then as always, remember to quit your driver once you're done using it, and that'll take you out of your automation. Okay, so in this lecture, we took a look at how we can select items on a page using the tag name, the HTML tag name in Selenium, and some of the pros and cons of using that method. Okay, thanks everybody for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on locating page elements in Selenium using the XPath. XPath is the language for locating nodes in an XML document. Because HTML can be an implementation of XML, we can use XPath to locate elements on a page. This is very useful for navigating a page when an element of interest doesn't have an ID or name attribute that would make it easy for us to select in Selenium. We can use XPath to search in relative terms, which is really the more advisable way of using XPath, or we can use it to search the web page in absolute terms, which is not really as, as advised. Here's a few examples of the syntax of XPath in case you haven't seen it before. So to describe the absolute path to the first input on a page, we could write slash HTML, slash body, slash input, and then one within brackets. That specifies the first input on a page and the absolute path to that input. If we just wanted to use the relative path to find the first input, we could use double slash, input, and then one within brackets. That'll get us that first input on a page. If we were looking for a specific input with an ID, we can use the at sign to specify that HTML attribute. So here we've got double slash input, and then within brackets, at ID, so that's specifying that HTML attribute, is equal to 
search box. So that'll help us find an input with an ID of search box. And finally, if you want to do that relative search around the page that XPath can sometimes be useful for, you could write double slash A, then within brackets, at title. So that's the HTML attribute of title. And we want the link, the link where that is equal to the string title. Then we can go up by writing a double slash, or a single slash, sorry, double period, and then another slash and div. And so that'll give us the div that's one parent above the link with the title of title. If some of those examples were unclear to you, just be aware that you don't have to be fluent in XPath for this course. That's not really what we expect. What's more important is that you're able to understand what element or what elements an XPath is locating on the page and how XPath works in practice. The Chrome DevTools lets us copy the XPath from the Sources tab, which makes our life a lot easier anyway. And you can also test any given XPath in the console tab of Chrome DevTools. So with all that said, even though if you don't have experience with XPath, we'll be able to figure it out as we see some examples. In terms of how you locate a page element practically in Selenium using the XPath, first you have to go through all the imports and setup that we've seen before, then you get your URL of interest. And to find the elements with the XPath, you can just use driver.findElement. The first parameter will be by.xpath, and then you can pass the XPath string. Again, you're, you'll usually not be writing this yourself. You can just copy it from the Chrome DevTools. If you want to find all the elements, again, you can just say driver.findElements. First parameter is by.xpath, and then you pass that XPath string. Let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook to get some practice with this. All right, so here we are in our Jupyter Notebook. We've got all of our imports that we need. So we've got the web driver, service class, the by class. And then from the settings file, we import the Chrome driver path as usual for the service. And then we're going to take a look at the books to scrape URL for this lecture start up the service, start up the driver, and so that was, that's what we've got over here uh, with our Chrome window open, and then we can get that URL that we're going to take a look at. So driver.get books to scrape URL, run that, and it takes us to the page. So to start off with, we'll start off with a pretty simple XPath, and as a good tip to remember, if you want to test your XPath strings before you use them in Python, you can test them out in the console here in Chrome DevTools. So if I wanted to get all the links on this page, I could do dollar sign $x, which is how you check for XPath or run XPath, XPath strings in the console, and I can do slash slash a, and that'll get me all of the anchor tags on the page. So that's an example of an XPath. And maybe I want to get all the all the anchor tags that have an attribute of an HTML attribute of title. So then I can inside brackets after the A, I can write at title, and that'll show up as there's 20, 20 anchor tags on the page that have that attribute. If we get on here and we click on the title of one of these books, it's really just the title of the book on the page. So you've got the picture and then you've got the name of the book and the name of the book, that link is what has the title attribute. So we can try this out in Python with Selenium. So we can construct something called, let's call it list elements to find all those book links. We can do driver.findElements because we want all of them. We're going to be searching by XPath. And then we can just use that XPath string that we just wrote. So slash slash A at title within brackets. And that'll give us those, those 20 uh, link elements. So if I look at the length of that, there'll be 20, which is what we should expect. And then you can get that 
title off it as well. So link elements, if we want to get the first one, so zero, we can get the attribute, get that HTML attribute of title off it, and it should show us what we see here. So a light in the attic, that's the, the name of the book. Uh, and as we mentioned in the lecture, where XPath really shines compared to some of the other methods of finding things in Selenium is when you're locating things that don't have a good identifier, but you can find them relative to other elements. So one example of this is the price. So the, the price here is in this uh, P tag with a class of price color but you probably want to associate it with the book too. And just looking at it in the HTML, there's not really a good way to do that. Uh, so what we might want to start with instead to back into getting that price is to start with the title of something that we're looking for. So here we've got the A tag with the title, so we can start looking for that. So we can start off, let's do this in, uh, in the Chrome DevTools. So we start off with slash slash a, so we're looking for that a tag where the title is equal to, uh, what's the title? A light in the attic. Uh, and make sure to close that with a bracket. Let's see. Ah, dollar sign x, not x dollar sign. It's dollar sign x, and that gives us one uh, that one anchor tag object. Okay, so now if we go back and look at the elements, where is that in relation to the paragraph that we want to pull out here? So the A tag is within this H3, so we have to go up one, uh, and we still can't get to the P tag from this H3, because that's self-contained. So we have to go up another level. So we actually have to go up to this article class product pod. And the way we can do that with XPath is we can have some uh, some double periods. So that's up one, so that gives us that H3. Up two, that gives us the article with the class of product pod. Uh, from there, we can get the div with the product price. So here we've got this div that contains the P class of price color and it's got a class of product price. So that's the branch we want to go into, so to speak. So let's go, let's reuse that. Then we want to go into the div with a class of, this is equal to product price. Let's run that. So we've got that div of product price and then from there we can just get the first um, the first paragraph tag. So let's run that string again and then we've got one last thing we're looking for. So we can just do P and we want a P where it's got a class of the price color. Let's just check that on the elements tab. Yeah, so the price of the book is here in this p tag with a class of price color. So we run that on the on the console. You see we get this p object here that has a whole bunch of stuff associated with it. But what's important for us is that we can use it. We can now use this string in in Selenium in Python to pull this element. So if we want to find the price element, we can say driver dot find element. And then we're going to be searching by an X path again. And the string of interest, tab this over because it's a long string. We can just pull from the console. So let's tab this down, uh, copy this so we don't have to type it again, and stick it in there. And so you can see it's quite a long string, but this should work to find it because we tested it in our Chrome DevTools. So let's see, end of line. Okay, so we need to remember to end the 
string and and the uh, and the function or end the method. Let's see. Okay, now let's clean this up. Okay, so what it was was all there was the the parentheses was in the wrong place. So now we've got this xpath string. So let's run this. Uh, and so now we've got that price element, and we can check out the text within that, which should give us the price of the book. So we do price element dot text attribute. It'll show us that 51. 77 pounds for the book. And now if we wanted to, we could strip off the pounds, use the numbers to run some sort of analysis or whatever we want to do. Okay, so in this lecture we went through how you find elements by XPath in Selenium. And we also saw the useful ways that you can uh, use the Chrome DevTools console to check your XPath before you use it in Python. Thanks for joining and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on locating page elements in Selenium by their link text. Anchor tags on a web page will usually have some user visible text showing on that web page. Searching using this information is useful when you know some or all of the link text within the anchor or a tag. Selenium lets us search with the exact link text, so for that we can use by.linkText or we can also search by a partial string match. So for that, we can use by.partialLinkText. To use this functionality, we'll have all the imports and the setup for our driver that we've seen before, get the URL of interest, and then find those elements on the page. So we can use driver.findElement, and then pass by.LinkText as the first parameter, and pass the link text of interest. On the other hand, if you maybe want to find or search by a partial link text, so a partial string match, you can use find elements, pass by partial link text as the first parameter, and then pass the link text of interest as the second parameter. Now that we've talked about how this works, let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook to get some practice. Okay, so we're in our Jupyter Notebooks and we've got our Chrome window open already. We've done all of, all of our imports, imported the Chrome driver path, and the website we'll be using for this lecture is books to scrape URL, so we'll be using that. So let's pop that open, use driver.git, uh, and then books to scrape URL, run that, and that'll open that page up. And so in this practice, we're going to be locating page elements by their link text. So maybe one of the ones that we want to locate is one of this one of these books. So we've got tipping the velvet here. This is a link. This is an A tag, and it's got text inside it. So we can use that in Selenium. So we can find that link based on just the link text. So link element, we can call it link element. We'll do driver.find element and we're going to be finding it by link text and the link text is just what you see there on the page so it's tipping the velvet so let's run that and okay we've got the we've got the link selected and now we can check things and so the text is really just what we were looking for right uh, it's just tipping the velvet it's just tight the title of the book the tag name is just going to be an A tag, it's just an anchor tag. So that's all well and good, that's what we expect it to be. Expect it to be. Uh, as mentioned in the lecture, you can also find links based on partial text. So let's say you want to see how many titles or how many books on the page uh, start with SH, for example. So we can say, we'll just call this add elements driver dot find elements so we want all of them since we're searching by partial link text partial link text and then here we can put that sh we just want to look for the the titles that begin with sh so let's run that shift enter we got those elements 
Uh, and then if we just do, let's make this a link, or make this a list rather. Let's do lm.text. We can do a list comprehension. lm.text for lm in that add elements um, object. And so here you see we've got short stories, sharp objects, and Shakespeare's sonnets are the three books that start with SH. Okay, so in this lecture we saw how you how you find elements on a page using link text matching or partial link text matching in Selenium. Thanks for joining and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on chaining locators in Selenium. In the past few lectures we've taken a look at a bunch of different ways that you can select page elements in Selenium. Things like using a CSS selector, using an ID, using a name. But all the locators we've reviewed can be chained together as well. This is sometimes useful for when you're navigating between parent and child elements that may be hard to access otherwise or hard to specify because maybe they don't have a name or an ID attribute. It also might be more readable to select page elements in this way rather than using an XPath in certain cases. As an example of how you might do this, first you need all your Selenium imports and the driver set up, and then to get the URL of interest to you. And to find elements with chained locators, you could, for example, select uh, an element one, so using driver.findElement, and then select that element by a CSS selector, passing a CSS selector string. So now you have that element one web element. Then in the next line here, you could use find elements on element one. So on that element, that page element that you selected with a CSS selector, you could use find elements on it and search for something by tag name, for example, to find all the A tags within that portion of the HTML page. In this way, you can break down an HTML page and maybe make finding elements within the page a little bit easier. Let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook and get some practice using this functionality. All right, so we're in our Jupyter Notebook. We have all of our imports from our setting file. We got the Chrome driver path and the website we're gonna take a look at is the books to scrape URL. So it's already open here in the, in the Chrome window. So you can just do driver.git to get that URL and then we can get going with taking a look at how to chain these web element locators to find specific page elements. So like we saw in one of our previous lectures, sometimes certain locators uh, such as ID or name are not really available for specific elements. And we might have to use XPath instead. And the issue with XPath, as you saw in a previous lecture, is that sometimes the syntax can be complicated, the strings can be quite long. So another option for us is that we can chain these locators together and maybe make our code slightly more readable. So the first thing we're gonna take a look at is, let's take a look at these books. So if we look at these books, you'll see that really all the information about the book is contained in this article um, in this article tag. So that's where the name is, the picture, the price, all of that. And so you have these list items and in each list item there's this article that's really the the container for the information. So this is a good place to look if we want to do what we were doing in a previous lecture where we were looking for the price of a book. So first things first, let's get all the book elements on the page. So we'll do driver.findElements. Uh, and we'll do this by CSS selector. And our CSS selector in this case is going to be that article. So that's the tag and then the class is product pod. Uh, so we get that and we'll get a list of list of all the book elements. So like we saw before, there's 20 book elements on this page uh, that we can start to take a look at. Now, since every element in book elements is a web element, 
we can use find element or find elements on it just like we can use with driver. So we're used to doing driver.findElement or whatever, but you can also use, uh, you know, for each item in book element, you could do book element uh, zero, for example, and then do a find element there as well. So book elements zero, so that's the first one. You can find an element, uh, and let's do by tag name. Let's get the image, maybe. We can get the image out of that uh, that section of the HTML. And maybe we want to get the, let's get this on a new line just to make it easier to read. Uh, we can get attribute and let's get that alt text. So you can see here we're finding the tag name, we're finding the image. Uh, and the image is here within that A tag and it's got the alt text that's the title of the book. So if we run this we'll see a light in the attic. So that's the first book, and that's the image and the alt text off that image. Okay, so that's one example of how you can change chain those, those find element methods together. Uh, another one we might do, like we were doing in a previous lecture, we're taking a look at getting the price, right? So let's do that for this first uh, book element. So we'll find element and we'll do it by CSS selector. And what we're looking for here is it's a paragraph tag. So let's click on this to see where it is. So it's a P and it has a P of uh, price color. So it's a paragraph tag with a class of price color. So P dot price color should give us that information. Uh, and then if we get the text, because it's inside the P tag. So you find that okay, all you know, we've got the uh, we've got the price that we were looking for. And in some sense, this is maybe easier to read than the X path we were using before, even though the X path is maybe more direct, you might say, or kind of simpler because you don't have to change thing chain things together. But now what we can maybe do is uh, scrape this page to get all that price information associated with the book, because as we saw before there's nothing on this price that directly associates it with the book. You have to go up the HTML tree. So I'm going to expand this for a minute so that we can see the code because the code is a bit uh, long for this part. So we'll instantiate a price list here. Uh, and so we've got our list of book elements. So for book in book elements, what we can do is we can do price list append. So we're adding to that list and we're going to add, we're just going to make a dictionary of this price and title information. So we've got a title and then we've got a price and we can just use what we were using above to get this information. So the title comes from that book element on the, on the element, you can find another element by the tag name, we're going to find the image, and then we're going to get the attribute of the alt text off the image, and that's going to give us the title of the book. In terms of price, like we saw above, you've got the book element, you can find an element within that section of the HTML, we're going to do that by CSS selector, and it's p.priceColor. So a P tag with the class of price color. And then we want the text because it's what's inside there. Uh, okay, and so this should be able to do it. Okay, so the for loop is done. Now let's take a look at our price list. And you see here we've scraped all the information that we maybe wanted to get. So a light in the attic, we've associated with the price. And if we go back to that web page, it's the price we see on the web page, right? So this is an example of how you can chain these locators together, chain these find element methods together to find information on a page. So let's just walk through, let's put this over to the side again, let's just walk through what we were doing here. So we had our list of book elements, which was really all of these article classes, right? or article tags on the page. Then within each of these article tags, 
to get the to get the book title we went to the image found the image there took the alt text and then the, to find the price we went down to the p tag with a class of price color and pulled the text to get the price and we weren't worried about getting multiple ones because there's only one in each of these article uh, trees or each of each of these article containers so again uh, that's it for this lecture uh, we learned how to chain locators together to find objects in a page. Again, a good alternative if you don't want to use XPath to find things. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our lecture where we'll talk about some of the useful web element attributes and methods in Selenium. When you find an element on a page, on a web page, and you access it in Python using Selenium, what you're doing are accessing web element objects in the Selenium package. Because of this, it's a little bit useful to know some of the more common attributes and methods associated with these web element objects. If you'd like a complete list, I'd recommend you see the documentation, because that's where you'll find more information and the most up-to-date information as well. In terms of some useful web element attributes, with any web element you can access the text, so the text inside that web element on the page. The tag name, so this will return the HTML tag associated with the web element. The size, which will be a tuple for the pixel size of the web element on the web page. And then you have these three, what are really methods, but I think you can consider them attributes at the bottom. So is displayed, is enabled, or is selected. This will all return true or false values as to whether a web element is displayed on the page, whether it's enabled, or whether it's selected. In terms of some useful web element methods that you might use in your Selenium work, you can screenshot a page element, you can use find element or find elements as we saw before. So if you have a web element selected, you can change you can chain those those find element methods together to get deeper into the HTML tree. Then if you want to get certain attributes or properties from that page element, you can use git dom attribute, git attribute, or git property. We'll talk about the difference between these three in a minute. And finally, you can also get the value of CSS properties using value of CSS property. So if you wanted to know the border or padding or the color of an item on a web page, you could use that method on your web element. In terms of the difference between get DOM attribute, get attribute, and get property methods, I like to think of the get DOM attribute as getting an attribute from the underlying HTML since that might change with JavaScript or jQuery for example. Get property on the other hand gets the current state of an attribute that might change. So let's say you have text in a text box for example. Finally get attribute gets the initial content element of an attribute that might change on a page. So instead of getting the text in the text box you could get the placeholder or the initial value of the text in the text box. Now that we've talked about these methods, let's head over to Jupyter Notebooks to get some practice with using them. All right, so we've got our Jupyter Notebook open. We've got our service instantiated and our driver set up. And we've, we're going to use the books to scrape URL for this practice. So you can use driver.git, books to scrape URL, and it'll take you to this page. Now to review some of the attributes and the methods that are on the web element objects, uh, we can just get something to work with, kind of arbitrary. So let's do this first uh, article tag with a class of product pod. So that has all the, all the book information for this first book. So we can just say, call this book element. Uh, driver dot find element. We're going to be searching by CSS selector, and then what we want is article 
dot what is it product pod article dot product pod so that's the class so now we've got that first book element so one of the things we might be interested in is maybe the text so what's inside the um, what's inside this web element so if you look at it you know it's got a couple things here and it's like it's it's all this stuff that you see here right a light in the the pound sign and the price whether it's in stock add to basket so that's all the text inside that book element so that's one attribute that might be of interest you can check the tag name like we saw before so this will give you the name of the HTML tag that you that the element is or the HTML tag associated with the element you can check out the size so let's do book element dot size and that'll give you this dictionary of uh, height and width in in pixels uh, what else can we take a look at then you've got uh, some of these boolean uh, they're really boolean methods but I think kind of think of them as um, as attributes as well because they tell you something about the the web element that you have so book element is displayed so it is displayed on the page book element uh, you could do is enabled that's true as well and what else is uh, is selected is the other one so you can do that and that's false so it's not selected it's not like a form field or something where you'd be selecting it so this is a this is a, just a quick overview of some of the attributes that might be useful to you when you're working with um, when you're working with web elements uh, so now let's take a look at some of the methods that we can use with these web elements so we've got our book elements one of the things that we can do is we can do screenshots of uh, objects or of web pages. So we do screenshot this page, and all you have to do is pass a parameter for the um, for the file name. So we'll just call this test.png, uh, and so that should be downloaded. We can take a look at it if we want. Uh, I won't do that now. I'll take a look at it later. Um, what else can we do? You can get uh, we can chain locators. So let's take a look at that button element. So we've got the and the button element that we're going to take a look at is this add to basket there. So let's do book element dot find element, and then we're looking by CSS selector and we want to get the button out of there so the button element dot text should be add to basket like we see there because that's an attribute again uh, let's do some of these methods some of these methods so button element let's get the dom attribute first so type uh, and let's click on this just so that we can compare it to the HTML so here the type is submit so let's get that so it says submit button element let's check out the get attribute uh, get the type attribute again it says submit uh, and then we can get the property let's try get property the get property method uh, and get name so if you notice there is no name associated with this so it should return just an empty string. So we've got submit, we've got class, we've got data loading text, but those are the only attributes that we have there. So the which one of these that you want to use, or the one of these that you want to use, will depend on what you're looking for and the stability of, of your Selenium code, really. So if you find one that works well, that's the one to use. Um, and then the last method to take a look at is the, let's take a look at value of CSS property. So if we want to know the color of the button, this will give us that string, which is an RGBA of what the what the color of the button is. Uh, or we can do maybe we can do let's value of CSS property. 
Let's look at the padding here. Again, that's just another CSS property you could take a look at if it interests you, uh, if that's something that you want to take a look at for whatever reason. Okay, so we went through some of the methods and some of the attributes that are associated with these web elements. Things like tag names, things like getting the CSS values or getting properties or attributes. Uh, this is a brief overview if you want the full list of attributes or methods associated with these web elements. Take a look at the documentation. But this should give you a good overview of some of the useful ones and some of the, the ones that we've used in previous lectures as well. Okay, thanks everybody for joining this lecture where we talked about the useful methods and attributes on the web element objects. And we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our first guided project for this Selenium course. Our first guided project will involve building a web scraper for Wikipedia. Since we've gone through the section on how to locate page elements in Selenium using things like CSS selectors, IDs, or names, our goal for this project will be to use that knowledge to scrape link information from four of the main div sections on Wikipedia. The four sections of interest to us are the From Today's Featured Article section. So that's a Wikipedia article in short form on the main page. There's a section called In the News, which has bullet points on news items occurring around the world. Did You Know, which is a section with, with facts and figures from various things and various Wikipedia articles. And then on this day, which is a record of historical events that happened on the day of interest and their articles, the links to their articles on Wikipedia. If you need the link, the link is shown on the second bullet point here, but you'll also be able to pull it from our settings file or from the GitHub repo. In terms of what the main page looks like, and we'll see this as we go through the project as well, these are the four divs of interest or the four sections of interest to us. So like I mentioned before, we've got the from today's featured article in the news, did you know, and on this day. We're going to use what we've learned about the element locators to construct a dictionary of links by the div section. And we want to store the following information on each of these links. We want to store the title of the link, the text of the link, which can be different from the title, and then the href, which is the link to the Wikipedia page with more information. Our dictionary structure will look something like a string with the div identifier, and then we'll have a list. And in the list, each item will be a collection of those three pieces of information. So a title, and then a string with the title, the text, and then a string with the text, and then href and a string with the href. You might be asking why we're going to go about scraping data this way as opposed to using something like Beautiful Soup. And first off, it's really good Selenium practice. You'll have to locate web elements regardless of what you're using Selenium for, so we might as well get some practice using those skills. And second, and this is something that you may have noticed on some websites, is that you may want to scrape data that can only be accessed via Selenium. You can't get it via an API or via just a basic HTTP call. For example, you might need to fill out a form first in order to get that information. So this is good practice for, for using those skills. Okay, now that we've talked about what we're going to be doing, let's head over to Jupyter and start coding. Okay, so we've got our Jupyter notebook open. We've got all the imports that we used in the previous section. So the web driver, the service, the by class. From our settings file, we'll import the Chrome driver path for our service, and then we're going to be scraping Wikipedia, so we've got the Wikipedia URL as well. We start up the service, start up the driver, so we've got the Chrome window open here on the other side, and now we can get that Wikipedia URL. So driver.get, Wikipedia URL, shift enter to open that up. 
now let's head over to this page so we can open up our Chrome tools and dock this to the bottom. Control plus to make the code a little bit larger, easier to read. And now let's start taking a look at this page to see how we can scrape scrape the information from these four sections. So we've got today's featured article in the news. Uh, what else? Did you know? And on this day. So those are the four sections we want to scrape through. Now if we click on this, we can click on this span, just try to find out where exactly we are. Uh, so we've got this div that's MP left, but if you scroll down, actually I think this this contains everything. So we need to go a little bit more uh, specific than just this MP left, which is main page left. And actually what you can see here is we've got this div under the main page left that's got an ID of MPTFA. So that's MPTFA, that's today's featured article. So that's the div of interest to us that we want to select there. And if you keep going on the page, you'll see some other ones. So MPDYK, if we click on that, that's down here below. So did you know? That's MPDYK, so main page, did you know? Uh, and then we need to also go over here. So we've got div with an ID of MP right. Again, that's going to contain both sections, so we need to go more specific. Uh, if you look in here, you've got a div MP ITN, so that's in the news, and then div ID MP OTD, so M, uh, main page, what is this? Main page on this day. So those are the kind of the four IDs that we want, or the four CSS selectors that we want. So let's go back to our our Jupyter Notebook and start writing these constants out. So we're going to use CSS locators. You could use IDs. That's fine too. I'm just going to use CSS locators for this. So we've got a div, which is MPTFA. Uh, from today's article. TFA? What is that? Yeah, TFA. Okay, TFAs. Um, today's featured article. So let's call this TFA instead. So that it matches up. Then we have ITN. So ITN, CSS locator. I'm just naming these, these ways because they're constants, uh, so that's more obvious. Div hashtag MPITN. Then we've got the, let's see, DYK, so did you know, CSS locator. That's div hashtag MPDYK. And then OTD, so on this day, CSS locator is equal to div hashtag MPOTD. And then since we're going to be running through these in a for loop, we can just add them all to a list. So let's call it locator list. Uh, and let's do TFA, ITN, uh, what's DYK, and OTD. So those are the four sections. So run that, and we've got all of our constants that we need. Uh, we're going to be building a dictionary with information. So let's do uh, link dictionary. just instantiate that um, as a Python dictionary object. And when we loop through each div, what we want to do is we want to initialize an empty list for storing the links, find all of those link tag elements, and then pull out the title text and the href and store that and add that to the list of dictionaries with that link information to our larger dictionary with the information on each section. So for each locator in our locator list, that's what we're going to be looping through first. First we have to find the uh, right div. So we can say the div element of interest is going to be driver.findElement because we just want the one div and we're searching by ID so there's, or we're searching by CSS selector with an ID, so there's only going to be one anyway. Uh, and then we've got a locator. 
And so the locator is that string constant here, right? Div MPTFA. That's going to find that div for us. Okay, so we've got our div selected. And then for each of these, we want to build up a list. So we'll start with an empty list here. Okay, so within the div, we want to look for those anchor tags, right? So for link in each div element, what we want to do is we want to find elements, plural, because we want all of the all of the uh, a tags. So by dot tag name, we want that a, and so that's the start of our for loop. And let's make this big for one second while we're coding this out. Uh, okay, and then for, so for each link, we can start to pull the info from it. So the info dictionary that we want is going to be a few different things like we talked about. So we want to get the title, we want to get the text, and we want the href as well from it. So for the title, we can do link. So each link is going to be a web element which means we can use get attribute and the attribute we want is that title attribute of the link. So get attribute and then uh, the parameter is a title string. For each link we can also get the text so that's just the text attribute we can pull off and then the href we can also use get attribute. Since it's a web element it'll have that href we can just get attribute href. Uh, and then once we've got that dictionary constructed, we can add it to our list, our empty list there. So it's going to be a list of dictionaries. Info list dot append info dict. Okay, so that's what's going on in that inner for loop. Finally, the last thing that we can do is add this list once it's fully constructed to that link dictionary. So link dictionary, then we can add the key, right? So the key is going to be the locator, that locator string, and then we can just add the list that we've built up. Okay, so let's walk through what this is doing again. So for each locator in the locator list, the locator list is just the list of that, those strings with the CSS locators. For each locator in that list, we're going to find that element, so that, that part of the DOM, really. Then we're going to instantiate the empty list to store the link information. And for each link that we find within that div, we're going to build the dictionary with the info, with the information, so title, text, and the href. We're going to add that dictionary to the list of dictionaries that we're constructing. And once we're done looping through all the anchor tags, we'll add to this link dictionary in the locator key spot, so for each one of these divs, a list of those uh, links and their information. So let's run this now. Might take a minute. There it goes, still running. Okay, so now the link dictionary construction is done. So let's take a look at the type of data that we've uh, that we've collected here. So we're going to do, let's just look at the today's featured article, CSS locator. So if I run that, you can see we've got all this stuff, title text, sometimes it has text, sometimes it does, doesn't, and then the href of interest. So battle of the defile, umayyad, caliphate, uh, let's pull this over so that we can take here. And you can see on the screen here, we've got everything that we we're kind of, that we were looking to find. So we've got Battle of the Defile, that's this link here. Umayyad Caliphate, that's that link here. So on and so forth. So we've got all that. So let's scroll down a little bit, go to this new page. And maybe let's just see how many, how many links are in each section. So we'll loop through that dictionary. So four key value in the link dictionary. Uh, and you can do this with items, so dot items, 
method on the dictionary. Let's just print, and we can use a nice F string here for formatting. Let's just print key and do do a function here, so length of the value, uh, and then make it more obvious links. So each key in the link dictionary is going to be that string uh, with the div ID in it, and then the value in the dictionary is the list of dictionaries with link information. So if we just do a length on that list, we'll get the number of links uh, in each section of the page. So let's run this. Okay, so you can see here we've got in the, the featured article, there's 16 links. Uh, ITN is in the news, so there's 21 links. DYK, did you know, there's 16 links. And then on today, or what is that called? On today, on this day in history, uh, there's 38 links on that section. Okay, so just to go through and review what we did in this guided project, since we're at the end of the guided project, we really ran through a way of using everything that we've learned so far about locating page elements in Selenium. So we started up our service, started up our driver, got the URL of interest to us. Uh, we specified all these CSS locators after we, we went through the DOM or the HTML here to figure out where things are and which IDs we should use. Compiled it into a list and then we ran through that list to pull out link information or information on each links using some of the methods and attributes that we talked about in the previous section. And once we had done that, once the link dictionary had been constructed, then we just kind of took a look at it uh, to see, to get some more information about the web page that we just scraped. As always, remember to quit your driver once you're done with it so you don't leave it hanging. Uh, but that's about it for this guided project. Nice job, everyone, on working through this. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on opening and closing windows in Selenium. In older versions of Selenium, we had to instantiate a new web driver object in order to open a new window. But now in the newer versions of Selenium, we can switch to new windows much more easily. So the way we do this is with the method driver.switch2.newWindow, and then we specify the string of window. This is important, as we'll see in the next lecture, because you can also use this to switch to a new tab. If you'd like to close your secondary or any active windows, you can use driver.close instead of driver.quit. Just a note on this method, though, it doesn't work if there's only one window active. So if you try to use it, you'll throw an error. In terms of what this code looks like, if you're looking at it, among other bits of Python code, you can do all your imports in your service and driver setup. Then you can get a URL of interest. So here it's just firsturl.com. To switch to a new window, you use the method we just talked about. So driver.switch2.newWindow, window. Then you can get that second URL and it'll open up that second URL in the new window. To close that new window, you can use driver.close like we mentioned before and then it'll take you back. Your active window will become that window with the first URL in it. In terms of the old method, if you see this, you might see this in older Selenium code bases. To open up the new window, you had to instantiate two drivers. So you'd have driver one, which is just your web driver, and driver two, which is just another web driver. And then you could use that get method to get the first and second URLs of interest. And if you wanted to close those window, windows, you had to use driver.quit as we normally do. Okay, now that we've talked about opening and closing windows in Selenium, let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook to see how it works in practice. Okay, so here we are in our Jupyter Notebook and we've done our imports that we need and then from our setting file, the websites we're gonna take a look at, we're gonna take a look at the books to scrape URL and then the Python URL as well. 
So those are the two URLs you're going to want to import from the settings file. We'll set up our service, set up our driver, and then we can get started. So the first things first, let's get our website. So first we'll go to Books to Scrape, go to that URL. So that pops open in our Chrome window now. So if you just use driver.git, uh, and let's get the Python URL, you're just going to go to that URL. You're not going to open up a new window. So like we saw in the lecture, what you're going to want to do is use driver.switch to, and then new window. And then you can specify a window here as the parameter. So this will open up a new window, like you can see here. Now we've got this new Chrome window in front of the old one. And so then I can get a URL. If I use driver.get books to scrape URL, then I'm going to get the books to scrape URL in this new Chrome window, not in the original one. If you want to close the active window without quitting the web driver, you can use driver.close, and this will close that books to scrape website and window. So driver.close. Now we're back to the Python way of doing things, or the Python website, rather. Uh, and just in terms of you being aware of it as well, like we mentioned in the lecture, an older way of doing this before we had switched to new window might be uh, to just instantiate a new web driver. So now we can use driver.chrome again. Webdriver.chrome, the service is still the service. We just named it driver2. And so now we'll get a new web page here as well, as you can see. And then you can get that, maybe get that Python URL, driver2.get, Python URL, and that'll get of us that, um, that Python website in a new window. So that's two ways of doing it. Switch to new window is probably the best one to use uh, in newer versions of Selenium, but the old way is just so that you're aware of it. Then in terms of closing this, we can quit our second window, so driver2.quit. We'll close that and then we're good to go. Okay, thanks for joining this lecture where we saw how to open and close new windows in Selenium, and we'll see you in the next one. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on opening and closing tabs in Selenium. Opening and closing tabs in your browser in Selenium works pretty much like what you do to open and close windows, like we saw in the previous lecture. So to open a new tab, what you're going to want to do is use a method that's driver.switch2.newwindow, only instead of writing window as the parameter, you can write tab. In order to close any tab of interest, you can use driver.close, but as we mentioned in the previous lecture, this only works when there's more than one tab or more than one window. If you only have one active window or tab, that means you're going to run into an error if you try to use driver.close. In order to switch between tabs, or to switch between windows as well, we can use something called window handles. These are unique IDs for windows or tabs in your current Selenium session. To get the current window handle or ID, you can use driver.currentWindowHandle. If you use driver.windowHandles, this gives you a Python list of all the window handles from your current session. If you want to switch to one of them, which is basically switching between windows or swim switching between tabs, you can use driver.switch2.window and then pass the window handle as the parameter. And usually the best place to get this is from that list of window handles. The old method for opening a new tab is something that you might see if you're working with an older Selenium code base. But basically what you had to do to open a new tab was to execute JavaScript via the .execute script method in Selenium. So in order to open that tab, you'd write .execute script. And then within there, you'd write this JavaScript, which is window.open with a URL parameter and that'll open a new tab with the URL that you pass. The driver.execute script method is a generic method for executing JavaScript, and we'll see a little bit more of it 
later on in the course, but for now it's not terribly important to worry about. Uh, as mentioned, we don't expect you to be a JavaScript expert for this course, just to be able to read it and understand what's going on. In terms of what this looks like in the code, uh, you'll have all your imports and service and driver set up. Then you can use driver.get to get your URL, and you can switch use that driver.switch2.newwindow tab to open a new tab. Once you have that new tab active, you can get whatever URL you're interested in, and you can use driver.close to close that tab. Finally, as I mentioned, to switch between tabs, what you really want to do is get that driver.windowhandles list. So here it's just stored as the handles variable. And then you can switch windows. So you can use driver.switch2.window handles1. So that gets the second item in that handles list to switch to a different tab or a different window, depending on whether you have windows or tabs open. Then you can switch back using another window handle. So here it's handle zero, which is the first window handle or the first window window ID. And to check which window you're on, you can print the driver.currentWindow handle, which will give you that ID of the current window. As we'll see in the exercise for this lecture, these window handles tend not to be very user readable or user friendly. So you should go off what your screen looks like to, to kind of figure out which which tab you're currently on. And then if you want to close the tab, you can use driver.close, which is what we saw with the windows as well. Okay, now that we've talked about how to open and close and switch between tabs in Selenium, let's head over to Jupyter to get some practice. All right, so here we are in our Jupyter notebook. We've got our imports from our settings file. We're importing the Chrome driver path, the two URLs we're going to take a look at are books to scrape and uh, Python. Uh, we set up our service, set up our service, set up our driver. So we've got the Chrome window open there, and now let's get our first URL. So we can just do uh, driver .get. then we'll get that books to scrape URL. So that'll open up in the page. Now, if we want to open up a new tab, we can use driver.switch2, new window, and then just specify tab as the parameter. And so we've opened up that new tab, and then we can do driver.get uh, Python URL. We can get that new website there in our browser. Now, the old method of doing this, if you wanted to open a new tab, would, would have been to execute some JavaScript, so execute script here. And then you could do, you could have done window.open uh, just like that. And that should open up a new tab there. So like you see, you've got a new tab, but that's an old way of doing things. It's much better to use switch to new window and tab than to, than to run JavaScript or to have to run JavaScript. If you want to switch between windows, what you're going to have to do or switch between tabs to tabs or windows. What you're going to have to do is check out the uh, current window handles. So this is how you switch between things. So current window handle, it will give you the ID of our current window or our current tab. So that's going to be the ID for this Python website. Uh, if we want to look at the URL, we can check that. Look at the current URL. It says python.org, so that's good. And then you can list all the window handles, which are all of those IDs for each tab or each window uh, using driver.windowhandles. So here you see we've got two of these things. Now if we scroll up and look at the old one, so A96A, A96A is that second tab or the second value here. Uh, so the other one, DE9E, would be the first tab there, that Books to Scrape website. Um, so if we wanted to work with this for a little bit, uh, let's just do, I'm going to do an import. Scroll this up a little bit. And yeah, I'm going to import time here. It's just so that, so that we can use time.sleep for a second. So for handle, 
in driver.window handles. Let's just switch between them so we can just do driver dot switch to new window or no switch to window and then we can specify the window it's just going to be that handle string uh, and then we'll print uh, let's see make this an f string now on driver dot current URL so that we know which one we're on uh, and we'll just do time dot sleep uh, make this three seconds okay so now we're on books to scrape and now it switches back to python.org so that's what happens we just cycle through some of those window handles uh, in order to take a look at our various tabs now if you want to close a, a secondary tab you can use driver.close just like we did with secondary windows so this will close our current tab uh, but then if we try driver.close again this is going to throw an error at us uh, because you can't use it with a um, with a non or you can't use it with your primary window if there's only one window one tab open so if you want to do that now you have to use driver.quit as always Okay, so in this lecture, we went through how you open up new tabs uh, in Python using switch to new window, and then how you can cycle through your tabs using window handles, and then using switch to window, and using those specific window handle strings or IDs to switch between the tabs. Okay, thanks for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on navigating iframes. Iframes or inline frames are basically HTML elements that load other HTML elements inside of your web page. One way of thinking of it is it's kind of like having HTML within HTML. The elements inside an iframe in terms of Selenium can't be selected directly when you open a Selenium web session on a web page. Instead, what you have to do is you have to switch from the main or outer HTML document into the iframe of interest. Additionally, we have that same problem, but in reverse, once we're inside of the iframe. We can't access the main HTML or the outer HTML from our Selenium session. We'd have to switch back to the outer HTML. In terms of the steps of navigating an iframe or navigating iframe elements in Selenium, the first thing you have to do is find that iframe within the HTML document or within the DOM. Then you can switch to that iframe using driver.switchto.frame. And for this, you can pass a web element that specifies the iframe of interest. Then you can find your page element of interest within the iframe. So maybe that's a div or an anchor or a form element whatever you're interested in. And then to get back to the outer HTML, you can use driver.switch2.defaultContent. And that'll take you back up to the highest level of the DOM or the highest level of the HTML page, if you will. In terms of what the code looks like, once you get your URL of interest, if you want to find something that's inside the iframe, so let's say you'd use driver.findElement, and you have an ID and you have the ID string for that element inside of the iframe. If you try to run that code, it'll actually fail and you'll get an error. So first you have to find that iframe element and we can just use driver.findElement to select it. Then we'll use the method we talked about, so driver.switchTo.frame and then we can pass that iframe element in order to switch into the iframe. Once we're inside the iframe, we can look for that element we were looking for by ID. So driver.findElement by ID inside element, and we'll actually select it successfully, unlike when we were outside the iframe. If we want to get back to that upper level of the HTML or the DOM, we can use driver.switchTo.defaultContent. If this seems a little bit confusing, it'll look a lot more clear once we have a chance to go through our Jupyter Notebook 
So let's head over there now to get some practice. All right, so we're going to be taking a look at how we navigate with iframes. We've got our imports all set. From our settings file, we're importing the Chrome driver path, and the URL we're going to use here is the jQuery URL, or the jQuery UI URL, rather. So you can see up here it's jQueryUI.com, or you can go to the settings.py file to take a look at what the URL actually is. Set up the service, set up the driver, and then the URL we're going to get actually is the jQuery URL plus draggable. So it's this slash draggable uh, page on the jQuery UI website. And the reason we're going here, again, you don't have to know jQuery for this um, for this course. It's just that there's a good iframe, good example of an iframe here. Uh, so now what I can do, let's do a, a find here. And let's see if we can find an iframe. Uh, and here we can find an iframe on this web page. So if you look at this, we've got this iframe here. It's a class of demo frame. Uh, and then within the document, there's this HTML here. So there's different HTML from what's outside. It's got a head, it's got a body. Let's take a look at the body. Uh, and we've got this div and it's got an ID of draggable to it. Uh, and so what we can do is we can try to try to, to select that um, that div, right? We want to get something out of that that div within the iframe just so that we can see that you're going to get an error when you when you try to do that. So let's do driver dot find element. Uh, we're going to be searching by ID and the ID of the element is draggable. So we can just do draggable here. Uh, and if I run that, we should get an error that throws up. Uh, it's going to show something down here. No such element. Unable to locate element. ID draggable. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, we've got this div. It's got an ID of draggable. Why can't we select it? So we can't select it because first we have to switch to the iframe. So let's get the iframe element first. So this is iframe element. Let's find it. It's going to be driver dot get no driver dot find element by uh, let's do CSS selector because I don't think this has an ID. I think it's just a let's take a look here. Yeah, it just has a class demo frame. Uh, so we can do find by CSS selector. So this is iframe with a class of demo frame. So now we've got that iframe element there. Okay, so we've got the iframe element and we need to switch to inside the frame if we want to get that uh, that div that we're looking at with the um, with the ID that has the draggable ID. So we're going to use driver.switch to. Then we're going to do frame and we're going to do that iframe element. Okay. So now we're inside the iframe there. So now if I want to do that again, so let's try driver.findElement by ID. The ID is draggable. Let's store this as a variable. Draggable element. If I run that, then I can get it, right? Now I don't have an error. I've got it in there. Uh, let's see, tag name, it's a div, right? Okay, we've got everything that we like there. But now what, you, uh, what we might want to take a look at, let's look at this nav bar. So we've got a nav ID main. This is outside the iframe. Let's try to select that. And what you're going to see is we still run into an error. So we can do driver dot, uh, let's see, what are we doing? Driver dot find element by ID, uh, we'll just find that main, that nav of the main ID. So let's, let's try to store this as a variable. Uh, so what is this? Uh, main nav, just call it that, element, And you see we get another one of these errors saying, uh, no such element, unable to locate element. Again, that's because we're inside the iframe. So we want to move outside the iframe. So now we can do driver dot switch to, and we're just going to switch to the default content there. 
now we're outside the iframe. So if we want to do main nav, it's going to be driver dot find element by ID. The ID is main. We run that. And now we've got it. Main nav dot tag name. It's a nav tag. And now we've got that information. But if we wanted to, again, if we wanted to go back and try to find this draggable ID now, we wouldn't be able to do it because we're outside the iframe. Uh, and again, dri quit your driver once you're done with it. Okay, so in this lecture we went through how you handle iframes or how you work with and around iframes in Selenium. The key thing to remember is that you have to specify it and then switch to it if you want to pull data or interact uh, with elements that are inside an iframe within your web page. Thanks everybody for joining and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on navigating browser history in Selenium. Unfortunately, Selenium does not allow you to access your browser history. So if in your session you're accessing multiple web pages, you won't be able to explicitly figure out what they are. You can't access that history. However, what you can do is you can execute common browser history commands like forward and back which you should be used to if you're used to navigating the web at all. In terms of the commands that you use for this functionality, first you'll open up your driver and your service and all that, and then you can get a first URL of interest, and then maybe you get you use driver.git to get a second URL of interest. You can use driver.back to go back to that first URL, and then you can use driver.forward to move forward to the second URL. Let's head over to Jupyter now to get some practice with this. All right, so we're in Jupyter. We've got all of our imports. The three websites we're going to use for this lecture that you can import from the settings file are the books to scrape URL, the Python URL, and then this quotes to scrape URL, which is just another example or testing website. Uh, we start up the service, start up the driver, so we've got our Chrome window open. Uh, and now let's get a couple of URLs so that we can get that uh, get that history going. So driver.git, and we'll get, uh, first let's get the books to scrape URL. We'll just go in alphabetical order here. Driver.git, let's get the Python URL. And then we can get the, uh, what is it, the, the, quotes to scrape URL. So we do all that. Okay, so we've got a couple of websites. So like I said in the lecture, navigating through your history without specifying a URL is pretty easy. So we can just use driver.back to go backwards. We do driver.back to go back one more time. And then you can do driver.forward as well. So do that. Driver.forward will take us to the quotes URL. Now the one thing that you might try to do or think of doing or wonder if you can do is if you can change chain these, chain these methods together uh, the same way you can do it with find element and you really can't so if I try to do this I'm gonna get an error on that second one. So driver.back returns a none so if you try to operate a back on that you'll just get an error. Uh, so if you want to go back twice what you have to do is uh, specify that on uh, on the driver object. You can't just chain them together. And then quit your driver once you're done with it. Okay, so in this lecture we talked about how you can use the forward and back methods on your web driver to navigate through your web history. Thanks for joining and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on alerts. You've probably seen that web pages can sometimes have alerts or pop-up dialogues that show up as you go through the web page. For example, you might be submitting a form and an alert might pop up saying, are you sure you want to submit? Things like that. In order to interact with these alerts, we need to switch to them in Selenium like we switch to tabs or windows or iframes. Alert objects in Selenium also have methods for dealing with them. 
So we have methods for accepting what the alert says, dismissing what the alert says, so on and so forth. To use this functionality in Selenium, once you have your web page of interest and you see an alert pop up, you can specify the alert by creating a, an object. So here we instantiate alert, the alert variable, and we'll set that equal to driver.switch2.alert. And that gets us into the alert object on the page. Then we can use alert.accept or alert.dismiss in order to accept or dismiss the alert. Let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook to get some practice. Okay, so here we are in Jupyter. We've got all of our imports. The URL we're going to use is the Books to Scrape URL. So we've got that open in our window. And uh, we're going to take a look at alerts here. So the first thing that we can do, there's not an alert on this page, but we can fake one with some JavaScript. Again, this isn't a drop JavaScript course, so feel free to remember to use this or not remember. We don't expect you to know it. It's just an easy way of making an alert pop up that we can interact with in Selenium. So if you're using Selenium on quote unquote real websites, you'll have alerts there that will pop up on their own, but we're just forcing one to get practice interacting with them. So the alert function in JavaScript will force an alert and it should say, hey, this is an alert, and then we can interact with it in Selenium. All right, so we run that script, that JavaScript, and now we've got this alert that pops up on the page. So it says books to scrape.com says, hey, this is an alert. All right, so that's the alert that we want to interact with. To do this in Selenium, we can say driver.switch to uh, alert. So that'll give us the alert, the current active alert on the page. And we can check that with the uh, text attribute. So the text attribute on this alert is, hey, this is an alert. That matches what we see up there. So that's all well and good. As mentioned in the lecture, Selenium gives us some really nice methods to deal with the alerts very easily. So instead of having to search for this OK button up here and then press it, we can just click alert, or we can just run rather, we can just run alert.accept. And that'll accept that alert method message. And now we're back to this page. Um, so that's one example of accepting it. Uh, but now what you'll notice is that we can't access the alert anymore because it's gone away. So even though we've assigned it to uh, assigned it to this alert variable, when we try to pull things off it, it's no longer there. Uh, so we'd have to run it again in order to access that text. Uh, okay, so with the alert JavaScript function, we only get an OK button. Uh, but there's another JavaScript function that we're going to use to force up uh, a pop-up box. Uh, so what do we want? We want driver.execute script. We're going to execute some JavaScript again. And the Jav JavaScript function of interest to us now is confirm. So confirm will give us that yes, no uh, type of alert or pop-up that shows up on our page. So hey, do you want to confirm? run that and okay now we've got that alert over here so books to scrape.com says hey do you want to confirm okay or cancel so now what I can do is I can switch to that alert just like we did before so driver dot switch to alert now I'm in the alert alert dot text check it out hey do you want to confirm that's what we should expect since we wrote the alert uh, and the other useful method for some of these is dismiss. So dismiss is the equivalent of clicking, clicking cancel on this alert. So I do that and you hit cancel and the alert goes away. Okay, so in this lecture we looked at the basically the two methods that you can use to interact with alerts and we looked at how you switch to an alert in order to interact with it in Selenium. Uh, as I mentioned, this isn't a JavaScript course. This was just some small amount of JavaScript to get those alerts to pop up, but you'll see them out in the wild anyway. And now you have the tools 
that you can use to interact with them. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on working with cookies and storage items in Selenium. Selenium provides some nice methods for us if we want to interact with cookies on a web page. In order to get the cookies we can just use driver.getCookies on our web driver object and if we want to add a cookie to work with that for some reason we can just use driver.addCookie and then pass a dictionary with the cookie name and the cookie value. Unfortunately, there's no built-in method for interacting with local or session storage objects with Selenium. Instead, if we want to do something with local or session storage, what we have to do is rely on executing JavaScript using the driver.executeScript method. The code for working with cookies looks as it's shown here. So we can get the URL of interest to us. Then we can use the .getCookies method in order to return that dictionary of cookies in our session or on that web page. And then we can use driver.addCookie and pass the dictionary that looks like shown here in order to add a cookie to our session. So the dictionary will have a, an item for name and then the cookie name, and then an item for value and the cookie value. If we want to work with local storage, as mentioned, we have to use the execute script method to execute JavaScript. So we can write driver.execute script, and if we want to set an item in local storage, we can execute this script window.localStorage.setItem, and then pass the parameters of a key and a value of interest for that storage object. If we want to get something out of local storage, we can also use driver.executeScript, but instead of using window.localStorage.setItem, we, in, we can instead use return window.localStorage.getItem and then pass the key of interest to us. Session storage works much the same way, so we can just use driver.executeScript and then have window.SessionStorage.setItem and pass a key and a value in order to set that item in our session storage. We can also use driver.executeScript and then return window.sessionStorage.getItem passing the key of interest in order to return a specific item out of our session storage. Just as a note, as I've mentioned in previous lectures, this is not a JavaScript course, and so we don't expect you to have a knowledge of JavaScript in order to complete it. The JavaScript parts that we're showing you are more things that are nice to know, not need to know. It could be that you may have to work with session storage or local storage at some point, or you might have to read a Selenium code base that uses those things. And it's useful to know that you have to use the execute script method along with some JavaScript to achieve those goals. But again, it's not crucial to your use or understanding of Selenium. For now, however, let's head over to Jupyter and get some practice interacting with cookies and storage objects in Selenium. Okay, so we've got our Jupyter Notebook set up and we've got our Selenium session open, so we've done all of our, done all of our imports. Uh, from the settings file, we've got the Chrome driver path and the website we're going to take a look at is python.org, so you can import the Python URL. Uh, we've got the service, and we've got the driver set up and we got the Python URL so we're good to go. So what we're taking a look at in this lecture is uh, are rather are the cookies and the um, local and session storage. You can access this type of information in your Chrome DevTools um, dock or window rather. Uh, if you go to the application tab and under application you got this storage section so you can look at cookies under cookies. So we've got one which is for this website, so python.org, and these are the cookies that we have so far. So we can access these cookies from Selenium, or from Python rather, using driver.getCookies. And that'll give us the list of all of the cookies available to us. 
And if you look at it, the names are all the same. So we've got this, uh, looks like a double underscore UTMB, uh, double underscore UTMZ, and it's got all this information associated with, with it. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what all of this means, but the point is you can you can get cookies if you need to interact with cookies in some way in Selenium. Now if you want to set a new cookie, what you can do is driver.addCookie. So we'll do driver.addCookie, uh, and then let's make this a dictionary. And so the name of the cookie will be my new cookie. And then the value will be, let's just make this, hey, look at my cookie. And so for this, you do need a dictionary with a uh, name and value. You can't just make it, you know, two things, my new cookie and, hey, look at my cookie. Uh, that won't work in Selenium. But we can pass this now using add cookie. Uh, and so if I refresh this in here in my Chrome DevTools tab, we've got the new cookie down here. So you can see we've got the name is, let's move this over a little bit. The name is my new cookie and the value is, hey, look at my cookie. So that's how we're able to pass cookies to and from uh, Selenium uh, using this type of functionality. Now the next thing that we can do is we can look at uh, local storage and session storage. So that's up here. You can look at uh, these types of things. So you go to the website. Right now there's nothing there for local storage, and nor is there anything there for session storage. Again, Selenium doesn't provide us with an API to do this type of work or to interact with local and session storage, but it's good to know that you can execute JavaScript if you need to. Again, the, the use case for this would probably be pretty specific, so you, I doubt you need to remember it to use it in lots of scenarios, but it's a good thing to be aware of. Uh, and so the way we do this, the way you set an item, is you have to use window.localStorage. We'll do local storage first and then do session storage. So window.localStorage.setItem, and then you have the key and the value. So we'll say key one, value one. So execute that script. And now if we want to get the item, we can do item dot or driver dot execute script. And the script we're going to execute is return window dot local storage dot get item. So instead of setting, we're getting. And we're going to search based on that key. So it's key one. Now if I go to the local storage here, you'll see that key one and value one are now set in the local storage uh, for this, this Selenium session. And so if I run this get item here, you get value one, which is just the value of that variable or that key in our local storage. Things work the same way for session storage. You just change the type of storage. So driver.execute script. Then we can do window dot session storage instead of local storage dot set item uh, key two and value two and that then we'll run that. Now if we go look at the session storage here for the website, we've got the key and the value that we just passed with the execute script method from from our Jupyter notebook. Then if we wanted to get that item out of storage, we could execute a script again. And this time it's basically the same thing. So you're going to return window.sessionStorage.getItem. And the key of interest here is key two. So that's all well and good. We've got our JavaScript in there. Execute it and value two, which is what we sent to it and what's stored in our, in our session storage. Okay, so in this lecture we took a look at interacting with cookies in Selenium. So it's pretty straightforward because we have APIs for that. So you can get and add cookies. If you want to work with local or session storage, however, there's no good API for that. So you'll have to use execute script, the execute script method in order to run these kind of snippets of JavaScript. 
to interact with those storages. Okay, thanks for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on resizing windows in Selenium. Changing the window size of your WebDriver session could be useful while you're using Selenium if you want to test website accessibility, mobile actions, and things of that sort. Some of the useful methods in Selenium for getting information about window size and position are as follows. You could use driver.getWindowSize to get the size of your window in terms of the height and the width. You can also use driver.getWindowPosition to get the position in terms of the X and Y position on the screen. And then if you use driver.getWindowRect or getWindowRectangle, it'll return both the size and the position of your current window. If you'd like to change or set the window size and position, you can use the following methods. So set window size, just like get window size, is a way of setting the window size in terms of height and width of the window. You can set the position on the screen in terms of X and Y with the set window position. And then set window rectangle, or set window rect, takes both of these. So you can set both the size and the position of your window. If you'd like simpler actions, so just minimizing or maximizing your window, and maximizing your window is a good thing to do usually at the start of your sessions. You can use driver.minimizeWindow to minimize your window and driver.maximizeWindow to maximize it. Let's head over to Jupyter to see these methods in action. All right, we've got our Jupyter Notebook open, the website we're taking a look at. Not that it's super important because we're just resizing windows in this lecture, but the website we're taking a look at is Book to Scrape start your service, start your driver, get the books to scrape URL, and then we can dive into all those methods that we talked about in terms of getting and setting the window size. So you can use Selenium to resize your browser window to an arbitrary dimension or position, and you can also get information on the current window size. So we can get window size, for example. So it says width of 697 pixels, height 775 pixels. Um, if we wanted to get the position, we could use driver.get window position. So that tells us the X and the Y position of our browser on the screen or our window on the screen. And then you can get both of these if you get window rect, which is rectangle. Uh, and so then you get the height and the width and the X and the Y all at once. So that's one way of accessing all that information. Now if you want to minimize your window, you can use driver.minimize window. Run that and go to the background there. And then you can use driver.maximize maximize window too. And now that'll open it up and now you can see it takes up the entire screen. So let's go back over here to our Jupyter Notebook. Now if you want to set window size or position, you have all of those. So set, uh, set window, so position, rectangle size. They work the same as the, the getter methods. So let's just do set window rectangle. And we can just set in some arbitrary things here. So X position of 20, Y position of 50. Let's make the height. Uh, equal to 600 and then the width is equal to 600 as well. Run that. Okay so now you can see we've got the uh, window resize there and that's the way that you can interact with the window sizes. Okay so in this lecture we talked about all the way you can minimize, maximize your windows or get and set their their sizes. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our section on filling in forms using Selenium. And the first thing we're going to talk about is buttons and how you work with them. Buttons are all over the place on the web in all different types of forms. You can find buttons in the web pages you're working on, 
using all of Selenium's locator strategies that we've seen in previous sections. So for example, if you wanted to find all the buttons on a page, you could search by tag name and then just use the button tag. You can interact with buttons in a few different ways. The first is you can click them, obviously, since that's a pretty normal way of interacting with buttons on a web page. And Selenium gives us the dot click method for any button element we're working with. You can also do what's called context clicking or right clicking on a button, or you can do a click and then a hold and a release. For things like click and hold or the context click, which is a right click, instead of having those methods on the web element of interest, or in this case, the button element of interest, what we need to do is we need to use something called action chains, a class called action chains in Selenium. What action chains do is they chain together specific user actions or inputs, such as moving a mouse between a specific location, uh, clicking mouse buttons, for example, so that context click where you're right clicking or clicking and holding it, pressing keys together. So if you want to do something like control P for printing, drag and drops, and a lot of other different actions. We'll see some more of these as we go through this section on filling in forms. From the code, like we saw in one of the previous slides, if you want to work with buttons in Selenium, like clicking on buttons, you do all your imports, set up your driver, then you can find your element of interest, whatever way is easiest, and you can click it just using the dot click method. In terms of using more complex actions on the button, first you have to instantiate an action chains object, and the parameter you're going to pass is your web driver, and you should store this as a variable as well. To perform actions, you can use methods associated with that action chain object. So for a context click, you can write action.contextClick, specify the element you want to context click or right click on, and then run a dot perform in order to perform the action. For click and hold, you do basically the same thing, except you use the click and hold method and then specify the element of interest. Now that we've talked about how this works, let's head over to Jupyter and get some practice. All right, so we're in our Jupyter notebook and we've got the imports that we usually have, so web driver, service, and buy. But the other thing we're gonna wanna use because we have to use action chains uh, this time is we need to import that class. So from Selenium, this comes from Selenium dot, where does it come from? Dri web driver dot common dot action chains and then we can import that action chains action chains class uh, so let's run that so we've got that available um, the settings from the settings file we've got the chrome driver path books to scrape url we've set up our service and all that so we've got the window open so let's just get that uh, books to scrape url in there go to that page. Okay, so now it's popped open. So we're gonna be interacting with buttons. So the first thing we wanna do is select it like anything in any given web page, right? So let's take a look at this button, add to basket. So here you've got the button tag, it's a submit type, uh, the data loading, all that stuff. Um, but let's just select all the buttons in the page. The other thing you might wanna be aware of is that with certain types of uh, HTML markup or classes. So with Bootstrap, for example, which is a way of styling your web page UI, you can also get buttons that aren't buttons. So for example, you could have an anchor tag, an A tag with a button class in Bootstrap that makes it look like a button, even though it's not technically a button HTML element. But that said, you can still interact with it the same way. So let's get all the buttons on this page. We can use driver.findElements. And then we're gonna search by tag name because we just want the buttons. So by tag name, uh, and then we're looking for a button, the button tag. So that gives us all of the buttons on the page. So if we look at that, 
uh, there's 20 buttons, 20 buttons on this page, which checks out because I think that's the number of books on the page too. So we can select the first button if we want. So button one is going to be, let's make it button zero. Uh, so we got that. We look at button one dot text should be add to basket. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. And if we want to interact with it, we can just click on it. So buttons have a click method. So we can just say click, run that. And I think this action just reloads the page. So you can see all it does is reload the page. Now what happens, however, if you try to click on it again, is that the page is reloaded. So you're going to get an error here. This button's uh, not on there. Stale element reference is the error that you get. So we're going to have to find that button again if we want to work with it. Delete that cell. Go into here. Uh, so we can just do what we did again. Driver dot find elements by tag name. And the tag name is button. So that's buttons, and then button one is going to be uh, buttons zero, so that first item on the list. So now we've got that button one, and it's just that it's just that add to basket text from the first the first button underneath that first book. Uh, okay, so for more complicated actions or click actions with buttons or whatever there is on the page, we'll have to use the actions action chains object. So we'll instantiate it. So actions is going to be action chains. Uh, then we have to pass the driver. So we can just do that. And then let's do a context click on that button here. So it's in the page, so we should be able to see it. Uh, on element is the parameter of interest there. So the on element is going to be that button one. So that's just this add to basket here. So we'll context click on that, which is a right click, and then dot perform. So you see that, now we've got this uh, right click menu up here that we can interact with somehow if we really want to. Uh, let's click out of that. Uh, you can also do a click and hold. So let's do an actions dot click and hold on element again is the parameter of interest to us and we just want to do that on button one and then we'll end with perform so it performs the action so you can see that here it's kind of changed uh, it's got that black outline um, and then if we wanted to I think we could do actions dot release dot perform and that should unclick the button, right? So now the page is reloaded again. Um, and like I mentioned, you can do some of these actions with uh, various parts of the page. So if we go up here, the the books to scrape is, let's click on that. It's an A tag, right? But we can still click on it. We can still act like it's a button and click on it. So the link element uh, let's just do driver dot find element find element uh, by tag name so we're just gonna get that first link and then we can click on that so link element dot text is gonna be books to scrape so again it's the website title up here books to scrape uh, and we can click on that because we still have access to that click method and now it's just reloaded the page really, or just gone to the home page again. Okay, so in this lecture, we learned how to interact with buttons on a page, and we got our first exposure to that action chains class again. So the action chains will become useful in the future as well, as we deal with things like drag and drop, sliders, uh, and sending keys to a web page. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on working with input elements or text boxes in Selenium.
Input elements or text boxes are very, very common on forms throughout the web. In terms of the actions you'll usually want to be performing on these fields, you'll probably want to fill it out with some text or clear it. To clear it, you can select your input element or text box and then use the dot clear method on it. That will remove any text inside that text box. In order to fill it out, you can use input element dot send keys and then pass the string of interest for how you want to fill out the field. Let's say you've got a first name field that you want to fill out. You can get that element and then you send keys and pass the string with the first name of interest that you will be using to fill out that form field. In terms of the code, you'll have to have all your imports and service and drivers set up. You can get the input element of interest using any of the methods we've used before. So ID, tag name, name, uh, any of that stuff. Then you can clear it if there's any placeholder text or if you want to make sure that it's clear when you send keys. So you can use dot clear. And then you can send the text using dot send keys with the string of interest. So here we've got filling forms is cool. And that's the text that we're sending to the input element. Now that we've talked about how this works in Selenium, let's go over to Jupyter to get some practice. All right, so we've got our Jupyter session open, our Jupyter notebook open. We don't need that action chains import that we had in the last lecture. So that's been removed from our imports. We just have web driver, service, and buy. Then from the settings file, we're going to be taking a look at the Python web page. So like you can see over here, we're on python.org. We've got our service and our driver set up, and then we've gotten that URL. So now the input element that we're going to take a look at, the obvious one on the page, is this search box here. So where we can enter some text and then go search for it on the website. So if I inspect that with my Chrome DevTools inspectors, what you get is this input tag here. It's got an ID of ID search field and a name of Q. So we can search for that either by ID or name. Let's use, um, let's use the name for now just because we haven't used that in a while. Uh, so what we want is we want, let's do input element, call this input element, and this is equal to driver dot find element and it's going to be by the name and the name is Q. So now we should have that input element that's a search box. Uh, if we dot, let's check the tag name. So the tag name is an input, so that's good. And then let's check the attribute. So input element dot get attribute. And the attribute, let's take a look at the placeholder. Placeholder will be search. So all that works like with locating elements like we've seen before. In terms of the text in this, we can check that with the text attribute. And there's nothing in there. So the search we see, like we saw up here, that's just a placeholder in the HTML. It's not actual text in the text box. So if we wanted to uh, maybe send it some send it some text to do a search. I'm going to make this a constant so that we can reuse it. So let's do search text, Python news. It's going to be what we're searching for. So we've got the input element and use that. And then what we want to do to fill it out is we can send keys and we're going to send it that string, that search text string. And now you can see it's been filled out up here, right? We've got Python news. So if I scroll back over to the right, you can see the beginning of it, we got the end of it. That's the string that we're going to be searching for. Now if I wanted to clear it, I could just do input element dot clear. And now it goes away. Now we're back to just that search placeholder there. All right. So now if we wanted to run a search, what we can do is we need to, uh, we can, let's get that search button. So search button and that's the this one here. So let's click on that. Let's go. So it's a button. Uh, it's got a name of submit, ID of submit. So we can use either one of those to find the buttons. So let's do driver dot find element uh, by let's 
do ID. ID is submit, so that's pretty easy. The text on that, let's just make sure, is go, so that matches up. So now we can send the um, send that search text, or what did I call it? Search text element. Oh, that's right. Dot send keys. So input element dot send keys, and then I can send it search text. Let's do that. So that's there, and then we can do search. Uh, let's do search button. And we can click that button like we saw in the previous lecture. It's just a button, we can interact with it that way. So now it's gone, the search has been performed. Uh, let's scroll down a little bit. So now you have all these results here on the Python website. All right, so in this lecture, we took a look at how you interact with text boxes. Uh, and so it's pretty, pretty the, there's a couple of easy steps. So basically you wanna find the element you want to clear it if there's stuff in it using the clear method. And then you can send keys to send a string of interest. And if you want to click that go button, you can find the button and click it like we saw in the previous lecture as well. Okay, thanks everybody for joining and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on interacting with radio buttons and checkboxes in Selenium. Radio buttons and checkboxes are used to specify options in HTML forms. Both radio buttons and checkboxes work fairly similarly to what we've already seen with buttons in Selenium. You can use a click method on them, for example, to click the element and select it. And you can use the isSelected method to check to see if the element is selected in the form. The one difference to be aware of with check boxes and radio buttons is that if you click and then click again on a checkbox, that will select and then deselect it. With a radio button, as soon as you click it, it will be selected and it can only be unselected if you click on another radio button element. To use this in Python, you can do all your imports and service and driver setup. Finally, you can get the checkbox element that you're looking for or that you want to interact with. You can check to see if it's selected if you want to make sure that it is or isn't before you interact with it. So again, that's just that dot is selected method. And then you can select it via a click, so the dot click method. As I mentioned, radio buttons work much the same way, with the one exception that you can't unselect it by clicking it. Let's head over to Jupyter now to get some practice with this. Here we are in our Jupyter notebook. We've got our imports. The website we're gonna take a look at in this lecture is the Goldbugs website. So this is just a fake band website, basically. You can see it's open here, so the goldbugs.com, or you can import it from our settings file. Set up the service, set up the driver, get the URL, and then we're good to go. So in this lecture, we're interacting with checkboxes. So if you scroll down here, you can see there's a form here. So let's click on this to see if we can find find the form or find the uh, generic object here. So we've got the div, and I think this div holds the form. So yeah, we've got the div with the form wrapper, form inner wrapper, uh, and then we've got this form here that contains all the stuff that we need. So let's get that um, let's get that form. Or the other thing we can take a look at actually is the um, is here. So we got the field set. So let's click on let's click on this. Where is this? There we go. Okay, we get legend. And actually, here we go. We've got the field set. So it's actually a field set tag that we're interested in, uh, and it's got an ID. So let's Control C to copy that. We can just copy it out of the dev tools. Uh, and then we can select that so that we can look at the checkboxes there. So field set, let's call that field set. Scroll this up a little bit. Uh, field set is driver.find element uh, by ID, and then copy and paste that ID. So it's fairly long, you don't want to type it out. So okay, shift enter. Now we've got that. 
uh, field set dot tag name. Let's just check this out. So field set. Okay, so that's kind of what we expect. So now if we want to pull the checkbox elements out of that, so checkboxes, we can just look inside the field set. We don't have to look for the specific thing in the entire HTML. This is that chaining, chaining of locators, right? So we've got these option divs here with a label, and then you've got an input. So the input's over here, or you can click on it with the element explorer here. So it's input type checkbox. So that's probably one way that we could look for it. So let's do field set dot, um, what are we looking for here? Dot find elements. So we want all of the, all of the checkboxes on this. So we can do, let's do by XPath. We're gonna look for, we're looking for the input. Maybe make this on a new line. We're looking for the input and an input with a certain type. So we want the type to be a uh, checkbox. And you can check this in the uh, in the DevTools console tab if you like, but it should work, so we're not gonna check it this time. Uh, it's, we can just tell it works, so it's a good XPath. Uh, okay, so we got the checkboxes. So checkbox one, just make that checkboxes, uh, checkboxes, let's see, one, uh, and so checkbox one dot get attribute, let's get attribute of the value, so the first one here, if we click on that, is no response res required, so let's get attribute value, no response re required. And if you look at, uh, so if you just, if you look at, let's look at checkboxes zero um, dot text. It's sort of like this hidden checkbox on the page. Um, so we don't have to worry about that. That's why we're not using zero, we're using one instead. Um, okay, so get attribute, no response required. Uh, and now we can check, is it selected? So it's not selected on the page. Let's just verify that is selected, false, so it's not selected, right? So if we want to select it, we can click it, checkbox one, dot click. Now it's selected, you see we got the check mark that shows up on the page there. We can check if it's selected again, so click, or not click, uh, is selected. And now it's true, right? We switch the state on that checkbox. If we do it again, checkbox one dot click, and then check, it's gone back to not being selected, so false. Um, now for the next part, we can take a look at the radio buttons. Uh, so we'll just find elements on the page. If I click on this, uh, let's click on that input. So it's an input of type radio. So that's what we're gonna look for and we're gonna use an X path again for this. So radio buttons on the page is equal to driver dot find elements. We're gonna go by X path again. And then the string we want is pretty similar to what we did above. So slash slash input, so relative inputs with a type field that's equal to radio. Uh, and that's what we're gonna search for here. So run that, radio, length of radio buttons, seven. Uh, and the reason for that, we've got these two here, and then we've got these five radio buttons down here to work with. So we're just gonna probably deal with the type of event uh, radio buttons. So let's do radio button, one is going to be equal to radio buttons zero. So that first one, which should be private show. So if we check that out, radio button one dot get attribute. And then we want to look at the value. So the value, like we can see here, is private show, or the text would be private show too, I think. Um, 
radio button one, get attribute value, private show, that's what we expect. We can check to see if it's selected, so is selected, and this is false. So we can click it just like we did with the uh, with the checkbox, right? But now it's selected. So radio button one is selected is true. Unlike with the checkbox, like I mentioned before, if you click it again, it's not going to do anything. It's still selected, right? So that's just one thing to keep in mind while you're working with radio buttons versus working with uh, checkboxes here. Okay, so in this lecture we learned how to click and unclick checkboxes, how to find them, and how to click radio buttons as well. And then we talked about how to unclick radio buttons. So essentially to unclick them you have to click another one, right, to unselect it. Uh, and we went through the methods that you can use in Selenium to, uh, to use those actions. Thanks for joining and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on working with drop-down menus. Drop-down menus are really select elements or select tags in the HTML source file of the web page that you're interacting with. The options in these drop-down menus or select elements are contained within the option tags. You can interact with these elements using all of the basic methods that we've learned so far for forms. So you can select them using whatever by method that you that you choose or whichever one is easiest. You can click on that if, if you'd like. Or, and this is really the much easier and the better way of interacting with them, you can use what's called a select object. Select objects in Selenium are basically objects that provide very nice wrappers and very nice methods for dealing with these select or drop-down menu elements on a web page. For example, you have the options attribute of the select object, so you can see what the options are for the things that you can select in that drop-down menu. You, th you can then select by index, so 0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. You can select by visible text, so that's going to be the text that's visible to the user. Or you can select by value, which is the HTML attribute associated with each option. These types of methods and attributes also work with multi-select menus, where you can select more than one thing at once. Additionally, with the multi-select menus, we get some deselect methods as well, because you can both select and unselect multiple items. In the code, the way you work with these things is you have to have an import from a module that we haven't used before. So from selenium.webdriver.support.ui, you can import the select class. Then to instantiate that select object, you find the select element on the page, or that drop-down element, and then you pass it to the select object to instantiate it. To look at the options on that object, you can write select.options, and that'll list all the options you have for the drop-down menu. In terms of selecting items on that list in order to fill out the drop-down menu in a form, you can use the dot select by index method and then just pass a number of the, of the index that you want to select in order to select by value, and so that's the value of the HTML attribute, not what's shown on the screen. You can use dot select by value and then pass that value string. For multi-selects, as I mentioned, you also have deselect methods that are equivalent to their select method, or the opposite counterpart, rather, of their select method. So you can have that select object and then deselect by index. Works just the same way, except you're deselecting. And then you've also got deselect all. So that's if you want to clear out a multi-select and start again. Let's head over to Jupyter now to see how these work on the web. Okay, so we're in our Jupyter Notebook and we've got all of our normal imports. The one other thing that we're going to want to import for this lecture, because we're going to be dealing with drop-down menus or select items, from a Selenium perspective at least, 
is we want to import from Selenium WebDriver dot support dot UI we want to import that select class so let's run that and then we're good to go we're on the gold bugs website so we've already done our driver dot git and now we can take a look at this so if you look at this website we can scroll down to the booking form and down here we've got a how did you hear about us drop down menu so let's click on that for a second uh, and take a look at this um, select item so there's a few things we can do here to interact with it. So if we want to just select it uh, via kind of our classic methods, we can select the, uh, let's do a select, call it select element, we can do driver.find element. Uh, I think the best way of doing this is probably by ID. So let's do ID, and then we can just copy that from the ID field in our Chrome dev tools copy that paste it over here it's a little bit long but that's okay uh, and then we can run this and then we've got our select element there so now let's print the let's do select element dot text maybe see what's inside so then we've got kind of this messed up text that's all the um, that's all the options for it or maybe if we do print then we can get the um, get the nice way of uh, formatting it Let's do that. So here we've got all the options for that select element. Uh, the other way that you could get the options is that you can maybe do option elements. Uh, let's do select element because they'll be inside there. Dot find elements. We'll search by tag name. And so if you look inside here, we've got these option tags, right? Let's scroll up a little bit. Uh, so option, option, option with some values. So let's just do by tag name, we want the option tag. Lowercase. Okay. Now let's loop th through this real quick just to look at some stuff. So for the element in the that list of option elements, we can print, print an F string. And what we want, let's do element.text and then do element.get attribute and we'll do the value there. So the value and the option like you can see in the HTML here that's like Google, Facebook, um, that's in the HTML that's not in the user facing text uh, on the page. Um, let's get this to stop scrolling there. Uh, so let's run that. So here they're one and the same, but they might be different on a different web page. So Google is a text, Google is the value attribute. Uh, so that's one way of getting it. Uh, and in terms of clicking on it, again, we'll, we'll take a look at the select, but we're doing it the hard way now. Uh, so let's do option elements. Let's do hit the bracket there. Let's say hit the right key. Uh, so let's just do the last one, uh, so negative one, which I think is other, uh, and we can just click that. Option elements. So let's try that. So now you can see we're, we've got that clicked, and it's clicked to other. If we run this again, but let's do it with um, one, then it should switch to, you can see it switched to Facebook, which is that zero, one, it's that uh, second option, one in Python, because it's zero-based indexing, of course. Uh, so we've gone through this, that's one way of dealing with it, but it's really not the easiest way. You want to make your life easy in Selenium. And so what you can do instead is really instantiate a select object to deal with these drop-down menus. We've already got the select element picked out on the page, so we'll just do the select object in this way. So now if we want to look at the options, we can just do select.options. And then we've just got essentially a list of these web driver elements. So instead of doing that, let's do, uh, let's do a print and we'll do a list comprehension. So that's a little bit easier to read. Let's do option.text for option. Scroll this down a little bit for you guys. Uh, for option, 
in select dot options. So select dot options is that list of web driver elements that we see down here. Uh, and so we're just going to get the text off of each one of those options. And now you can see we've got Google, Facebook, Instagram. So this is a lot easier than trying to figure out uh, where these options are on the page. And if we want to select, we can just select by index as well. So select by index. We can do index, let's see, 0, 1, 2, 3. So if we do 3, that'll give us other. So you can see now this is switched to other, right? Uh, another way of doing this is select dot select by visible text. In this case, visible text and value are the same, so it wasn't didn't really matter. But sometimes value and visible text are different, so you might want to use one or the other. But here we'll do visible text, and let's do uh, Google. So now we switch the option to Google. So as you can probably see by this. Um, this is a lot easier way of dealing with drop-down menus in Selenium than having to go through and find element by element, basically. Now, if we were to do uh, a multi-select, you'd have these methods like deselect all or deselect by visible text, so on and so forth. This isn't a multi-select, so we can't do that. But just so you're aware, in case you see multi-select forms on or multi-select fields on forms you're dealing with in Selenium. Okay, thanks everybody for joining this lecture where we saw how to deal with drop-down menus using the select class in Selenium, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on interacting with calendar pickers in Selenium. Calendar pickers have really become a very common form element in a lot of different websites these days. So you might think of an airline booking site, for example, where you have to pick the date of your flight to a place and the date of your return flight. You could think of a hotel booking site or a hotel reservation site where you have to put in the start date and the end date of your stay. All of those might be involved with calendar pickers. Calendar pickers are generally composed of three components of interest to us in terms of how we use Selenium. The first is an input field where the date of interest will end up. The second part of it is usually some JavaScript or jQuery that will make the calendar pop up as soon as that input field is activated. And then the calendar itself is usually some sort of table element to hold the rows and columns of the dates of any given month. These components and our list of these components really provide us the outline of how we're going to interact with calendar pickers in Selenium. The first things first, so we have to find that calendar input element on a page. Then we can activate the JavaScript or the jQuery that will make the calendar pop up. So we can do that usually with a click uh, in order to activate that input element and then activate the JavaScript. Once the calendar picker has been activated and we've got that table element showing on the page, you can select the date of interest using the row and column or using some sort of data coming from the HTML uh, tags in that, in that table. Sometimes you can also use send keys on the input element to simply fill out the date rather than picking it from a calendar picker. The one thing to note about this method is that you may still end up activating the calendar, and so then you'll still have to click into the text box or click the date in order to get the calendar to go away. Now that we've talked about the steps of how we interact with a calendar picker in Selenium, let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook to get some practice. Okay, so we've got our Jupyter Notebook open. We've done our imports. The website we're going to be using is the jQuery UI. Uh, website you can so you can import that URL the jQuery UI URL and then once you have your driver set up the URL you can actually get is the base URL plus date picker so we're going to be interacting with that jQuery um, functionality here to get some practice with uh, using date pickers in Selenium uh, the one thing to note on this though if you click on this so let's click on this date picker here 
This is inside a head and a body, inside an HTML, inside of an iframe with a class of demo frame. So as we should remember from our iframe lesson, uh, we first have to switch into that iframe before we can start interacting with the date picker. If we try to just do it the normal way, we won't be able to do that because that's how, that's how iframes work. So we can do iframe element is driver dot find element by CSS selector, and then it's going to be iframe dot demo frame. So the iframe tag with a demo frame class. Then we can do driver dot switch to. We're going to switch to a frame, uh, and the frame we're switching to is that iframe element. So now we're inside of the iframe, uh, and we can try to find that input element, that date picker. So input element is going to be driver dot find find element. Uh, let's take a click on this again to see. It's got an ID of date picker, so we'll just use that. That's the easiest way to do it. So find element by ID date picker. It's the ID. So now we've got that input element. If we want to activate it, we can click on it. So now you can see we've got this uh, calendar that's popped up, right? That we can use as a calendar picker. Uh, so selecting an element in here is basically the same as selecting any, ele any element that we might want. So if I click on that, you see you've got this A uh, and you've got a TD. Um, which is a table cell basically um, and it's got some information so date a month, date a year um, and all sorts of other stuff in here a data date 18 uh, so that's today's date um, so you get the yeah you get the month you got the year and then you got the data date now this is slightly more complicated so in order to select things here you can do a couple different things, but I actually think the best way is probably to do an XPath. Uh, and I'm just going to select today's date because obviously you can watch that this video at basically any point in time. So it's easier just to select uh, a relative date rather than picking something specific so that everybody has to change things. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, import. Let's do a date time import. So from from date time import date time just so that we can get the now um, the now method so let's make a couple of objects we want month day and year so now is date time dot now uh, the year is going to be now dot year uh, month is going to be now dot month and then day is going to be now dot day. So we're on that. If you look at year 2022, we look at month, month is 11, and then day uh, is 18. So that's everything that we really want there. Um, now we need to do the X pass for this. So you can test it out in the Chrome Dev Tools if you want, uh, but we're just going to construct it. So the first thing we need is we're trying to get to that. We're trying to get this A here. That's got a data date of 18. But first we have to go to this TD with a data month 10 and a data year 2022. So how do we construct this? We can do an F string. So we'll use those variables that we just made. It's relative. So we want to go to a TD first, TD where, let's see, we've got data month and data year. Those are the two variables that we want to match, or the two attributes that we want to match. So here, uh, if you look at the month, the month was 11, but in here, the data month is 10. So again, I think that's a one indexing thing. So you want month minus one to match data month. And then data year is just going to be uh, year. 
Okay, so that's the two parts of that. And then the next part we want, once we have that TD, we have to go inside it to the A tag. And we want the A tag where data date is equal to our day. So this is a long F string, um, but it should make sense to you once you compare it to here. So we've got year, month, day. It's going to be 10, 22, and 18, so it'll bring us down into this A tag that we want to click on, right, or that box that we want to click on in the date picker. Uh, now to find that element, let's find that, let's call it date element, element. We're going to search, we've got the X path there, let's just search by the date path. So now we've got it selected, it should be selected. Let's see, could be that I've got a bad string somewhere. Invalid selector. Oh, okay, I'm missing a, missing a quote here, I think. Yeah, missing a quote, and okay, I've got the brackets messed up. So, let's see, delete that, close the bracket. So that's one, and then we've got this other bracket over here. Okay, so let's try that. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so that was just, make sure to check your brackets and your, um, your quotes on these things. So if I look at the date element.txt, that should be 18. All right, so that's the day we want to select, so that's all good. And then we can just click it, right? So let's click this element. And then it gets filled in. So you see see now we've got this date in the in the input field there. 11 18 22, that's today's date. All good. Uh, since it is an input field, you can still uh, clear it. So let's do input element, which is that that text box there. Clear. So that'll clear out the date, but you can see it also activates the um, the date picker. So now if I got this input element and I want to try to fill out the date using using keys, so we'll make this an F string. So we got month. You saw the format it was month, day, year. So we can send that. You can see we filled it out now and it's valid, right? But we still have this date picker up. So if you fill out your date this way, if you just send the keys, you're going to have to click on it or something to disactivate that JavaScript with the date picker. So if I click on it or if I maybe um, click outside of it again, you know, uh, then then that'll be what disactivates the the um, the calendar table in there and we'll clear that off your screen. So like you can see there's a couple pros and cons to using both methods. If you're clicking on the input field and then selecting from the calendar table that takes a little while maybe to get your search string that you're looking for to click on the right date. But if you send the keys to the input then you kind of have to click around to um, get the calendar to go away because sending keys to the input will usually activate the calendar. Okay, so in this lecture we went through how you interact with uh, a calendar picker with Selenium. Thanks for joining and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on uploading and downloading files in Selenium. Generally speaking, file uploads only involve sending text or keys to an input element like we've seen with any text box or input field before. However, one thing to note is that the path sent to the input element must be a real path on your computer and it must satisfy any upload restrictions. So for example, if the form only accepts .png files, you should only send a .png file. If you don't adhere to these rules, so if you don't send a real path or if you send a file that's not permitted by the input element, 
you'll trigger an error in your Python code. In terms of file downloads, they're pretty straightforward. All you have to do is click on the element or the download button of interest and that will activate the download and it will end up in your download directory. One thing to make note of, however, is that you can change the download directory with Chrome options. The way this looks like in code is that you can instantiate an options object using webdriver.chrome options. And there are other ones for Firefox or the other browsers. Then what you can do, at least in Chrome, is you can do options dot add experimental options. The first parameter is going to be prefs for preferences. And then you can pass a dictionary with these preferences. For us, right now, we're only interested in changing the default directory for our download. So we'll pass a dictionary that says download.default directory. And then the value for that key is going to be the path to your default directory if you want to change it. Then we can instantiate our web driver as normal, just using webdriver.chrome, passing the service. But then we'll pass another parameter, which is the options parameter. And so we can just pass that options object that we defined above. If you don't do this before starting your web driver, the options you add won't get added to your web driver. So you have to make sure to do it before you start your web driver, not afterwards. Let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook to get some practice with this. OK, so we've got our Jupyter Notebook open with all of our imports. The websites we're going to be looking at for this practice are you can import them from the settings file. It's a Python download URL, so python.org slash downloads, which is open to the left there in our Chrome browser. And then the imager upload URL as well. We'll take a look at that later when we talk about file uploads. Uh, so start the service, start the web driver, and then get that download URL, and then we can get going. So to download a file, there's typically a button or something similar, a link or something that you can click on in order to download the file of interest. Maybe it's in a form, maybe it's not in a form, so here it's not really in a form, but we can still get some practice with it. Let me just uh, zoom in on the HTML here. So we've got this button to download Python 3.11. And if you look at the class, there's a P here with a class of download buttons, and then an A tag with a class of button, but there's not really a good ID or name to take on that's very specific. There might be other things in the page with a button class, for example. So what we can do is we can copy this XPath and search for this button element by XPath. Uh, so I'll just store this as a string constant. So button XPath and then paste the XPath that we copied from our Chrome dev tools. So you can see it's pretty long, which is why we don't want to don't want to type it out by hand. We can just copy and paste it from the Chrome Dev Tools. That's a lot easier. It's a much better way of doing it. Then we can find this download element. So download element. We'll just do driver dot find element. We're searching by XPath here, and then our XPath is that string that we just wrote. So the button XPath. Okay, great. So now we've got that going. Uh, to, so to download something, all we have to do is click on it. So it might be a button, it might be a link with a button style, but we can just click on it and that will start the download. So you can see here on, on Chrome, there's a little bit of a warning, so we can keep it there. Uh, we're not worried about it, it's just a python.exe file. Uh, and then the download starts and once it's done, you'll have your whatever file it is that you downloaded. The one other thing that we do want to talk about, though, uh, for you to be aware of is that uh, Chrome options that we were talking about in the lecture. So by default, on most browsers, your default download folder is just your downloads folder, right? So on Windows, for me, it's users, B-A-B-I-G, downloads, and the file will download into that, into that folder. If I want to change that, however, I can change that using uh, Chrome options. So let's cancel this download for now. Cancel that. Uh, I can do that with uh, Chrome options. So the download directory for me 
uh, write this out. Um, and this is Windows. So unfortunately, on Windows, you have some issues with the backslash. So I'm going to do that without the raw string, just so that you see the error. Uh, so I'm going to make this C users be a big and then desktop. So download to the desktop instead of uh, instead of the downloads folder. If I do this, I'll get an error because of these backslashes. So you have to um, double slash out of it or pass it as a raw string on Windows. You usually don't have that problem on Linux or Macs because there are um, forward slashes for the file pass. Uh, and for this one, just as a notice, if you are in Windows, make sure to end it with the double slashes, because if you don't, um, changing this option won't work. I ran into that issue when I was testing this out. So our download directory is just that string that we've changed here. And then if I want to change it in our, um, in our web driver, what I can do is I can instantiate this Chrome options object. So I'm going to say web driver. Uh, dot Chrome options. That's going to be our options variable. Uh, and then one of the things you can do is you can add an experimental option. And this is a way of changing, changing preferences or changing certain setup, setup uh, items or options in Chrome. Uh, so what I'm going to do here, let's uh, get this, just delete this, make this a little bit easier to look at here. Okay, there we go. So the experimental option we're going to add is to prefs, so that's preferences. And then what I can do is have this dictionary. The option that I'm going to change is download.default directory. So that's that default download directory. And what I want it to be is that string that I just wrote. So it's going to be my my desktop um, my desktop folder. In order for this change to take effect, you do have to quit your driver and start it up again. You have to pass it as an option first thing. So we're going to start this up again. Our driver is webdriver.chrome. Service is the service object that we have. And then the other variable that we're going to pass now is the options variable, or the options parameter, right? And so we've got the options variable that we set up. That's that Chrome options object with the default directory changed. So now if I start that up, the window will pop up. Then we can do a driver.git. Let's do a Python download URL, just like before. So that'll take us, let's go back, click on something. That'll take us here right and then we can find that download element again so download element is driver dot find element searching by xpath and then we've got that button xpath string uh, and then you can click on that download element dot click and the download will start again and now if I show this in the folder uh, the file path is my desktop, right? So that's the changed file path. And the other way you can check that in Chrome is by going to your settings and then clicking on downloads. And that'll tell you what the default download location is. So that's essentially what we're doing with that option is we're running that change uh, there. Okay, all right. So we talked about, um, talked about downloading files using Selenium. Now let's talk about uploading files. Uh, so in order for an upload, let's first get our upload URL. So that's imager. And so we've got this here. Um, and what we're going to do is we need to choose the photo or the video. So let's uh, stop this, cancel that download exit out of that to maybe get some more space, maximize the window here, and then inspect. So inspect this element, dock it to the bottom, zoom in. Uh, okay, great. 
And now let's click on this Choose Photo or Video. So if I click on that, let's uh, click on that. Label for input, we've got an input here. So it's got an ID of file input, that's good. We can use that. Uh, you can do multiple ones. We're just essentially, all we have to do is send keys to that element. Uh, so let's, let's get the upload, we'll call it upload element. Uh, this is equal to driver.findElement. And then we're going to look by ID because it has that ID, and the ID is file input. Right, so I can just copy, paste that into the, um, as a string, into that driver.findElement. So now I've got the upload element. Let's just check that. It's got a uh, tag name, so it's an input. All right, so now we can just send keys, really, uh, in order to fill that out to upload a file. But what you'll find is that you get an error if you send a path that doesn't exist. So upload element dot send keys, uh, and I'm going to go find. Let's see, I've got I've got this intro slide, PNG file, uh, properties. So it's users be a big desktop, and then intro slide dot PNG. So I'm gonna the first thing I'm gonna do do this. Remember for double and double backslash for Windows. Let's do fake image.png. If I send uh, an image that doesn't exist, I'll get an error. So if I do that, it's going to say blah blah blah. Invalid argument file not found, right? Fake image that doesn't exist. So just to remember, if you are uploading a file, you have to make it a a real file that really exists, otherwise you'll you'll get an error. But now let's say uh, intro slide, this exists, so we send that, and the file gets uploaded, right? So uh, now we're uploading that image file to Imager. Here we go. Everything's good, and we've got everything that we need. Okay, so in this lecture, I realized it was a long one, but we talked about how to download items and how to upload items, and it's really just interacting with elements almost the same way we've seen before. The one, uh, the couple of differences are we talked about how to change your download directory using Chrome options, and then we talked about the error to be aware of, so that's passing a, uh, a string to a file that doesn't exist. So if you are uploading, uploading something, you need to make sure that file actually exists. Thanks everybody for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on dragging and dropping items in Selenium. Since what drag and drops really are, are essentially mouse actions, and they really involve a couple different actions, so you'll click, you'll hold, you'll move, and then you'll release, we'll need to go back to our action chains object again. We can use a pure drag and drop with a source and target element in order to drag and drop items in Selenium. What we can also do, however, is we can use a drag and drop with an offset. So we'll start at a source element on the web page and then drag and drop that source element with some sort of X and Y offset. What this looks like in code is that we have to instantiate another action chains object. So we can just make it actions is equal to action chains and then pass the driver as the main parameter. If we're doing a drag and drop with a source and a target element, we have to find those two elements on the page using whatever method is best for finding those elements. And then we can pass those elements as parameters in our action chain. So we can do actions dot drag and drop. Then we can pass a source element and a target element. And then we can end it with dot perform in order to perform that action. Drag and drop with an offset works much the same way except you don't have a target element, you just have the source element and then an X and Y offset. Let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook now to see how this works in practice. All right, so we're in our Jupyter Notebook. We've got our imports from Selenium. The one thing to note is that the other import that you're gonna need for this lecture 
is from Selenium WebDriver dot common dot action change. You need to remember to import the action chains class because we need that for the drag and drop action. The URL that we're going to use is the jQuery URL so you can import that or the jQuery UI URL rather. You can set it up and then we're going to be going to the j jQuery UI dot com slash droppable so that we can work on the drag and drop. Uh, so this is the drag and drop. You can play around it, play around with it in the page if you want to. Let's just find this right now. So it's a div in there. So it is a object with an ID. But if you look at it, um, as with many many things on the jQuery UI website, when you look at it, uh, it's inside this iframe with a class of demo frame. So first we have to go inside of that iframe in order to interact with the drag and drop object. So the iframe element, let's find that. It's driver.findElement. We're looking by CSS selector and it's going to be it's an iframe tag with a class of demo frame. So find that. We've got the iframe and then we can use driver.switch2 dot frame to switch into that iframe element. Okay, so now we're inside the iframe. Uh, if we want to do a drag and drop, we have to instantiate an action chains object. So action is equal to action chains, and our driver parameter is just going to be our web driver. So do that. Now, for the drag and drops, you can do this two ways, like we talked about. You can do it with a source and a target, which is what we're going to do first or you can do it with an offset. So source and target, we need to find the uh, find the, the source and the target. So the source is going to be this drag element, and the target is going to be the drop element. So if I click on that, uh, we want this div with an ID of draggable, and then the target is this div with an ID of droppable. So the source element is equal to element. We're looking by ID because we have those nice IDs to use. So the ID is draggable. That's the source element. And then the target element is driver.findElement. Again, we're searching by ID, and this ID is droppable. So like you see down here in the um, Elements tab of Chrome Tools, or Chrome Dev Tools, div with an ID of droppable. Uh, is where we want to drag and drop that that draggable element. So now we can set up the action to drag and drop things. So we can say action, we're going to drag and drop first. We've got a source element. So source is this source element. And then the target element. So the target is the target element. And then we can perform that action. Right Within the action change, you always want to end with perform so that the action gets performed. So let's run that. And that's what you see here, right? So now we've dragged that square from over here where it was over on top of this um, this drop target. So it says drop, right? The state of it changed, changed because we dragged the square onto the target. Now if we want to do it with an offset, so an X and Y offset what we can do is we can do the same thing, action dot drag and drop, but we're going to drag and drop by offset. We still need that source, so the source is going to be the source element, but then we have the offset of, so x offset is the parameter, but you can also just pass it uh, positionally if you'd like, and then the y offset, let's just make that zero. And then as always, you need to end with perform so that the action gets performed. So if I run that, you'll see the uh, square has moved a little bit, right? Not too much, but a little bit. Uh, and that's how you do the drag and drops. So in this lecture, we went through how you drag and drop elements using Selenium. And the way you have to do that is with action chains. And then within action chains, there's these two methods. So drag and drop, where you have source element and target element, or the drag and drop by offset where you have a source element and then some X and Y offset to move your source element around. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture.
Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on interacting with sliders. Sliders are an interesting form item or form element because they can really be interacted with in two ways in Selenium. The first is you can just click on them as an element. If you do that what will happen is that you'll move the part of the slider that's the indicator for where you are on the slider that will just go to the center of the element really. The other way is you can use action chains again. Within action chains you can use the following methods to interact with that slider. You can move to an element with an offset or you can drag and drop by an offset. In terms of what this looks like in the code, if you're just clicking on a slider element you can first find the element to select it. So here we're just doing slider element is driver.findElement and then find it whatever way works best and then you can just click on it with dot click. Again, this will click on the middle of that slider element. The other way is you can use action chains. So we instantiate that action chains object with the driver as our parameter, and then we can move to an element with an offset. So we specify that slider element, then we can specify the x and the y offset, then we can click on that offset from the slider element, and then finally dot perform to perform that entire chain of actions. This essentially moves you to the slider element of interest and then moves you some direction in the x and y direction in order to click on that slider. Additionally, you can use a drag and drop. So you could do action dot drag and drop by offset, specify the slider element, and then specify the x and y where you want to drag and drop that indicator on the slider. Finally you end with dot perform so that the action gets performed via the action chains object. Let's head over to our Jupyter notebook now to get some practice with this functionality. Alright so we're inside of our Jupyter notebook. Like we did in the last lecture you need to remember all the imports and then also remember the import so from selenium dot webdriver dot common dot action chains import the action chains class because we'll need that to interact with the, the slider here. From our settings file, the URL we're going to use is a jQuery UI URL again. Set up your service and your driver, and then the URL that you're going to get is the jQuery UI, J, jQuery UI URL plus slider. So we're going to an example jQuery slider on this page. Uh, as always with the jQuery website, we're going to interact with this slider, so if we click on it, it's got this slider class, and it's got a div with an ID of slider, so that's what we're interested in, but it's still inside this demo frame, iframe, so we need to move inside there first. So again, the iframe element, let's scroll this up a little bit, iframe element is element. we're looking by the CSS selector, and it's an iframe tag with a class of demo frame. So select that. And then we can switch into it. So driver dot switch to frame. And then we'll just use that iframe element. Great, now we're inside that iframe. So the slider element that we want, uh, we can click on it again just to take a look. So we're going to do driver dot find element. And it's got an ID. So let's click on this again so that we remind ourselves what the ID is. So div with an ID of slider. It's right there. So that's what we want. So searching by ID and then the ID is slider. All right, so we've got that slider element selected. So one option like we talked about in the lecture is to just click on a slider and that will drag the handle. So if I do slider element dot click, it basically just clicks in the middle there. So you can see the box was over here and now it's in the middle. That's basically what happens when you click on a slider object. It'll just move it to the center of the element. The other option that you have is to move with an X and Y offset or to uh, drag and drop it basically. So to do that we need to instantiate the action chains object. So we'll say action chain, action chains rather, the driver parameter is our driver, set that up, 
actions, action chains, no S. So there we go. So action is the action chains object. And then you can move, uh, you can do this move to element with offset is the one that we want. So the slider element is what we're going to start with. So that's basically where your mouse is starting. And then you have an X and a Y offset. So we'll go 40 in the X direction, 0 in the Y direction, and then we'll click. So we'll click that, and then we can perform. So that's going to combine all of these actions in the action chain. So first we move to the element with offset, so it's like we move to this slider, and then we move to the right, basically, positive, since it's a positive X value, and then we click. So that's like clicking the slider, right? That's kind of like doing this. So now I'm clicking around with the slider. That's basically what we're doing with this set of action chains actions. So move to element with offset, click, and then perform that. So if we click on that now, you'll see it's moved, that box has been moved over to the right because we gave it a positive, um, a positive X value. So we can try that again with, with a negative X value just so that you get an idea of how things move. So move to element with offset. So slider element, we're going to go there. Then let's go negative, I don't know, negative 100. So we'll go to the left here. Uh, and then 0 on the Y, dot click, and dot perform. So again, that's kind of moving down to this slider element, moving over to the left, and then clicking. That's the action that we want to do here. So now you can see it's moved over to, to the left. So that's the second option for how to interact with sliders. The last one is that you can do a drag and drop. So we can do action, drag and drop. Again, by offset is probably the best way to do this. So we start at the slider element. Let's go over to the right again. Let's make it, I don't know, 150. Zero on the Y, because we don't want to go up or down really, and then just perform that. So if I run that, then I'll move it over to the right again. So you see it was over here, now it's moved over to the right. If you have some sort of slider where you need a precise value, you're going to have to interact with that web page uh, to figure out how exactly to get that uh, exact value that you might need for changing a slider on whatever web page you're interacting with. But in general, these are the three ways that you can do a drag and drop with a slider, uh, or the three ways that you can interact with a slider. So you can click it, that'll just send it to the middle, you can do a move to element with offset, and then just remember the positive and negative x values. Or you can do the drag and drop with offset, which works much the same way. Okay, thanks everybody for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on keyboard actions in Selenium. As mentioned before in previous lectures, the Action Chains class enables us to automate certain basic user interactions in the browser. This can include running key combinations that may be used as shortcuts on certain websites. One example of this that you might be able to think of is the keyboard shortcuts that we can use in Gmail, for example, or Outlook, or any other type of email website or email application. If we want to use this type of key combination functionality in Selenium with special keys like Escape or Control or Alt, we'll have to import a new class, which is the Keys class. We need to use action chains to send keys to the browser as opposed to a specific element and to mimic those key combos, so Control P to print. We can't just use Send Keys and then try to send uh, the keys control and P to some sort of element on the page. That won't work. We have to use the action chains object. We can use the methods key down, key up, and release from the action chains class in order to mimic those key combinations. What this looks like in code. So first we have to import that new keys class that we talked about. So from selenium.webdriver.common.keys you can import the keys class. You instantiate the action chains object, like always, 
passing the driver as that main parameter. And if you wanted to emulate Control D, for example, which is usually bookmarking in most browsers, you could do action.keydown, send keys.control, so that's the way you send that special control key. Then you can also do dot send keys and pass the D, D key as a string. Then you can do release and then you can run perform. So that's the way of emulating that control D action that you might use to bookmark a page. Let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook now to see how this works in practice. All right, here we are in our Jupyter Notebook. We've got a few new imports or a few more imports than usual for this section. So we've got our web driver, our service. Make sure to, re to import action chains from selenium.webdriver.common.actionchains because we need that. And then the new import that we need that we talked about in the lecture is from selenium.webdriver.common.keys. We need to import that keys class because that's where we'll get the the special keys on our keyboard to use them. So things like control, tab, escape, all that good stuff. The URL we're going to be using for this lecture is the Selenium URL. So you can import that from the settings file, set up the service and the driver, and then get that Selenium URL. So if I go over to my Chrome, uh, my Chrome browser here, one of the things you might see on this Selenium page is that we've got this search box. And the search box actually has an image to show us the hotkeys for it, which is control K. So if I want to do a search here, I can just open that up. So I just typed in control K on my own, not from Selenium. Uh, so if I want to interact with that, um, we can do that with Selenium. So first things first, let's find this element. So I'll click on it, click on this search bar here. And really, what am I looking for? I think I'm looking for the span actually. Yeah, so we can just do the um, do the span, send it to this the span here. Uh, so we'll find that element. So the element, search element. Let's do search element. And actually, I think in this case, in some uh, because you can send it to the page, we just need an element on the page. Uh, but let's, so search element is driver dot find element. We're going to look by CSS selector. And what we're going to do here, what do we want? We want a span uh, with a class, uh, let's say doc search button container. Um, I think, yeah, doc search button container. OK, so we found that. Now, if you want to, you can't just do, you can't just send keys to the element using our send keys method that we've talked about before. So we want to do control K, so we can do keys.control. Let's try plus K. You might think to do that. That's just going to get an error, though. You can't interact with the element in that way, so it'll throw this error. So that's not the way that we want to do this kind of hotkeys stuff in Selenium. In order to do it, we have to use an action chain. So we'll say action is action chains. Uh, driver is equal to driver. Instantiate that. So one of the ways of testing that shirt, search uh, shortcut is we can do action, key down. We want to hold down the control key. So keys.control. Then we want to send keys. We want K. So again, remember, control plus K is what's the is the search shortcut for the Selenium website. Then we want to release both of those keys on our keyboard, and we want the action to be performed in Selenium. So we have to end it with dot perform. So this combines a lot of different things, but it's pretty straightforward, and it's what you do when you interact with the browser, right? You hold down your control key, you hit the K key, and then you let go of all the keys, right? So that's what's going on. We can run that. And now you can see in our browser, we've opened up the, the search box here. So we've successfully used a keyboard shortcut in Selenium just by using those 
those action chains. Now here we've got an input element, so again we can interact with it if we'd want to. Uh, its ID is doc search input, so let's use that. So uh, what am I looking for? Input element is equal to uh, driver driver dot find element. We're going to search by ID and it's doc search input. So now we can search with this, and the reason we'll search for this, or search with this, is that this also has some hotkeys that we can practice. So we can send up and down, we can send escape to close, uh, but right now there's nothing in there, so I want to get some, get some search results in there. Uh, so we've got the input element, and now for this one we can send keys directly to it, because it's just a normal text box, right? So let's look for some information on WebDriver. Weird. Okay, so let's try that again. I don't know why it sent that. Um, sent that element first, but okay. So now we sent send keys WebDriver. So that's in the search box. And then we could scroll through the scroll through the results if we wanted to. And we can just do that with action chain. So we've got our action object. Let's send some keys. And again, we're going to use the keys class because these are special ones. So let's do arrow down. Remember to close it with a perform so that the action gets performed. And now we can go down the page, right? If we're looking through these looking through these results. So keys dot maybe arrow down again, dot perform, goes down again, and you can go up if you want to. So keys dot arrow up, dot perform, and you'll go up in the search. And then if I wanted to get out of the search, you could send the escape key. So we'll send keys via the action chains. Uh, the keys we're sending is keys.escape, and then perform that. And that'll take us back out of the page. Now we're back into this normal Selenium web page. Um, okay, so the other option, instead of using release, just to be aware of, so it's a little usually easier to just use uh, release. So down here, when you had the key down, to just do release so that you release all the keys. The other action that you can use just so that you're aware of it is um, key up. So you can release whatever key it has that you that's pressed down. Uh, so we can do we can also do key down. Uh, this is keys dot control here. We'll do that search uh, shortcut again. Then we're going to send keys with a K. And then we can do key up if you want to instead of release, and just specify that keys dot control key again. So if you perform that, you'll get the search box that pops up again as well here in the in the browser. So those are two options, uh, key up, key down, or key, or sorry, key down, key up, or key down, release. Both of those will work all right. Okay, so in this lecture we talked about how you can use action chains and send keys in action chains uh, to work with hotkeys or shortcuts on web pages if you need to test that out. Thanks for joining and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our overview of our second guided project for this Selenium course in which we'll be building a form filler. The goal of our second project will be to fill out and submit the booking request form at www.thegoldbugs.com. This is our test website that's basically a fake band website. The booking form has text fields, it has radio buttons, it has check boxes, and it has drop downs. So it has a whole bunch of stuff that we've practiced in the previous section with Selenium. The booking form looks like this. So like you can see, pretty standard. And we'll go into more depth into it when we open it up in the guided code along section.
In this project, what we're going to use is we're going to use what we've learned about identifying elements in the HTML source code or the DOM to select the form fields of interest to us. We're also going to use what we've learned about filling in forms to interact with the various elements. So clicking on things, selecting items from a drop-down menu, checking check boxes or radio buttons, so on and so forth. Finally, we'll submit the form because that's of course the purpose, usually, of filling out any given form, is that you want to submit it and then move on to some other action. Everything we do in this project applies to other forms that you might see in real life or on other websites. So booking forms for hotels or airline tickets, surveys, searches, uh, checkout pages where you're filling in, credit card information or something like that. So all of that can be applied to other websites. Now that we've talked about what this guided project is, let's dive into the code. All right, so you should have your Jupyter Notebook open to start off with. And then obviously the first thing we want to start with in this project is we need to import everything that we need. So from Selenium, let's import the web driver. It's our basic, basic object that we need or module that we need. Uh, then from selenium.webdriver.chrome.service, we need our service class. So we import service. From selenium.webdriver.common.by, we'll import by so that we can find elements on the page. And then finally, we're going to be interacting with a drop-down element. So we want that select class as well. So from selenium.webdriver.support.ui, we'll import select. OK, so that's everything we need from Selenium. From our settings file, let's import the Chrome driver path as always, and then we're going to be doing the form on the Goldbugs website. So we need the Goldbugs URL as well. So run that cell, and then we're, we've got all of our imports there. As always, we need to set up the service. So the service is service executable path is that Chrome driver path. Driver is equal to web driver dot Chrome service is equal to service. Run that. Let's have a driver start up there. And then let's we can do driver dot maximize window. Um, although actually let's tab this over to the side so that's easier to work with and have the code side by side. And then we can get the website that we're going to take a look at, so Goldbugs URL. So let's do that. It opens it up over here. And let's open up our Chrome dev tools as well while we're waiting for it to load. Uh, OK, so here we go. And then let's zoom in so that this code is easier to see. Okay, great. So we've got our Chrome window open. We've got the Goldbugs website up. And as mentioned, we're going to fill out this booking form. So if you scroll down, you'll see the booking form down here. Uh, right? Do you want to book the Goldbugs for your own show, private or public, so on and so forth. And we've got all of these fields. So we've got some text fields, got a message, check boxes, radio buttons, uh, drop down, drop down menu here and then some radio buttons, and then a submit button as well. So let's first narrow our search. If we, uh, let's click on this. So click on this, uh, let's find this div here. And I think this is in a form. Let me just take a look at this real quick. Inside the div, there should be a form element. That's what we want to look for. So div, form wrapper, form inner wrapper. And then we've got this form. OK, great. So we've got that here. Uh, so that's the first element that we're going to drill down into 
so that we're not uh, messing with other things on the, on the page. And there's only one form on the page, so we don't have to worry about selecting other things. So let's say the form element is going to be driver.findElement. We're going to search by tag name, and the tag is form. So that'll just get the first uh, form element on the page. Like I said, there's only one, so that's the one that we want to be working with. And it's just so that we don't have to worry about maybe some other um, messing around with other things on the page. So now we've got this first name element. So let's click on that. This is an input class field element, and it's got a name of F name. Uh, so that's how we're going to search for it. So F name element is equal to driver dot find element by we're going to search by name. It's called F name. So again, that's in the that's the attribute, the name attribute that it has. So let's fill this out. So we're going to send keys to that. So f name element dot send keys. Just make this John. Okay, so now as you can see, we've filled out the name and the first name. Let's keep going. Fill out the last name. So that's uh, let's see. This has a name of L name, last name. Another good way to find that. So we'll search by name again. Driver dot find element by name, L name, and then let's send some keys to fill out the last name. So send keys, Doe. And again, you see last name's been filled out. And we'll just keep going one by one through all of these form elements. I'll click on email, input, ID, it's kind of got a lengthy ID, but it's got a good name, so name, email. That's good. We'll do it by name again. Email element, element by name, email. And then we'll send keys to fill out the, fill out the uh, email field. So john.doe at mail.com. Subject, input, uh, and this one does not seem to have a good name, so it doesn't have a name, but it does have an ID. So we can search for this by ID. Uh, so subject element is equal to driver dot find element by, we're going to search by ID, not by name. And then we can just paste the paste the ID in there. So again, you can just click on this in your Chrome DevTools, copy it, paste it into your Jupyter Notebook cell. Send a subject to the subject element. So send keys again. Our subject is, what are we going to call this? Love your band, exclamation point. Great. Uh, and now the message, if I click on this, this is not going to be an input. This is actually a text area. Class, field, element, ID, text area. And we'll just search by tag name just to change things up because there's only one text area uh, element on this page and inside of our form as well. Uh, so let's see. Message, element, and actually I just realized I've been using the driver to find these things but you can search inside the form element as well um, like I mentioned before you can find elements on web elements so we'll search by tag name inside the form and again that's to make sure we're not searching for text areas outside the um, outside the form so we've got that text area message element. Let's send some keys to it. So we'll say, you're the greatest, double quotes, because we've got a single quote here with your, you're the greatest, I love your band, exclamation point. Send that keys, shows up in the message. 
Okay, so we've done this first part of the form here, filled out all the text boxes and the text area here, which is a new element, but like you can see, it basically works like any other input element or, te or text box element. So that's all fine. Now the next thing we want to do is click on these check boxes. Uh, so what we're going to do, uh, let's say we don't want a response, we're just saying that we we really love their band. Uh, this does not have an ID, but it does have a name. So let's search for this element, this checkbox element, by its name. Uh, so the response element, or you could say response checkbox, is we're going to search inside the form element, then let's find the element by name. And the name is what we copied from the Chrome DevTools, right? So it's the check checkbox with the uh, the long string of characters after it. And then we want to click that. So response element dot click. All right. So now we can say response element dot is is selected. Is that true? That's true, right? And we can see that here. It's checked. So our checkbox is good to go. Now let's move on to the radio button. Let's click on this. And we want to do, we want the band to attend a public show. Um, so it's input type radio, and it's got this long name as well. Uh, so we can, we can do that. Uh, so name, so we're gonna say, what is this? Radio element. It's going to be equal to the form element dot find element by name. We're going to search by name again and just copy paste the the name that we pulled from the DOM there. So that's good to go. Shift enter to run that. Got the radio element. Um, and then let's click it so that we activate it. Dot click run that. Um, let's see. Okay, so I took a look at this a little bit closer and I forgot about this. Both of these radio buttons actually have the same name. So if you look at this, the private show, the name is radio 56C, uh, 0, F9, so on and so forth. And then if you look at the other option, it's got the same name as well, radio 56C, 0, F9. So, in fact, name is not a good one to use to select that, that public show radio button. What I think we'll do instead is let's get the, let's copy the X path and we'll use that instead to find this, um, to find this input element or find that radio button element. So let's say button X path SQL. We can copy that. Um, copy that X path. Uh, and actually, I don't like this X path. I think the ID on this changes when you click on it on the page. So that's that ID isn't actually very, um, very stable. So what we'll do instead, let's just say uh, at input is equal to, or no, at, at um, value, I want this to be at value is equal to public show. That should be good enough. So we just want to find the input item where the value is public show. That's what we want to click on. So then we can say, let's see, radio element is equal to the form element dot find element. We're going to search by X path. Uh, and then we can search by that button X path. So should, we should be able to find that. We got that ran successfully. Let's click on that uh, public show. Okay, great. So we changed it up now. We're not clicking on private show. We're clicking on public show. Great. Keep going down the form. The next item that we have is this uh, drop down menu. So if you rem remember from our lectures, we can use a select element on this. So let's get the select element. So select element is form element dot find element 
We're going to search by, what are we going to search by? I think for this one, we can search by, yeah, we've got an ID. So let's search by ID. Copy and paste that string. And then we can make that a select object. So select is equal to select with a capital S, select element. Great. So now if we look at the options, right, we've got all the, um, or how do you do this again? Uh, yeah, we have to do the text. So let's do uh, option.text for option in select.options. So we do that, Google, Facebook, Instagram, and other are the options that we can select there. Uh, and so let's do select dot select by value. So we'll do val by the value here. Uh, and we'll do other, select other there. Like you can see, how did you hear about us? Other, that's filled out, we're good to go. The last thing we have to do is select the survey radio button. Will you tell your friends about our band? Strongly agree. Input type radio. Value of two. So for this, let's see, survey radio element is going to be the form element. Form element dot find element. We're going to search by, let's just, after doing the last, uh, looking at the, what was it, the last radio button, I just want to make sure that these inputs actually have different names. So BC3, and it looks like they have the same names. So what we're going to do is do it on value. Uh, and so strongly I disagree, what is that? Value negative t two. Okay, right. So this is negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. I want to do strongly, uh, strongly agree. So we're going to do this by an x path again. Uh, and the x path is going to be what is this? This is an input element, and it's got a value. So at value is equal to uh, two. So two is going to be strongly agree. that runs successfully. So we've got that survey radio element and then we can click it, all right? That's all we have to do with the button. Um, okay, and like you can see, strongly agree is selected. Now all that's left to do is submit the form. So you can find this button, it's not hard to do, right? You can use your Chrome elements, input, class button, value submit, type submit. You could search for things that way, but Selenium actually gives us a nice method if you have a form element selected. So the tag name on this form element, it's a form, right? That's the HTML tag. But we can actually just do a submit method on it. And then that will submit the form for us. That will run the submit action on the form. And now you can see, you should have seen on the page, it said submitting. We scroll up. Do you want to book the gold bugs, blah, blah, blah. Thank you, the form has been submitted, right? So let's talk about everything that we did here. We really did a lot of stuff. There were a number of text fields that we had to find and fill out, and that was basically just sending keys to them and filling out a text area, which is a new tag that I don't think we have talked about or worked with before, but pretty straightforward. Again, just sending keys to it. Then we kept on going through the checkboxes, the radio buttons, we used X paths, we used names, we used IDs, we used the select element as well, or the select object, so that we could just select things by their value, by their index, by their, uh, the other one, visible text, I think is the other one. Uh, and then we learned about this new submit method on form elements in Selenium. That's really useful when you don't want to find a button and you just want to submit a form very easily. So that's the end of our guided project. Uh, I hope you appreciate that there's that we really went through a lot of stuff here and that you've learned a lot about Selenium in the past few sections. So congratulations on finishing this project. 
and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our section on weights in selenium. We're going to start by talking about implicit weights. Most modern web pages will have elements on them that can load at different times. If you think about running a search for example, you may have the search bar with your search text in it, but you may be waiting on search results to show up on the page. This can cause problems for us in Selenium if we try to find elements that don't yet exist on the page, but they might in a second or two. Selenium gives us a way to address this problem with what are called weights. Weights can be either explicit or implicit. We'll talk about explicit weights in the next lecture, but for now we'll focus on the implicit weights. Implicit weights are basically a session setting during the life of your web driver object or your Selenium session. What an implicit weight does is it tells Selenium to continually check the DOM for some set amount of time for any element that's not found immediately. So when you use driver.findElement, for example, if the element's not there, Selenium will basically pull the DOM or the web page for some amount of time until either the element is found or the request times out based on the implicit weight that you set. Generally speaking, it's a lot better to use explicit weights than implicit weights or using the time.sleep, which is something of what you might call a beginner method to wait for things to show up on the web page. With an explicit weight compared to an implicit weight, you'll only be waiting as long as you have to and your program will run faster than if you use time.sleep, for example. Additionally, implicit weights in your program don't provide information, don't provide the reader any information on why or when we're waiting for object, objects to show up on the web page. Let's say, for example, that we're filling out a form to check out and we're inputting our information and we have to wait until the submit button is clickable once we filled out the information. With an implicit wait, we're only waiting for that to happen, but we don't know that's what we're waiting to happen. With an explicit wait, we can specify that we're waiting for that button to be clickable. You can set the implicit wait in Selenium using the implicitly wait method and then passing a seconds parameter. In, this in the code, what this looks like is you have all your imports and setup, and then uh, when you instantiate your driver after you do that, you can just call driver.implicitlyWait and specify some number of seconds, such as 10 seconds. Let's head over to our Jupyter Notebooks to see how this works in practice. All right, so here we are in our Jupyter Notebook. We've got all of our imports, so web driver, service, and buy, and we're gonna be taking a look at the books to scrape URL, so you can import that from the settings file. Set up the service, set up the driver, get the web page. And now that your driver is active, we can set the implicit weight by just calling driver.implicitly wait and then passing some amount of time. So here we'll say 10 seconds. And now this setting has been set for the entire setting or for the entire session rather. So anytime that we try to find something on the page, if it takes a while to load, uh, then we can then we can, uh, it, Selenium will wait for that set amount of seconds, so 10 seconds here, until the item, the element either loads or, or fails to load, and then we'll get, we'll get an error. Um, so let's say, let's find an image, you know, let's just image element, since this is the Books to Scrape website and has these images down here. So we'll set, just say element. Let's look by tag name. Uh, we'll just get an image tag. So that just gives us one element, right? Now, if this page were slow loading or something like that, as I mentioned, the implicitly wait by setting that, uh, Selenium, our web session, would wait until the the item loaded or failed to load and then would throw an, throw an error. So there's much, not much more to implicit waits than that. Uh, it's something that if you are going to set it, you want to set it at the beginning of your session so that it applies to everything you're looking for. 
but as we'll see in the next lecture, it's generally better to use explicit weights instead of implicit weights in selenium, just because you can be more specific about what you're waiting for. So thanks for joining this lecture, and we'll see you in the next one where we talk about explicit weights in selenium. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on explicit weights in selenium. As mentioned in our previous lecture, generally speaking, explicit weights are much more useful and better to use than implicit weights, where you're specifying some um, general time threshold for waiting for objects to load on a page. Instead, explicit weights specify certain conditions that need to be met before proceeding in your code. For example, if you're trying to fill in a form, it might be smart to wait for the form to load on the page before you start filling it in. Setting an explicit weight in Selenium generally involves two different objects, a web driver weight object and then an expected condition. Selenium provides a number of methods for these expected conditions on the page. You might want to use title is if you're waiting for the page title to be a specific string. You could be using visibility of element located, waiting for a certain element to be visible on the page. Or you could be using something like element to be clickable. So let's say you're filling out a form and you have to fill in the required fields or click a checkbox with the privacy policy and terms and conditions before you can submit the form. In that case, you might use an element to be clickable expected condition. There are a lot more, and we'll see some of them as we go through this section. But as always, refer to the Selenium documentation for Python if you want a full list of all expected conditions that you can use for explicit weights. Explicit weights in general are a characteristic of better and more maintainable Selenium code because they are much more robust against network conditions, for example, so slow loading web pages, than the typical alternative or what you might call the novice or beginner alternative, which is to use time.sleep before you try to find a certain ele element. You may also want to put your explicit weights inside of try catch and finally blocks or try catch blocks in case you want to spit out certain exceptions if something breaks down on your page. Let's say you can't find an element and you'd like to alert the user that the element couldn't be found because maybe that means the web page has changed and you need to change your code. In terms of some new imports that we need to use this functionality, we'll have to import the webdriver wait class from selenium.webdriver.support.ui and then from the support module we can import the expected conditions module as EC. That's typically how you see it shortened in, in Python code. To explicitly wait for an element, there's a few things going on here. And we'll compare this to our code without the wait. So if you see below here, the way we used to do it is to just have driver.findElement, maybe by ID, and then pass the string ID. But if you're waiting for the element to load in your Python code, this line of code might break. To do this with an explicit weight, what you can do is say web driver weight, pass the driver as your first parameter, and then some time in seconds as your second parameter. And that'll be how long you wait for the element to load or be clickable or be visible. After that, you can write dot until, and this is where you pass your expected condition. So with EC, which is the expected condition, dot element to be clickable, so we're waiting for an element to be clickable, and then you pass the tuple of the identifier. So maybe you're searching by ID or by name. Here we're searching by ID, and that'll be the element that the web driver waits for to show up. Let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook to see how this works in practice. All right, so for this lecture, we're gonna do things a little bit differently because it's easier to show how explicit weight weights work and are beneficial to us if we just use it with a plain vanilla Python script. 
if you run it in your Jupyter Notebook, uh, the Jupyter Notebook kind of interferes with the way the explicit weights work. Uh, you don't see the benefit as much. So what we're going to do is we're going to write just a plain Python file and then run that and see some of the errors that we get and how we can fix that. So in terms of setting things up, just have all your main imports. So from Selenium, import web driver, import the service, import the uh, by class. Then from our settings file, we can import the Chrome driver path. And we're going to take a look at the Selenium docs search URL. Uh, and so if you go to that declaration in our settings file, you'll see the URL there. And we can actually take a look at this. So I have um, I have this up in Chrome right now. And it's basically just this page. It's the Selenium Python docs. So we can type something into here and search for it. So the first thing I'm going to do is let's get this input. Uh, so the input, the name is Q. So we can type that out in our um, in our Python script. We're going to kind of do this a little bit in parallel right now. So the input element, we can say that's element, And we're going to look by name. And then have this be Q. So if I go back to Selenium in Chrome, you'll see here in the HTML, the input type is text, name is Q. Uh, so that's the one that we're looking for right now. Uh, and then what we're going to do with this is we're going to search for something. So let's search for explicit weight, because that's what we're taking a look at in this lecture. When I hit search, it searches for something, right? It searches for what we typed in the search box. And if you notice, it took a while to load on this page, right? It took a second or two to load. And then we've got this list here with references to weight or explicit weight in, uh, in the documentation. But the search results came up and the rest of the page stayed the same. So if you look at this div down here, and let's maybe go in one more, not up here. Down here in the docs or in the um, in the DOM, uh, you've got this div ID search results. So if I go back, you see there's nothing there. We still have this div, the ID of search results, but there's nothing in it until we hit search, and then something loads into that div with the ID of search results, and it's all this stuff here, the explicit weights. So this is a good example page of where we might want to use an explicit weight if we're waiting for the search results to come up. So what we're going to look for, let's just look for this first link, link here. Uh, and we can, let's do a right click and let's copy the XPath. And that'll be our XPath string that we use in our, in our script here. So what we want to do is let's do input element dot, uh, we're going to send keys. And what we're going to send is what we just looked for. So explicit, explicit uh, weight is what we're looking for. And then this is a form element. So like we learned in our second guided project, we can just submit this, use the submit method on this. Now what we're looking for in that result, so the result element is we need to look on the page of element, and we're going to search by the XPath that we copied and then let's call this link XPath and that's going to be the link to this five weights. So when you look for explicit weight on this page you expect the first link to be five period weights. Uh, so the link XPath is uh, what is this? We can just copy paste. So control V. And again, all I did was I got that from the Chrome dev tool. So you right click here, copy, copy XPath. So that's the result element that we're looking for. We're looking by XPath and we're going to do link XPath is the string we're looking for. And now what we can do, let's just print result element dot text. Uh, so that's what we've got up there. 
So in an ideal world, what would happen is we would run the script and then we'd output the, the text. But because of the way that web page loading works, right, this result element, what will happen, what should happen when we run this script is it will fail because it won't find this result element that, uh, you know, five weights that we're looking for and won't print the text. So let's run this and see what that error looks like. So run the Python file. It'll open things up. Then I'll submit that searching search results. And now let's go down here. Uh, you might see just for Windows users, you might see some of this uh, this USB device handle win error, failed to read descriptor from node connection. I did look into that because I ran into that error after coding on Windows uh, when I was coding on Linux before. And from what I can read online, it's not a serious error. You can just ignore it. But if I scroll up here, what I'm going to see is this error message. So no such element exception, no such element, unable to locate element, method, xpath, selector, and that's that string selector that we passed in there. So what this, this is showing you is that our script as it stands right now is running into an error trying to find that element because it hasn't loaded on the page yet. So that's why we need explicit weights. So what we're going to do now is we're going we're gonna to rewrite this script so that it uses explicit weights. Uh, so in order to do that, we need a few more imports, like we talked about in the lecture. So from Selenium dot webdriver dot support, we're going to import expected conditions. We'll import that as EC. What else do we need? From Selenium dot uh, dot what? Webdriver dot support dot UI import. We're going to import the web driver weight. Then what else? From and then we're going to import an exception too, because we're going to write this in a in a try try accept block. So from selenium dot common dot exceptions, let's import the element not visible exception. So there's a whole bunch of these. We won't go into it. If you're interested in knowing all about the Selenium exceptions, you can uh, read the documentation. We're just going to take a look at this one for now. So now we've got this input element that we're going to find in the page, and then we're going to submit this form. Uh, and then we're, we've got this result element here. But like we saw, the result element doesn't work when we try to find it because it's not on the page yet. So what we're going to do Let's have a try catch block here. Scroll this up a little bit, make it easier to see. Uh, so the result element, in this case, what we're going to do, we're going to have that web driver wait, pass the driver, and then the time we're waiting for, let's wait for 10 seconds until, and then this is where we put in that expected condition. So I'm going to say presence of to presence of element located. So that means it's found it on the page. We're looking by XPath and we're passing that link XPath string again. So if I go back to my, is this the one? That's the automated one. If I go back here, uh, this is the, this, this is what we're looking for here. So five weights. So let's go back to VS Code or whatever editor you're working in. Uh, and so that's how we do our explicit weight. And then we'll do what we tried to do before. So print that element, result element dot text, which should be five period weights. So then what we can do, so we got try, so accept, uh, let's see, element not visible exception. And then we'll just say print element not visible, right? So we can handle that error if it crops up. And then finally, after all of this, uh, I forgot, I wanted to, just to keep things open and have the script run a little bit slower, I'm gonna use time 
what am I importing? From, let's import time. That's what I want. Again, you don't use this, uh, you know, in the real world, but it's just so that the script maybe runs a little bit slower so that we can see what's going on. Um, so let's put time.sleep, three seconds there. Time.sleep, three seconds there. Time.sleep, three seconds there before it submits. Uh, and then I won't use it when we're we're doing the explicit wait because that's the point of the explicit wait is that um, is that that's what's waiting for the element to load. We don't have to call time dot sleep. Uh, but then at the end, just to keep the page open for a little bit, uh, let's keep it open for three seconds, and then we'll quit the driver. Right? Since this is a script, not a notebook, we'll quit the driver so that we don't end up with it hanging. Uh, so like here, if I go down here. Because the script failed, the driver didn't quit. So close out of that. Uh, so this is the way it works. So now we've got a nice try accept block here. Try accept finally. Uh, so let's run this and see what happens. So it opens up the Chrome window. It's the documentation. It's going to wait. Then it sends the text, right? Next it submits. And then it closes. And if you see here, we don't have that that error, right? Presence of element. Okay. There was one error, I forgot you have to pass this as a as a tuple. This is so let's add that. Add that as a tuple here and run this code. So it opens up Chrome. Here we go again. Sorry about that. Opens up Chrome to this page. Then it'll send the text. Right? Then it'll submit the search. It waits until the results pop up. And then it'll print the text. So here that's what we've got. Five weights, right? That's what we were looking for. If you go up here, as I mentioned before, there's no, we don't get that element not located error. You still have these two windows errors, but again, you can ignore that. So now our code has worked perfectly well, right? It's handled that. If I exit out of this and go back to our script here, by using the explicit wait uh, inside of a try accept pass, so if there is an exception, we'll catch that exception. By using the explicit wait, we're able to capture that result element even though we're waiting it for it to load on the page. So this should help you see why explicit weights are really powerful uh, compared to implicit weights, because now we know exactly where we're waiting for something to load. It's not on this original page or while we're sending keys or submitting the form. We're waiting for the results to show up before we're checking it. Uh, and so this is a pretty, uh, a pretty good manner of handling that in, in Selenium. Um, so again, in this lecture, what we took a look at is how you use explicit weights. So for that, you have to remember to import your expected conditions, import your web driver weight. If you want to catch exceptions, maybe import some exceptions from that module in Selenium. And then you can use this, this pattern of web driver weight, driver and time until that expected condition is satisfied and then pass a tuple with those locators. So the by method, and the string of interest. Uh, and that should help you help you avoid running into these timing issues where things are loading on a page. Thanks everybody for joining this lecture where we talked about the explicit weights in Selenium and we'll see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on adjusting network settings Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on adjusting network settings in Selenium. Sometimes while you're working in Selenium, you may want to emulate slower network speeds in order to better understand the user experience of your site or maybe the user experience of some site that you're working with with Selenium.
Chrome Tab Tools does provide some tooling for this. So there's a network throttling setting in the network tab. You can use this, for example, to emulate a slow 3G connection on a website. However, we can't access this setting in Selenium from our Python code, so it's not always a good thing to use if you want to emulate different network conditions. The way you can automate it in Selenium is with the set network conditions method on your WebDriver object. Set network conditions has several parameters that we can fill in. The first is a Boolean for offline, so you can set the network basically to be up or to be down. I don't know why exactly you might turn it offline, but that's just to be aware of that that is one of the parameters. You can set the network latency in milliseconds, set the download and upload throughput in bits per second as well. By adding this latency or lowering and changing download and upload throughputs, for example, you can emulate different types of networks, and especially slow networks, if you want to know what the experience is like for users on those types of networks. To use this type of functionality, you can have all your imports and surface and driver set up as usual. And then you call this method the set network conditions method on your web driver object. So you can say driver.setNetworkConditions and then fill out the parameters. So here we're keeping the network online, so offline is equal to false, setting some latency in milliseconds, and then setting the download and upload throughputs as well. And remember, this is in bits per second, so you're going to have to do some multiplication just to make things realistic, because otherwise you might end up very, very slow, much slower than you otherwise would want to be. Let's head over to our Jupyter Network our, our Jupyter Notebook now to see how this works. All right, so here we are in our Jupyter Notebook. We've got our normal imports of WebDriver and Service. We don't have buy because we're not going to be looking for anything on the page today. And then the two URLs that I imported are just the Selenium URL, which you can see in our Chrome window there, and the Python URL as well, because we'll be switching between these two sites. Set up the service, set up the driver, and then get that Selenium URL. So to change the uh, network speed, you can just do this on the driver. So all you have to do is use driver.setNetworkConditions. That's the method that you want to use. And then there are a number of different options. So one of them is offline, or parameters rather. Offline, we can set this to true. So this is going to set our network to offline, right? Latency, this is in milliseconds. So that's additional latency beyond whatever your normal network conditions are. And then you can put download throughput, download throughput, and upload throughput. And this is in bits per second. So if I wanted to do, let's say, 500 megabits per second, you'd have to do 500 times 1024. And we can do that for download uh, as well. Uh, so we run that. Now we've changed the network conditions. So if I try to get a get the Python URL, go to a different URL, I'm going to get this error that says there's no internet, right? And this will throw an error in here as well. So message, blah, 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 error, internet disconnected. So that's because we set offline to true, so our network is offline now. So in order to fix that, we're going to have to turn it, turn it back on. So we can do driver dot set network conditions. And then let's just do all this again. So offline is equal to false. So it's back online. Latency, we can add maybe, let's add 5,000 milliseconds. So five seconds of latency. Download throughput. We're going to put this, let's cut this in half. So 250 times 1024, uh, and then upload throughput. We'll just say, just keep it the same since we're not uploading, we're not uploading anything. Uh, so set that as the network conditions, and then let's try driver.get Python URL. And what you'll see is that it takes a lot longer for this page to load. So if you've got a normal kind of stable internet connection, it should load pretty fast. 
and we'll try it again with another website when we reset the network conditions. But you should see that it took a really long time, and that's because of that latency uh, that we changed and the, the download throughput that we changed. You can also get current network conditions if you want to see what they are or what they're set to in Selenium just using get network conditions. And then that'll output a dictionary uh, with the speeds or with the with the value of the values of those those parameters. Um, so now if we change the conditions again, so driver dot set network conditions, we can do offline is still false. And latency, remove the latency, and then bump up the download and upload throughput. So we'll make this, what is this, 500 times um, 10 is 1024. Uh, and just do the same thing for the upload throughput too. So you know, reasonable, pretty reasonable web speeds. And now if we just get the, um, we go back to that Selenium website, you'll see it loads a lot faster than, than the Python one that we went to, and that's because we turned off the latency. So okay, in this lecture we went through how you can change and change your network conditions if you want to test web pages under slower or faster conditions change things up, and how you can see what your network conditions are. So the two methods of interest to us are the get network conditions and then the set network conditions. Thanks everybody for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on setting up mobile views in Selenium. We can automate the emulation of certain mobile devices using our standard Selenium web driver. If we want to do this in Chrome, all we have to do is add a mobile emulation option to our Chrome options object and then specify a type of device. So maybe it's an iPhone 12 or an iPhone 14, Samsung Galaxy, whatever the options are for your particular version of Chrome or your particular web browser if you're using Firefox or Opera or one of the other ones. Just a note on this section since it will be a short section. Automation of mobile testing is not always straightforward in Selenium, so you may need to use a mobile specific package to achieve what you're trying to achieve. For example, I know there is a Python package called Appium that's basically Selenium but specific for mobile testing of apps and things of that nature. What we're going to find is that Selenium may not be the best choice for mobile testing, but we do want to show you some options that you have if you need to do something basic on a website. To set up your Selenium session to emulate a mobile device, what you can do is import and start your driver and service as usual, and then you'll have that Chrome options object that you instantiate and you're going to use the method which is add experimental option and the parameters here are going to be mobile emulation so that's the option that you want to activate and then you'll pass a dictionary the key in the dictionary will be device name and then you can pass a string specifying whatever di device you want to emulate on your particular version of, of Chrome. Let's head over to our Jupyter Notebooks to see how this works in practice. All right, we're starting off in just a normal Chrome window with our dev tools open for now because I want to show you what we're actually going to be doing with these Chrome options that we're going to use with the mobile emulation. Basically what we're doing, if you look at this Chrome toolbar, you've got the normal elements page that we're used to seeing. We've got the uh, select an element in the page to inspect it. Right, so we can do that, click on it, and it'll show it in the DOM. The other option we have is the device toolbar, however. So what this will give us is various ways of, and let me exit out of this for now. Or actually, let's go back. Um, so 
the dimensions that you have here, you'll have a whole bunch of device options that you can emulate. So we can do an iPad Air, and that'll give you the dimensions of the iPad Air, iPhone SE, dimensions of the iPhone SE, uh, let's see, Samsung Galaxy, right? That's got the dimensions there. So your web page might be laid out a little bit differently um, than it usually is. Um, but that's how you get that that mobile view just using the Chrome Dev Tools. So that's basically what we're going to be using in um, in Selenium. All we're going to do is is pop it open using that that automated selenium, those automated selenium options. So here we've got our Jupyter Notebook open. We've got a selenium web driver service imported from our settings. We're going to import the Chrome driver path and then we're just going to go to the selenium URL to see how that looks on various devices. So we can import that, start the service, and then actually the first thing I want to do here is I'll make another cell is you want to pass a dictionary with these options. So we're going to do mobile em emulation and the device name that I want to use is uh, I think let's see we can use one of these I think iPhone yeah iPhone 12 Pro is an option so we'll just do that. Um, let's, uh, so iPhone 12 Pro is going to be our option there. Uh, so do that. And then we can do the Chrome options. So pass that to our Chrome options object. We need webdriver dot Chrome options. Instantiate that. And then we can say Chrome options uh, dot add experimental option. The option is mobile emulation. And the parameters for that come from our dictionary. So we've got that. That all works great. So now what you need to add is that options parameter like we've seen before with some of the other Chrome options that we've that we've used. Get rid of that space start it up and it pops open this Chrome browser and then if we get the let's get the URL selenium URL pop this over you'll see what we've got here is basically a mobile view of it right so this kind of looks like an iPhone so you're still running Selenium as normal in this in this browser window, but the window size has now um, made the website smaller so that it's basically the, the mobile view and specifically the iPhone 12 Pro view of that of that web page. And so then of course you can let's quit this. Um, you can do a different uh, mobile emulation option, right? So you can do uh, mobile, let's see, mobile emulation. Do this again. So the device name is going to be, you make it an iPad mini, for example. Like I mentioned, it, it depends on your version of Chrome, so you have to check that out to see what options you have. Um, so Chrome options is equal to webdriver.chrome options. And then Chrome options dot add experimental option and we're going to do that mobile emulation with the mobile emulation dictionary there and then we can pass that start up the um, start up the web driver again with those new options and then you'll see a new um, a new window with a new window size. So Chrome options. Okay. Run that. It'll open up Chrome and then we can do driver.git selenium URL. And now this is like a this is like an iPad mini. So you can see it's not the normal Selenium website. You've got this mobile view 
drop down menu there, and all this other stuff. So that's just a basic overview in this lecture of how you start off with mobile emulation if you need to do that. The gist of it is you just have to add this experimental option of mobile emulation and then pass a dictionary with a device name as the key and then some sort of value that comes from your version of, of Chrome. Thanks everybody for joining and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on mobile actions with Selenium. As mentioned before in the previous lecture, Selenium is not always the best choice for mobile testing, although it is possible to use it for that purpose. So as we saw before, you can pass certain Chrome options to emulate mobile devices, for example, and certain web page actions, something like clicking on an element or clicking on a button, really work just like with anything else. It doesn't matter that you're in a mobile view of the page. Other actions, however, might require that you use the execute script method with JavaScript, and that's why other packages might be preferable depending on what you're using it for. If you don't know JavaScript, for example, and like I said before, this is not a JavaScript class, then you might want to look into other Python packages that could better suit your needs rather than trying to learn JavaScript to code around the limitations of Selenium. And when I talk about those limitations of Selenium, it's things like there aren't really actions that you can use for mobile specific actions. Things like using two fingers to click on something or hold your screen or three fingers on your screen, things like that. There isn't really that capability in Selenium. That said, we'll head over to our Jupyter Notebook to get some practice with the execute script and some other methods, just so that you can see the, the boundaries really of what you can do uh, for mobile using Selenium. Alright, so we've got our Jupyter Notebook open and we've started it with some of the options that we used in the previous lecture. In terms of imports to start off with, you need WebDriver and Service. You should also import by because we will need that in this lecture. And we're going to take a quick look at the Action Chains object as well. The URL we're using is the Selenium URL, so selenium.dev and then we can start the service, add the Chrome options that we talked about last time. So we're emulating an iPhone 12 Pro here. We added that option to using, using add experimental option to our web driver. And then we started our driver here with those Chrome options and we got the Selenium URL. So that's how we get here to start with. Now what you'll see as we saw in our last lecture is that We've got this Selenium view uh, up in mobile right now, right? It's not totally mobile because there's no cutoff. You can just kind of scroll down, um, but it's, it's good enough for us right now. So what I want to show you is that certain actions are just basically web actions, right? There's nothing specific to mobile about them. Uh, oftentimes in mobile websites, you might get this kind of nav bar toggler icon that we've got here, the hamburger menu as it's sometimes sometimes called. And so maybe we want to click on that. And all we have to do is that just works the same way as anything with a normal web page, right? So we can call this, just call this a button element. Uh, and we can just use driver.findElement. We're going to look by the CSS selector. And the string we're looking for is a button dot nav bar toggler. So that's the class on this button here. Uh, it's at the top of the page, so it should be the first one. So we'll run that. We've got our element. And then what we can do is click on it. So you clicked on it. You should see here that menu drops down, right? You can click on things in the, the menu. And it's still that mobile view of a hamburger drop down menu. Uh, and the way these usually work is you click on it again and then it'll close things back up, right? Now you're back on the on the normal page. So in terms of selecting and clicking on stuff in mobile, sometimes it's just basically the same as with with a normal web page. It's just that you've set up your Chrome session to use those emulation 
settings, those Chrome options. So in terms of touch type actions, like I was talking about, maybe it's a scroll or kind of flick with your finger, right, double tap, something like that, where a mobile device could have some sort of specific action that um, that interaction generates, right, like a screenshot or something. I don't know. Um, we can try it with action chains, but what we'll see is we'll just get some errors when we when you maybe try to do things that you would otherwise think would work. So we can set up an action chains object. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do is scroll to this, uh, this getting started header here in the middle of the page. So that's just a basic scroll action, right? It's nothing too complicated. So let's see how that works using using the action chains. So first I'm going to specify that element. So it's an h2 element. So let's get that. Uh, let's see, h2. Let's get all the h, h2s on the page. Driver dot. Since it doesn't have a, there's no ID or name on that h2. Uh, so driver dot find elements, plural. I'm going to search by tag name. And we're looking for that h2 tag. There should be multiple on the page, but we're just going to get the first one. Getting started. Uh, what do we call this? Getting started element. And this is h2. This is from the h2 elements, and it's the first one. So zero index. It's just that. Now, the action chains object has a scroll to element on it. So on this page, you might think that if we scroll up to the top here to stay started up there, that we might just be able to use that and specify the getting started element and then dot, uh, what is this, dot perform to perform the action. But we get this kind of error here, which, what's it say? Invalid argument, invalid parameters. Let's take a look at Yeah, invalid parameters. So you can try to perform it. There is only that one parameter that you need, and yet you still can't do it using an action chain uh, in Selenium. So instead, what you have to end up doing sometimes is using this driver execute script. So we're gonna execute some JavaScript. So you can use Windows scroll to, uh, and then 0, 100, so that's just uh, like an X and a Y value here. Window.scroll2 is just a JavaScript scrolling function. Uh, so we can do that, and then it kind of scrolls down, right? We can maybe do it again. Execute script, window.scroll2, 0, I don't know, like 800, right? Do that, and it scrolls a little bit further down to more or less where the getting started header is. But as you can see, we've kind of got some limitations really to using Selenium for emulating mobile actions or emulating mobile devices as well. Uh, like I've said before, this isn't a JavaScript class. We don't want you to have to write a whole bunch of JavaScript inside of your execute script because it makes your code harder to bug and it means you might have to learn another language too uh, instead of just using Selenium. So if you are using Selenium for mobile testing or you'd like to try to use it, we just want you to be aware of some of these limitations of using it. And you might want to check out some other packages like Appium uh, if you're going to get deeper into trying to use Python for mobile testing. Unfortunately, Selenium doesn't have a whole bunch of, of great functionality for us here. Okay, so hopefully that was an interesting lecture for you guys. Um, again, it's it's a little bit of a knowing the boundaries of, of Selenium rather than getting deep into functionality, but should still be useful. Uh, if you find yourself needing it, you'll know what not to use it for as well as what you can use it for. Thanks everybody for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture.
Hello everyone and welcome to our section on the page object model. To start, we're going to talk about how you might do page testing in Selenium without using the page object model. Before we take a look at what the page object model is, the design pattern and how to implement it in Python, we're going to try to test a page using what we've learned so far. Specifically, in this lecture, we're going to write some code testing the search on Wikipedia's main page. So before we get into the page object model, we might want to think about what are some of the drawbacks of not using a design pattern for testing our web pages. Some of the potential drawbacks that we're going to see as we go through this testing exercise of scripting things, so to speak, or writing things in a Jupyter notebook versus using the page object model are as follows. The first is there's this splatter, you might say, of locator types and strings across your code. So the locator types and the strings for finding page elements are just going to be wherever you need them. They're not going to be centralized in one place. And so if the page changes or the ID of an element changes, for example, you'll have to search through your code to figure out where exactly it is that you're using that locator type or that locator string. The second thing that you'll find is a drawback is that you have repeated code in a lot of places. So for example, let's, let's look at finding an element and sending keys for filling in a text box or an input box. That's really two steps in Selenium. So it's finding the element using some sort of locator type and string, and then you have to send the keys. Now, if you have a large form to fill out or a large form to test filling out, you'll have to repeat both of those steps for every input element that you work with. Obviously, that's not ideal, right? And with the page object model, as you'll see later, we can actually avoid that and cut down quite a bit of repeated code. And finally, the last thing is that it's very difficult to scale your Selenium testing code uh, if you're not using a page object model. Uh, so you'll just have all of these scripts that maybe work, maybe they don't as the web page changes, and it'll become very hard to maintain. And that makes your testing code difficult to scale. Um, so with that said, Let's head over to our Jupyter Notebook now, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the Wikipedia search and test it just using, just coding as we've done before, mostly in our Jupyter Notebook. All right, so we've got our Jupyter Notebook open, and we've got the web driver open as well to the main page of Wikipedia. So the imports, we just need web driver, service, and buy. And then from our settings file, we're going to import that Chrome driver path the Wikipedia URL, which you've got here, that's just that main page. And then we're going to use uh, another search URL in Wikipedia later on, so you can import that as well. That's the Wikipedia search URL. Set up your service, set up your driver, get the URL, and now we can get going. So let's say that we're trying to test this website, and what we want to do is to check to make sure the search functionality works. Right, So we're going to search for something, submit it, uh, and then check that the result is what we expect it to be. Uh, so we're looking at this. Uh, so we want to get this input, this search element here first. Uh, so the search element, let me just, uh, my keyboard is off. So search, okay, here we go. Search, search element. Uh, is going to be equal to driver.findElement and we're going to search by by name. If you look at the HTML there, it's got a name of search. So that's the string of... or actually let's search by ID. ID is always a little bit more reliable. Uh, so search element, so we've got that. Now to do a search we have to send a key we have to do send keys to it, right? And I want to look for, let's look for Python. So then that's in there. And now let's check this search and this will give us some results back. It's an input element, so we can just run the submit method on it. 
and it should run that search for us. And now we've got this page here, right, with some results on it. Maybe we were, we were looking for something more specific, but now we've got this page here um, that we can uh, take a look at. And so we want to make sure that on this page, maybe for our test, we want to make sure that there's a link for uh, the Python programming language. Since we're using Python, we're going to check for that. Uh, so what we're going to do, let's copy the XPath here. And we want to make sure that that element exists. So Python link element is going to be driver.findElement. We're going to look by XPath. And the XPath is... Actually, I don't like that because that's a little bit too specific. But it's a link, so what we're going to do, let's do double backslash. We're going to look for a link on the page where the title is Python Programming Language, which is this attribute here. So title, Python Programming Language. I think that's all we need. So let's run that. Okay, so we got the length. And now if we wanted to, you know, have kind of a test, a test-like thing or a test-like cell in here, then we could assert something. So we want that link element to exist. And if it doesn't, we'll throw an error. So link for Python not found. So there's nothing there because the Python link does exist. Uh, if it didn't, we can just do this really quick, make this a none instead and then run this cell again. And you get an assertion error because the link element is now empty. There's nothing there. Obviously there is something there, but we made it none just to, to, to show that that assertion is, is working. So now we've tested the, the main search, but maybe we want to test the search on another page. So we can get that Wikipedia search URL. So we tested one search. Let's test test this advanced. Um, it's more advanced search here. Uh, so we have to click on something to open up the advanced search. So we want to make sure that works maybe. Uh, and let's see. Let's click on this, maybe. Is this a label? Yeah, this is a label. Okay. So we can, we want to click on this label. So let's copy that X path. So we'll call this click X path. And that looks right to me. Click on it again to close it up. So uh, let's call this test element. We'll find that element so that we can click on it. So find element. We're looking by xpath. And the string is that click xpath. And then what we want to do, we want to click on it. Like I said, that's how you open and open and close it. OK, so we've opened up this search form. And now we want to we want to pass some search text. So we're going to look at this input. It's got an ID there. So we can just copy paste that. So these words, we'll call it these words element because you're searching for these words. Uh, uh, driver dot find element. We're going to search by ID. Got that ID there. That we copied. So we got it. Uh, and then we want to search for Python. So we're going to do the same search, but from a different page. And actually, to activate this, I forgot. You have to end it with a. Uh, 
with a comma, I think. Yeah, and then you get that, that bubble kind of appearing there. But that's the word you're searching for. So now we've got this, this search form, but we have to submit it, you know, again. And now we have to search for that. Search for that. Maybe we want to search for this link on this page, right? So this page setup is slightly different than when we did the normal search before. So now we have to get this link again. Let's take a look at this. Probably just a A with a title. Okay, so the, I think our X path can be the same thing. So now we still want to check that there's a Python link element in here. So driver.find element by, we're going to search by XPath, and we're just going to reuse the XPath that we used before. So we're searching relatively for a link with the attribute of title equal to Python programming language. Run that cell, so we found it. So now if we assert that the Python link element exists, and otherwise the link doesn't exist, then nothing happens because the link does exist. But this should kind of start to show you how if you have a lot of pages that you have to test with Selenium, this can start to get quite tedious. And as you should already kind of notice, it's not very clean. So first off, we've got this in a Jupyter Notebook, which is not the best way of testing websites, right? It's what we've been using to interact with web pages so that we can go through step by step. But in terms of scalability, this is really not scalable. Uh, so there's that's one part of it. The second part of it is you've got this duplication of work, really. So we're sending keys to a lot of things. So first we find the search element, then we send keys to it. And then we do the same thing down here. Find this element send the keys to it. So that's duplicated code that we can cut down on. Uh, so that's another thing. And then you've got these strings that are maybe uh, string constants here, like this click x path, but then you combine it here with uh, the locator type in order to find the element. Uh, maybe you don't have it, so down here it's just in the find element. You've got these strings and these constants kind of all over the place. So it's really not a clean way of identifying the, the web elements that are important to you. So with all these things, with all these issues that we've cropped into, just trying to test some basic search functionality on Wikipedia, you should be able to see why we're going to start heading into the page object model to use that to guide our, our website testing in Selenium. All right, with that said, in our next lecture, we're going to go through the page object model and what it is. So thanks for joining this one and we'll see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on the overview of the page object model in Selenium. As you may have seen in our previous lecture as we went through that testing of Wikipedia's search you should have seen some of the drawbacks to using a non-page object model approach to testing with Selenium, or a non-design pattern approach to testing with Selenium. So what exactly is the page object model? Well, all the page object model really is, is a Selenium design pattern or a Python design pattern for Selenium for building and automating your tests of web pages. The page object model, or POM for short, typically consists of these three components. There's usually a test case, or test cases if you're testing multiple things on a web page. There's a, the page objects themselves, and the locator class or locator classes. We'll talk about each one of these uh, as we go forward in this lecture. One visual way of thinking about the way this is set up in Python is, as we laid out, there's three parts to this. So there's the tests, the page objects, and then the locator class, 
or locator classes. So you start off with your test case. There's something that you want to test on a web page. And then the page objects feed into that test case as a way of abstracting the web page away. And then you've got a locator class, which is where you hold all of those tuples of locators. We'll talk about these in more details, uh, with more detail, one by one, starting with the, with the test case. The test case in the page object model design pattern will be a class with methods for testing that a web page works as expected. For example, you might want to test, does our search form work? If we type something into it and hit search, does it actually return results the way we expect it to? Another example might be, does our checkout process stop people from submitting bad data? So if somebody tries to check out without using, for example, a credit card number or a valid credit card number, will our checkout process stop them from doing that? In this way, the test cases are usually verb driven. That's sometimes what you see when you get into testing. And there's going to be an, assert an assertion for the expected behavior. So going back to these examples, does our search form work? The, we're going to maybe assert that the search results we see have some sort of basic expected behavior, right? If we search for Python, for example, we get a web page that says Python. In the checkout process example, the assertion might be if you enter a bad credit card, we want the page to not continue with that submission. And we want to see maybe an error or a warning that you have to fix your credit card information. In terms of the test case, you can either use Python's built-in unit test module or the PyTest module. For this course, we're only going to use unit test and PyTest won't be covered. But in theory, both of them will work for this design pattern. Now we get to the, the real, the bulk of the page object model, which is the page ob objects themselves. The page objects contain methods related to our interactions with the web page. Typically, what we'll do is we build a base page class to hold common page actions. So think of finding or entering text on a page. That's something that you could do across multiple pages on your website. Then, after you have your base page class set up, our child page classes will inherit from that base page class and combine some of these actions for page specific workflows. Going back to the base page class, it might have a method for entering text, for example, in a text box. But then in our child page class for our web page of interest, for example, the Wikipedia web page, there will be a method for entering text in a specific part of that Wikipedia page. But we'll get that action, we'll get that method, really, from inheriting from our base page class. Finally, the locator class or locator classes will hold the tuples for the elements of interest on our web page. Like you saw with our non page object model testing of Wikipedia, it's a little bit cumbersome to have these locators sprinkled all over the place. The tuples will usually have a locator type and a locator string. So that's what we've been passing to our find element method, right, for Selenium. So you'll just store things really like by.id and then the ID or the name that you're using to search by. Locators are usually put in their own classes for each web page that you're dealing with, but not always. So sometimes you'll see them maybe put in the page object class itself. The way we're going to be doing things is that the locators will be in their own class, but that's just so that you're aware. You might not always see it laid out that way. So now that we've talked about the way these things fit together, let's walk through this diagram again. So we'll start with the locator class. So the locator class is basically just a Python file with a class specific to a web page that contains all the locators for that web page. So you'll really just see a whole bunch of tuples for the locator type and then the locator string. Once you set that up, you can set up your base page page object class. This will be a class that contains common methods so that we don't have to duplicate so much code, right? In order to click on something, you have to find an element and then click on it. 
So we can use that as one method, for example, to enter text into a text box. You have to find an element and then enter the text in the text box or use the send keys method. By putting that in its own class, we can then use it with inheritance for other web pages. And that's what we'll have here. So the base page class will be inherited by the other web page. So now with the locators for that web page and the base page actions, we can click on things on that web page. We can enter text in forms on that web page, so on and so forth. Finally, that web page class will be imported into our test case so that we can do whatever it is that we're trying to test. So if we need to have those web page actions to test filling out a form correctly or incorrectly, we can import that into our test case and then use those methods to build out that test case. With all that said, in our next lecture, we're going to go through how to build that out in a specific example uh, for testing the search functionality on Wikipedia. Hello everyone and welcome to the first part of building out our page object model for Wikipedia. To build up our understanding of how to use the page object model design pattern for testing, we're going to test the search functionality of Wikipedia. To do this, we'll need the three parts we talked about in the last lecture. We'll need the test class. This will be where we write out the methods for testing the search functionality. We'll need the page classes. This will describe the functionality on our web pages. And then we'll need the locator class or classes. These are the tuples for those element locators on the web page. So going back to this visual here that we saw in the previous lecture, our test case here will be the Wikipedia search. For the page objects class, we'll have a base page class and then the main page, which is that Wikipedia main page for all the functionality there. And then we'll have the locator class with the locator tuples for that main page of Wikipedia. To start with, we're going to focus on this test class. In the first part of building up our test, we're going to outline our classes. So we're going to outline all three of those parts of our Selenium tests. We're going to be using Python's built-in unit test module. Test classes in the unit test module can have two test level methods. One of them is setup and the other one is tear down. First, we're going to use the setup method to start our web driver and service. Second, we're going to use the teardown method to quit our web driver. And finally, we'll write a broad brushstrokes methods for testing Wikipedia search. Again, this will be a kind of verb driven method that we'll expand upon later. Just a note, this is not a course on testing specifically or unit test in general. It is really a course focused on Selenium. We're only going to be using some basic functionality from unit test, so you really don't need to be a testing expert, expert or understand everything that you can use the unit test module for. However, as mentioned in the course overview, we do expect a basic Python knowledge, which does include some understanding of how tests work, either in theory or in practice. Again, we'll see a lot of unit test functionality as we go through this section and build out our Selenium test of Wikipedia. Let's head over to VS Code now and get started on building out our test. All right, so unlike most of our previous lectures, we're going to be doing most of this coding in um, in VS Code, or if you have another editor, that's fine too, you know, any of them work. I'm going to be doing this just in this sandbox folder that I have for writing code that really doesn't matter, or that I'm not checking into the repo. And then I'm going to have this POM folder that's just the page object model for uh, for this section. If you want to find the code as we go through it lecture by lecture, you can go to the GitHub repo and look at section 10 on page objects 
and so each section here lines up with the lectures and you can get the finished code from there but we're going to be starting in this in this POM folder uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is we're going to make some new files so we need a locators file so locators.py uh, we need another file which is going to be what is this um, this is going to be test search .py. So this will be our unit test. And then the other one that we need is, we'll call it page.py. So page.py is going to be our class for the, the page objects themselves. Okay, so let me just take a look. So the first thing we're going to do here, let's just start off with our locators. We'll call this class main page locators. This is going to inherit from Python's object. And we'll just pass for now. So in this lecture, we're not going to go through and, and have all the locators set up there. Uh, so we'll just make that a class, but have it not have anything in it. Uh, we can also do this for the page, uh, the page objects here. So like I talked about in the lecture, we're going to have this base page class. Inherits from object. I'm going to pass for now. And then the other class that we're going to have is the main page for Wikipedia's main page. This is I'm going to inherit from that base page class. Then we can pass because we'll fill it out in a uh, in a later lecture. And then we go up to our up to our test class. So we're going to call this let's call this class Wikipedia main page search. And this is actually going to inherit from unit test dot test case. So in order for that to work, we're going to have to import unit test. And then that should be good to go. Pass for now. I'm going to come back and fill that out. And then to run this, to run this as a testing script, if name is equal to main, then we're going to, the way you run this unit test is uh, you call unit test.main. And then that'll run the test on this um, in this in this file. So we've got things kind of set up. So we've got our locators. We'll deal with those later and put those in. Those are just tuples. We've got our page objects. We'll fill that out in the next lecture, I think. And now we've got this test. So like I talked about in the lecture, there's a couple of um, important methods that we're going to set up here. So two of them are setup and teardown. And that's just what happens before and after the test is run. And then let's do a test search. All right, so those are the three methods we're going to be working on. To set things up, what we're going to do is set up our service and our driver. So for that, we're going to have to do those imports. So from Selenium, let's import the web driver. And then from Selenium dot web driver dot Chrome dot service, import that service class. And then we're also going to need, uh, what do I need? From our settings file, We'll import the Chrome driver path. Let me actually close this file, give us some more space. Chrome driver path, and we're testing Wikipedia, so let's import that Wikipedia URL. And then we can just set this up like with anything else. So self.service, executable path is going to be that Chrome driver path. The driver is the web driver drop dot chrome uh, and service is just self dot service and 
and then the end of the setup is just getting that web page. So now that the driver has been set up, we can get that Wikipedia URL. And then that'll be that. Then we're ready to test, test that search, right? So that's the setup on this test. The teardown will be, we've got self.driver that's been set up. We can quit that, right? That's going to be the teardown. So let's save this. Um, and this should be, if we run this now, let's try to run this now. What will happen is we'll just open this up, get the page, and then close. And that's all that happens. So ran test in one, whatever, five seconds. One test in five seconds. And there really isn't a test, right? We just got this test search that passes through. So if it's, of course it's okay. But this should show you at least the setup and teardown methods work. Now we're going to start building out this test search. So what I'm going to search for is I'm going to search for search for Python programming language. Like we saw in the first lecture for this section, that's one of the pages on Wikipedia on Python, on the Python programming language. So that's what we're going to search for. Uh, now the next thing is we're going to we're going to start using these page objects. So I want to get that main page, and what it's going to what we're going to pass to it is self.driver. So now if I want this to work, I'm going to have to import from the page module. So from page import main page. And that'll be how that works. So now we don't have an error there. Uh, then I'm going to want to search. So main page dot search. I'm going to search for the search text that we just put there. Uh, Python programming language. And this is part of the unit test module. It has all these assertions that you can run. So assert, assert equal or whatever, whatever. We're going to use assert equal. And then this is going to be search text plus hyphen Wikipedia. Uh, and then we're going to get the title from the, uh, we're going to get the page title from our web page. And the reason I'm going to do it this way, let me go up to Chrome here. If I go here and I click on Python programming language, and you look at the title here, it actually says, uh, it has that dash Wikipedia afterwards. So that's how we're going to check that we're actually on the right page is we're going to check the the HTML title. So I think this is going to be it for this lecture. So what we've done so far is we've set up the skeleton of our test. We've got a locator class. We've got these page classes that we'll fill out next. And we've got the the body of our search really. So this is the this is what I'm talking about about the kind of the the abstract search that's going on. We've got some text that we're searching for. We're going to start that main page object with the driver. And then we're going to search for something. And we're going to say, I expect the result of this search, the page as a result of this search, to have a title that's going to be Python programming language dash Wikipedia. So that's the test that we want to that we want to pass. And then we've got the setup and teardown methods that will start and quit the the driver. Okay, thanks everybody for joining and we'll see you in the next lecture where we where we'll fill out those locators and the the page classes and things will start coming together. Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of our page object model um, task here where we're building out the test for Wikipedia. In this lecture, we're going to focus on building out the page objects classes and our locator class. Our locator class will hold the relevant tuples for the page elements. So like I mentioned before, this will be a by type, so by ID or by CSS selector, and then a locator string. The base page class 
is going to hold common page actions, things like getting an element on a page, entering text in an element that you found or selected, clicking on an element that you found or selected, for example, so on and so forth. The main page class will then inherit from that base page class that we've set up, and it will have page-specific methods. For example, searching on Wikipedia involves two steps. So we're going to have to enter text into the search form, and entering text is an action we can inherit from the base page class. And then we'll have to submit the form or click on a search button. And again, that's an action we can inherit from the base page class. So why do we structure things in this way? Having a base page object with common actions makes it a lot easier to build new pages and workflows from those actions. Let's say we want to test another part of Wikipedia, for example. Instead of having to build out something completely new, we can just test the new search page, for example, or if we wanted to use the advanced search page on Wikipedia where there's more inputs, maybe more things to select, a drop-down menu, we can just inherit that base page object again and keep building out the actions for the new pages and it will still be pretty, pretty clean. It also keeps our page locators and page actions together rather than spread out in your code. So like we saw when we were testing without the page object model, these strings and locators can sometimes get spread out in your code as you're going if you're just using a scripting approach. Structuring things this way will have all our locators in one place, and then those locators will be used by that main page class. All of this makes your tests a lot easier to read, and there's the old adage that code is read a lot more than it's written, so you want to be kind to everybody else who has to read your tests, including your future self. It'll make it a lot easier to understand what's going on when you come back to it at a later date. Let's head over to VS Code and keep building out our Selenium test. All right, we're back in VS Code. So in the last lecture, what we did was set up the skeleton for our test. We've got this locators class, the search test here, or testing the search, uh, and then page class. So we're going to start filling out things a little bit more. Let's start with the locators class. So if I go back here, uh, what this is going to be is a class with the tuples for the important things on that main Wikipedia page. So the first thing that I'm going to want to do is import the by class because I have to look for um, I have to look for stuff, right? So we're going to import by, and then the things that we want. Let's pull up Chrome again. Uh, we just go to the main page, click on this. Then what we want is we want this search input, and then we're gonna. We also want to uh, search for something. So let's see got input an ID of search button, got an input with an ID of search input. So those can be our two the two ways we look for things. So let's make these constants or uppercase. So this is going to be a tuple which is by ID and the ID is search input and then we've got the search button this is also we're also going to do this by ID and I think this is what is this search button I think let's go back to let's go back to Chrome here just take a look at it so the ID search input is that where you put the text Right, and the search button here has an ID of search button. So that's that that's this thing right here, the magnifying glass. If I go click on that, that's what we're gonna click on. You could submit the form, but I, I'd like to build out something to click on the button to just as as practice. Uh, and then you should have two uh, let's see, two spaces there, and that's it. So this is our 
this is our main page locators class. Really straightforward. We just got these two constants, right, that are how we're going to look for that search input and that search button. Uh, we don't have to do any more updates on our test search. So now what we want to do is take a look at our um, at our page classes. Uh, and the first thing we're going to do is to start build out building out this base page. Uh, first method we're going to have is the initialization method, so it's going to inherit from self. And the one thing you want to pass is your web driver. We'll set just say self.driver is equal to driver. Again, that's going to be that web driver object. Now we'll need a few other, quite a few other methods here, at least for now. So we're going to get a our base page is going to have a get element method. Let's pass. And we'll go back and, and fill all these out in a second. I just want to get these here. Let's have a get text. Um, pass. Then we need to enter text, right? Because we're going to be entering text in a in these text boxes for the for the search. We also need to be able to click a button and we need that uh, we need to check the page title so get page title self okay so that's what that's what we're gonna fill out here and as we go through this you should start to see why doing things this way will end up helping us. So the first method we're going to build out is getting an element from a page. So in order to do that, this is a self method, we're going to need a locator type, so by ID, by name, and then a locator string, right? That's how we're going to get the element. And then the way this is going to work, it's going to return self.driver, it's a web driver. You can do a find element, and you just pass that locator type and locator string. And that's all there is to it. That's all there is to the get element. If we want to get the text, what we can do, let's see, we'll call this element is self.get element. So again, now we don't have to, we can just use the, this method for everything else, right? We don't have to say driver.find element all over the place. Uh, so what is this? Yeah, we're just doing the locator type and locator string. So those have to be those have to be passed as well as as parameters for this method. Uh, and then this is get text, so we're actually going to return element dot text. So get element uses find element, which is why we're going to have a web element returned, and so we can get the text on that. To enter text, let's do self.getElement. Uh, we need a locator type and string. Locator string. So we're going to do a get element based on that. And then we're going to do send. To enter text, we're going to send keys. So we have to have. Uh, I'll have some text to enter. Text uh, parameter there. So that's the enter text. And then, let's see, click button. So we're going to click a button that's kind of very similar to what we did above. So we're going to get an element. Get an element. Locator type, locator string. So we need those. Locator type, locator string and then just click on it, right? And then get the page title, we'll just return. That's from the driver, so we just return, return self.driver.title. And then we've got, so that's our base page object there. And now what we wanna do is use this base page and all of its really nice methods to build out the search on the main page here. 
So what we're going to be doing is we're searching. This is going to, going to inherit, what is this? This takes self, and then we're going to search for some specific string. We're going to be searching for this, this Python text, right? That's what we're going to be looking for. So add the colon there. So in order to search, what do we have to do? You have to enter text into one of the locators, and then you have to click the button to search. Again, you, so you could submit the form. I'm just doing this, this way as, as kind of another bit of practice for how to do this. So where do you have to enter text? Enter text takes uh, the locator type string and then some text and the click button takes a locator type and a string. Well, we've got that already, right? That's in our main page locators class. So we can import that. So if I go up, don't close that, but go down here and then run an import. So from locators, we're going to import main page locators, right? That's uh, the locators class. And then what I can do here so I'm going to unpack this tuple in a, in a second. So main page locators dot, you want to enter text in the search input, and you want to click the button, that's the search button. And then since this is a tuple, we need to unpack it. So you can do that with the asterisk in Python. And the only other thing that we have here is there's text that we're searching for, and that's just our search string parameter here, right? So that's where that goes. We're entering the text in the search string. And that is basically it, I think. So now let's go, let's kind of work our way up. We've got these locators, right? And they're just elements on the page. These get inherited by our page uh, module with these classes. Our base page class has methods that reduce the work that we have to do and the code that we have to type. So if I didn't have this and I was typing this out, to enter text here, first I'd have to find the element and then I'd have to send the keys. And to click the button, first I'd have to find the element and then I'd have to click on it, right? By having these methods, that, ex that essentially collapses the code that you have to write. You don't have to duplicate it all over the the place. And so if we wanted to do this on Wikipedia's advanced search page, for example, we could just do this again, but with a different uh, class for that page and have the same methods, right? Enter text somewhere, click on a button or submit a form. And we wouldn't have to build out anything, anything new. Additionally, what is going on in this search is very easy for somebody to understand. How does the search work? You enter text and then you click on a button that's really easy to understand. It's not, it's not really confusing at all. It's the way anybody does a search. And then if you go up, you've imported the, this page object to use it in our Wikipedia main page search. So we've got the setup class here, which is a, test, um, a testing method. So we'll set up our service and our web driver and then get that URL to uh, test with. We've got the teardown, so it quits the driver at the end, and then this test search, which is what we'll be testing. And now that everything's been built, we can run this um, run this code here. So we can run this Python file, and it will test uh, this Wikipedia search. So it opens it up, searches, closes, and then let's check. Ran one test in seven seconds. Okay, so it didn't fail. So our test actually succeeded. So we just successfully built out a Python unit test with Selenium to test uh, Wikipedia's search functionality. So this is pretty cool, um, and we're going to improve it just a little bit in the next lecture. But hopefully you should be able to see why the page object model is so useful compared to that, that Jupyter Notebook method that we were doing before. All right, thanks everybody for joining this, this lecture. We'll have one more lecture focused on improving this a bit, uh, and then that'll be it for the page object model section. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture.
Hello everyone and welcome to the last part of building out our page object model test for Wikipedia. In this last lecture we're going to focus on the base page class in our page objects Python file. Specifically we're going to think about how can we can improve how can we improve our get element method in our base page class. One of the things that we can do, as we talked about in a previous section of this course, is we can use weights. Right now, there are no explicit weights specified for getting page elements. If you'd like to review pages or weights and how weights work on pages in Selenium, please go back to that series of lecture. Uh, but what we can use is we can add an explicit weight so that if something goes wrong, we'll be able to catch it or we'll be able to not throw an error in our test. The other thing that we're going to add is there's no error handling. So let's say we add that wait and maybe the page doesn't load in time and so we get an error on our search. We'd like to print something out to, to let us know what error occurred and maybe some more information about it. So what we can do as well is we can add a, a try catch or try accept block. Let's head over to VS Code and finish up writing our Selenium test. All right, so we're back in VS Code and we're just gonna clean up a couple things with our test here to make it slightly more elegant, slightly, slightly better looking, more, um, more flexible in terms of if you have a bad connection or something doesn't load. Uh, and the great thing is that we don't have to touch a whole bunch of stuff. So our test here, we don't have to touch, right? We're testing the search in the previous lecture. We saw the search works, the test passes. So that's all well and good. We don't have to touch that. The locators, we don't need any new locators. We don't have to change this. So our locators class will stay, stay the same. Uh, all we have to do, all we're going to do is try to improve our, some of our page objects um, actions. And for that, the, the main thing that we're going to do is have that explicit weight um, that we talked about in the, in the section on weights. So we're going to import from selenium.webdriver.support. We're going to import expected conditions. We're going to call that EC. Expected conditions is a little bit of a long uh, name to use when it's sprinkled in your code. Then from webdriver.support.ui, we're going to import that webdriver weight object. Webdriver, what is this? Webdriver weight. Uh, and then let's say we're going to import an exception because we're going to write a, a try accept uh, in a bit. Uh, what is this? Common, common dot exceptions import, let's import no such, uh, no such element exception. So we'll do that, um, do that there. And really the only place that we have to worry about is this, um, this get element method. Uh, so the first thing that I'm going to do is we're going to do that, we're going to use a web driver wait instead of just a find element, right? For this, you need the driver, and that's on self.driver. And then you need a wait time. And there's actually in the um, in the settings file, let's see, how do I import this? So from our settings file, I'm gonna import a wait time that's defined there. Uh, and that's just so that if you, if you do this web driver wait method with expected conditions in various places, you'll have a, um, a, single, um, a single definition for how long you want to wait. That's kind of the, the best way of doing things. So if you go to the definition here, the wait time is just a constant in seconds, at 10 seconds. That seems reasonable to me. You can change it. You could use a, a different um, integer there if you wanted. That's just what I'm, what I'm going to do to make things um, simple. So we're going to wait until and now what are we waiting until? Uh, expected condition, let's say presence of element located on the page 
and we've got this locator type and then locator string. And actually, you have to, if I remember correctly, I messed this up the first time. You have to pass it as a tuple to this uh, expected condition. So we've got that element, and then we can return it. Right? And that's that. So now we've got a, um, a slightly more sophisticated way of getting an element on a page, which is that you'll wait for it to be there with this explicit wait. So if we run the Python search again, uh, so I'll go there, go to the programming language, and then it'll tell us that the, the test passed, right? So we're still good. Our test still works like it did before. It just has a slightly better way of handling um, handling weights in there. Now the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to let's put this in a try uh, try accept block. So if there's a no such element exception, call that e, then we'll print uh, what is this element with uh, this is going to be a locator type of and then locator string uh, not found and then we can print that um, print that error which is e there so element with for example ID of some ID string not found and then it'll print the the rest of the error there. All right, so now this is a pretty robust way of getting elements. So let's save this, run the run the um, the test again. I'll run the search, close it. So we got the page there. Ran one test in about eight seconds. All good. Okay, the test passed. Awesome. So we've just written a, a testing module in Selenium using the using the page object model design pattern. And again, let's go through what's going on. You've got this main page locators class that just really has the tuples of how you find things on the page. So if something changes, if the ID changes, all you have to do is go here, change the string, right, or change the way you search for it, and that's that. You'll still be able to find that search input because what you're using in the page is just that that constant, right? You've already changed it here. You don't have to go through all your code and try to figure out where things broke down. You just change the search input. Uh, our base page class here makes things really easy for us if we have another page that we want to test. So if I wanted to do, you know, class uh, advanced search page, I could just inherit from the base page and write a new search method with uh, with the same stuff. So self, let's delete that, you know, self.entertext, self.clickbutton. And then that's it, right? I've just built out a search on a totally different page and all I have to do was add those two methods. Now, of course, I'd have to add locators and, and all that, but that's pretty easy to do, right? That's what doing the that's what building out that base page really, really gets us. Uh, we've got the explicit weights here. So if the element loads a little bit slower for whatever reason, we're not going to run into an error like we saw in the section on weights. We've got a try accept, which you could put elsewhere. I, I chose to put it here. You could choose to put it elsewhere depending on your style. Um, and then we've got this nicely written test here that we didn't even have to touch. So if things change on the page, we don't have to touch this, right? It's just doing a search. And if you search for something, you expect something back. So you have a way of checking that. All of this works really nicely together. And then if there are other things you want to test on this page, you can just add methods, right? And and build it out using that main page object and the methods on, on that object. So hopefully this section was uh, interesting to you guys. Uh, I thought the page object model was really cool when I first learned about it. Um, 
and we're going to learn a bit more about it and practice it some more in our guided project. Uh, so that'll be the end for this section, but we're going to get some more practice with it um, on, our, on our last guided project. Thanks everybody for joining, and we'll see you in the next section. Hello everyone, and welcome to our third guided project for this Selenium course. In this guided project, we're going to be doing some more testing with the page object model that we covered in the previous section. The goal of this project is to test the proper functioning of the band booking form at thegoldbugs.com. We need to verify two different things, which is why we're going to be doing this testing. We need to verify that our booking form does not submit without the required fields. If you think about a real website, you don't want to get information without the information that you're specifically looking for or the information that's required from some of your forms on your website. And second, we want to verify that the form does submit successfully when you fill it out with the required fields. Again, if you can't recall from some of the previous sections where we've looked at this website, which is a testing website for the course, the booking form of interest to us looks a little like what's shown here. We'll throw it up in a Chrome browser in a later lecture as we get started with this, but this is just so that you know what we're going to be taking a look at. In this guided project, we're going to use almost everything that we've learned so far in this course. We're going to combine what we've learned about the page object model in the previous section with the form filler that we built for our second guided project. By the end of this guided project, you should be able to see the utility of the page object model in real life testing scenarios. And we won't be starting from scratch in terms of the code. Like you'll see in the next lecture, we're going to be starting with a little bit of a boilerplate so that we can get off to a running start. Thanks everybody for joining, and we'll see you in the next lecture. All right, so to get started on this project, you should open up your VS Code, and then you can pull the boilerplate that we'll be starting from, from our GitHub repo. So I'm just gonna be doing this in my sandbox here, which is just a folder for holding stuff that I'm working on. But you can also go to the GitHub and go to the guided project section. And there's a guided projects uh, starter code um, directory where you can pull the, the starter code for this project. So we'll have three Python files. The first one will be our test file. So this is called test form. We're importing unit test, web driver service. From our settings, we're importing the Chrome driver path and the gold bugs URL. And then we've got this testing class. So Goldbug's main page form fill, since that's what we're testing, filling out the form. It inherits from unit test .test case. And then we've got a setup, uh, a setup method here that you should have seen before. The one thing that we've added is uh, self.driver.maximizeWindow. So that'll maximize the window upon starting. And then we've got a test method and a teardown method, right, which is just quitting the, the, the Chrome driver, the web driver. We've got a page.py file. This holds our base page class. So we'll fill out these methods again. And then we've got our main page class that inherits from base page. And we'll fill that out. That's related to that main uh, gold bugs page. And then we've got our main page locators class as well. And this is to hold our locator tuples for the elements on the gold bugs page, main page. So what we might want to start with is, uh, let's actually start with the locators. So we're going to be doing this form fill where we're filling out some required fields and some non-required fields. And there might be some other elements that we'll need. So I'm just going to have these three sections right here for now. Um, but let's actually open up this website in Chrome. So I've already got this open here. Uh, and this is um, 
the website, right? So this is what we're going to be taking a look at, and we saw this on the form filler. So you scroll down, and this is the section that we're interested in filling out. So what we can do is go through this uh, one by one again and take a look at all these elements and write up the tuples for how we find them, and we're just going to have them in one place now. Uh, okay, and so the required elements uh, are, let's see, we've got name, email, and then, sorry, name, email, and subject are required. So we need these four text boxes are going to be required. So let's click on them, start finding things out. Uh, so this one, the input, uh, the name is F name, so we'll do that. And then I think last name is L name. Yep, so last name is L name. So we can just do that. Go back to VS Code. So first name, we're going to have this all be uppercase. So by, we're going to be searching by name. And this is F name. And then last name is by.name, L name. Okay, and then we also need email and subject, I think. Okay, so now if we go back to Chrome, take a look at this. Email, I think, isn't just name, email, yeah. Subject is this. This one, it's got an ID, so let's just use that ID. Control copy that. Go back over to VS Code and paste that in. So we're going to search here by dot, uh, what are we searching for? By name, email, and this is going to be by dot ID and copy and paste that. And I realized that red underscore here is telling me that I need to import that class. So from from selenium dot webdriver dot common dot by import that by class, and then we'll be good to go. Except for this one, which is misspelled. It's got the lowercase there. Okay, so we've got a required field locators. Control save that. Now let's go to our non-required fields uh, and find those. So let's head back over to Chrome. Okay, so keep scrolling down here. Now we're getting to the non-required elements. I think this one, if I remember correctly, we could do it by ID, but let, let's just search by text area, by tag name, uh, text area. And then, let's see, we're going to say no response required. That's just the label, the input. Uh, we'll search by an X path here, I think. So input with a value of no response required. So let's go back over to VS Code. So we want this to be what? Let's call this message. And we'll call the other one uh, no response required checkbox. Okay, so the message, we're going to search by tag name, and this is going to be a text area. Uh, we're going to search by for the checkbox, we're going to search by xpath, and this will be an input with a value equal to, and then close that off, value equal to no response required. Let's do that, and let's keep going down this form here. So the type of event we want the band to attend, that'll be public show. Um, click on that. I think we can use an XPath here again. Yeah, we can just put, um, what is this? Public show. Let's do public show radio button. So this is going to be by XPath. The X path is basically the same as the one above it, so this is input where the value is, uh, what is that? Public show. 
Okay, what else do we have? We've got the select drop down. Right, how did you hear about us? And then we've got a survey element to fill out. Just what is this? So we'll call it the survey radio button. And I'll go back to uh, Chrome in a sec. Uh, so let's go back. I'm just flipping between these because the, it keeps the text a little bit larger in this instance, um, rather than having them side by side, just for now. Uh, let's see. So select drop down. Let's click on that. Select. Okay, it's got that ID. So we can copy that. Right. And then I think for this one, we're going to use the same expat. So will you tell your friends about our band? Strongly agree. Uh, so it's input uh, with a value of 2. Okay, so select drop down. We're going to be doing this by by ID, and that's what we copied. So it's select, and then it's got that long string there. And the survey radio button. Let's do this by X path. Um, this will be input with a value of two. And you could be more specific here and say uh, type radio if you wanted to, but this works fine for now on our on our website. And what else do we want? I think that's going to be it for now. Uh, so let's say that we're going to take a look at some other elements uh, later on, but that's going to be it for now. So the let's head over to our let's take a look at test form. So what are we testing um, on this page? We want to test an invalid form submission and a valid form submission. So let's make this test invalid form submission. Uh, and then we can make another method. Scroll this up. So def, what are we calling this? Test valid form submission. Inheriting from self. Uh, and this is just pass for now. Okay, so let's go back up to this test invalid form submission. What do we want to do with the with testing an invalid form submission? So we're going to do what we did in the previous section. So we start off with our main page. It's going to inherit from the driver. So we're going to have to import that. So up here from our page file, let's import that main page class. And right now there's nothing in there. We'll fill that out as we go along. Uh, so we've got the main page and that it will inherit from the, uh, or rather take the driver as a, as a parameter. Uh, we're going to, let me just take a look. So let's take a, let's actually take a step back, go over to this form here. So what I want to, when we pull up this page, you pull up here, you pull it up here, and you're taken to um, the top of the page, right? So what we're going to want to do is let's, let's do a clicking action so we can click on the booking form. Then we can fill out the non-required field. So again, we're testing an invalid form submission here. So we'll fill out the, the non-required fields. Uh, and then we'll submit. So we can get the form as well, uh, the form element, so that we can submit that in Selenium. So let's go back over here uh, to VS Code and write out those, those steps as uh, methods that we'll then expand on in our main page um, class. So we're going to click the booking form link. So that's that. Uh, navigation header at the top of the page. Then we're going to what we're going to fill the non-required fields. Then we're going to submit gold bugs form. Right, submit the form after we've filled everything out or filled out the non-required fields. And then what we're going to do is assert is not none. And what should happen? 
So let's go back to here. If I click on this submit, I haven't filled anything out. I'm going to get some errors here. So what we want to happen is we want to check that these um, these errors pop up, right? And there's this div, I think, here that will, yeah, div with a class of field error that would tell us your form has encountered a problem. Please scroll down to review. We need that form to pop up so that the uh, so that we know that the form has not been submitted correctly. So assert is not none. We need that form. So let's do main page dot get form failure div because that's a that's a div on the page. Um, and if we fail, if that is none, right? If that if that method doesn't return anything. We'll say alert for required fields is missing. Uh, OK. So that's the testing the invalid form submission. Now for the valid form submission, we're going to basically do the same thing. So we start off, we'll initialize that main page object. Let's uh, click on the booking form link. Again, we haven't written this method. We'll do that in a minute. Then we'll fill the required fields. Or actually, let's let's do a fill all fields, not just the required fields. So fill all fields. So that'll include the required fields. And then main page dot submit gold bugs form like we did before. And then we'll do self dot assert is not none. And then we're going to do essentially the opposite of what we've got here. So get form failure div. Let's see what happens when we submit the form successfully. So name, whatever, last name, also whatever, email, uh, john at doe.com, uh, subject, whatever. And then we can hit submit and let's see what happens. First name is not valid. OK, that's my bad. Uh, it has to be a normal first name, basically. Uh, OK, let's submit that. And then we get this thank you. And so it says, thank you for submitting the form. Let's click on that element uh, form submission text class. OK, great. So that'll be another thing that we'll have to look for. But then we're going to assert is not none. So we want that div to pop up with the with the thank you. So we'll say main page get form success div. And if that doesn't show up, we'll say form was not submitted successfully. Right? We've got an error because we did everything right and yet the form didn't submit. We don't have that that expected behavior. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff going on here. Now what we're going to do is fill this out in the page class. So let's head over to the page class. We've gotten the actions here in our test that we're going to want to have happen in our main page class. So let's go ahead and um, fill these out. So we need to click on the booking form link. It's going to inherit from the self pass. We'll fill that out in a later lecture. We need to fill the required fields. Again, I'm just creating the skeleton for this class here. I'm not going to write out what all these methods are doing yet. Uh, for that testing invalid form submission, we're going to fill out the non-required fields. Uh, then we're using an, a fill all fields for the uh, testing the valid submission. And this one's going to be nice. We can actually then just use fill non-required fields and fill required fields, right? Because those two are mutually exclusive. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? We need to submit the form. So we want to submit uh, gold bugs form. And then 
I want to, let's pass. Keep going, scroll down, just give it more space. Then I need to get the, the form success and the form failure, right? So when the form doesn't submit, we need to get that div. So get form failure div. And then get form, what is this form success div? Okay, so those are all the methods uh, so far that we need. So these are all the methods uh, that are related to our testing. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to fill in on this base page, uh, so let's, on this base page class, we're going to have one for select by value because we have to use that drop down, right? So that's standard behavior. So we want that in there. And then I want to submit the form as well. That's standard page behavior, not specific to this gold bug page. So we want that in our May our base page uh, class, not the main page class. And now if I go back to the locators, uh, I think there's a couple more things I want to put in here. So we want to submit the form, so we need to get that form element. Uh, we need to get the form failure div, right, for when you don't submit it successfully. We need the form success div or when you do submit it successfully, uh, and then the booking. Oh yeah, that's right. I'm gonna cl click on the, I'm gonna click on the booking form at first at the top of the page. All this booking form anchor, uh, and so I need I need that as well. So let's go back to, let's go back to the gold bugs. Refresh this page just so that I can get the form there as well. So let's see, booking form, let's click on that. So we need something for that. Uh, and it doesn't seem like there's something good to identify it. So let's just copy the XPath. Go back to our locators here. We're going to search by XPath and then that's how we're going to search for it. And so you can copy that. Um, form elements uh, is the next one that we want. So let's scroll down here. Let's try to find this form element. Um, let's click on this div. Is that in here? OK, yeah, it is in here. So the form. And I think for this, we can just search by tag name. There's only one form on here. So let's go back to VS Code. The form element we're going to search by, I always forget that I have caps lock on. Search by tag, tag name, we're looking for that form element. And then the failure div. So let's submit this. Form has encountered a problem. Click on that. Uh, I think we're looking for it by the class. Yeah, so div dot field error. We'll do that. So the form failure div, this is just going to be, uh, we're going to look by CSS selector. And this is a div dot field error. And then I think we can do the same thing for the success. So Fill this out again, and then submit it, uh, john at doe.com, subject, blah, 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 submit. OK, and then we've got the thank you. Let's click on that so I know what that div class is. Um, it's got an ID, so actually, let's use that instead. It's always better to be more specific when you can. So it's got that ID. Let's use that as well. Um, so we'll do by ID and then copy and paste that. So 
So that should be good to go. Um, okay, so we did a lot of stuff in this lecture. So let's walk through kind of everything that we did. So first thing we had our our boilerplate code to start with. So in our test, we've got all the imports that we need. We're going to run a setup method that sets up the web driver. We're going to test the invalid form submission by clicking on the form booking link to go to the form on the page, filling on the non-required fields, submitting the form, and then making sure those failure failure divs show up to tell us that we need to fill in the fill in the information. Then we're going to test valid form submission, so we click on the booking form link again, fill in all the fields, and uh, submit the form, and then check that that thank you div shows up as well. And then we'll tear down, so that's just we quit the driver when we're done testing. On our page, we'll fill this out in, uh, in the next lecture, I think. Uh, we've got our main page class that inherits from the base page, where it's got the specific actions for the Goldbugs websites. So filled required fields that's specific to the Goldbugs website. And then we've got our base page class that holds all of those standard actions, right? Get element, get text, enter text, click stuff, select by value, and then submit form. That's all going to be in the base page class. And then we took a look in Chrome at our web page layout, right, at the DOM. And we collected all of these tuples uh, in order to check, uh, in order to put them all in one place so that we can use them as our locators uh, with these with these main page methods, right? So that's what we're going to be working on in the next lectures. Uh, that's it for now. Thanks everybody for joining and I'll see you in the next lecture. Welcome back everybody to this guided project. We're going to keep going where we left off in the last lecture. I know that it was a it was a long one, but the nice part about this lecture is that we'll only we'll only have to touch one Python file. So we've got our tests set up here, uh, and so we don't need to touch that for now. We've got our locators all collected here, and so the only thing we're going to do is fill out this. Uh, page object class. That's really where we're going to be spending the bulk of our time uh, this this lecture. Um, so we've got this this base page class. So let's get started with uh, filling this out. So with get elements, uh, we want to get an element on the page. So what I want to do is I'm going to want to return the self dot driver dot find element, uh, and to find an element. I need to have a locator type and a locator string. This probably looks familiar to the last section, so we're just going to keep uh, rolling through here with this kind of with this kind of stuff. So get the elements. Uh, we're going to find the element based on the locator type and the locator string. Next, for our get get text, the element is going to be self dot get element, and we need that locator type and locator string. So let's add those parameters here. So locator type, locator string. It's all well and good. And then we can return element.text. Uh, okay, so we've gotten the text from a web element. So enter text is next. So for this, we're going to input it into a text box, right? So we need to do, what do we need to do here? Self.getElement. We need a locator type, locator string. Add those parameters. Locator type, locator string. Now that I've got the element, I can send keys to it. I'm going to send some text, so I also need that as another parameter. All right, so that's the enter text method. Uh, for the click, we're going to get an element. This probably looks straightforward by now, so we need the locator type, locator string. Locator type, locator 
string and then we're just going to click on it right uh, and I'm not missing a parentheses no not missing a parentheses so everything's good all right uh, and then the last one select or not the last one but the select by value so for this we're gonna want that uh, select object so we're gonna have to import that and that comes so that comes up here don't collapse so let's import no this is from selenium dot web driver dot support dot select you're gonna import that select class alright so now we can instantiate that object and how do we do that well we could do the self dot get elements so we need those two locator type locator string locator type locator string uh, so that instantiates the object uh, and then what you want to do is what we saw in the form section so you can select by value um, and we need a value parameter so I'll add that up here okay and then finally we need a submit form so self dot get element add those parameters locator type locator string so that you can get the form and then you're just gonna submit it right that's how forms work uh, you can just call submit on the web element the form element and it'll submit that form uh, for you okay so we've got this base page class here uh, filled out now let's use that to put together um, the main page class and I think what we're going to do is we're actually going to wait for that for the next lecture for now uh, so yeah let's do that and the last thing we'll do is we'll add some doc strings actually so we'll do the main page classes in the next uh, lecture and just fill out the doc strings here. So select by value. This is select option in drop down menu based on value. And then the submit form, uh, submit form element. Right. Okay. Uh, so I think that's it for now for this lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to use these, these base page methods that we've written out here to do the the main page methods down here so clicking on that booking form filling the required fields and all of that thanks everybody for joining and I'll see you in the next lecture hello everyone and welcome back to this um, to this guided project uh, so we're back in VS code here where we left off in the last video uh, so in this one, again, we're only going to be touching, I think, the page, um, the page module. So our testing module is all set up, our locators are all fine. Now we're going to keep going with where we left off. So we've got all these generic methods in our base page class. So now let's start to hook them together in order to uh, fill out this class for actions on the Goldbugs homepage. So we'll just move down all these methods, this, excuse me, skeleton that we put together before. So uh, for this, let's see, we're going to click on the, we're going to do the doc strings as we go along as well. So click on the booking form link to scroll to that section. And how do we do this? Since we're inheriting, we can just do self.click. Uh, and then we need those locators, right? So now let's go up here. We want to import those locators. Uh, let's add that. So what am I importing? From the locators, let's import the main page locators class. 
Uh, okay, that's great. I've got two spaces there, so that's all well and good. Uh, go back down here. And then we can do what we saw in the previous section where we were testing that Wikipedia page, right? So what are we clicking on? We're clicking on that booking form anchor. So booking form anchor. And then you do that uh, star trick to to unpack the the tuple. So that's all we need for the clicking clicking on the booking form. Let's fill the required fields. So fill out only required fields in the form. Uh, whoops, missing one. So I want to enter text self dot enter text uh, and we're going to do this going down the page. So first name main page locators dot first name just make this John then you want to do the last name. This is last name. Uh, make that Doe. Self dot enter text. Then we need the email. So main page locators dot email. John dot Doe at mail dot com. Not a real email address, obviously. At least I don't think it is. And then we need the subject, um, right, subject, love your band. So that's what we wrote in the form filler. That's what we're going to write here. All right. As you, as you should be able to see, uh, this method reads very straightforward in a very straightforward way because of this enter text that we've got from the base page class and then the way we're able to unpack these locators and then pass the the kind of the testing parameters here, right? The text that we're going to be filling into these fields. So let's keep going with with all the rest of this stuff. So fill non required fields. So fill out only non required fields in the form. I always miss the, the end button on my keyboard. Uh, so this is self. We need to send a message, right? So main page locators dot message. Uh, you're the greatest. I love your band. So that's what we're going to say to them. Then what else do we have to do? We have to click on something. Let's actually go back over to the gold bugs. Let's refresh this refresh my memory of what we're doing here. So we filled out the required fields there, filling in the message. Then we have to do these checkboxes, the radio button, the select, and the uh, the survey here. So that's what's left for us to do. Uh, so we got to click on that checkbox, right? So we want to click on the main page locators dot what is it called? No response required checkbox. Then we also have to click on the main page locators uh, public show radio button, right? We want a public show. Uh, and then we want, we've got that drop down. So main page locators. Uh, and then Got the select drop down. Uh, we want to let's just do other. I think there's Google, Facebook, um, maybe Instagram and other. So we'll just select other. And then we need to click on that radio button in the survey. So main page locators dot survey radio button. Uh, and that's all we need because we're just clicking on it. OK, great. Uh, and then to fill out the all fields, we're just gonna do self dot uh, fill fill required fields and self dot fill uh, non required fields. Right? Those are mutually exclusive. So if we do them both in a row, then they'll they'll all get filled out. Uh, fill out both. Make this doc string here. Fill out both required and non required 
fields in the form. Okay, and then finally, we've got a couple more to fill out here. Submit, submit the gold bugs form. Submit uh, the booking form. And this is just self.submit form. Uh, we can pass it that locator, right? Main page, locators dot uh, form element. That will submit the form. Get form failure div. This is get the div with the error message on failed form submission. So for this, we're just going to we want to return something, right? So we want to return self dot get element uh, main page locators, uh, and that's a form failure div. That's the locator tuple that we want, and then we want to return the success div as well to check that the form was submitted successfully. So main page locators dot uh, form success div. And that, let's add the, the uh, what is this, the doc string. So get the div with the thank you message on successful form submission. Okay, so I think that's it for now. Let me take a look at this. Yeah, so you, this is, I think, all we're going to do for now. Now we're actually at a place, if you take a look at all this, we're at a place where we can test it out. There's one or two other things that I want to change here before we end this lecture. But let's go back to our form test here and uh, take a look at stuff and take a look at our locators too. So locators, we don't really need to do anything here. Uh, we've got all the tuples that we need for this to work. I believe we can test it out now so we can check. Uh, and then we've got our testing class. So it'll set up, it'll start the web driver, go to that URL, uh, test the invalid form submission, get that form failure div on the page and uh, throw an alert if we don't see that on an invalid form submission and then it'll quit, right? That's how this uh, setup teardown stuff works. Then it'll set up again, test this uh, valid form submission. So click on the booking form link, fill out all the fields, submit the form, and uh, then check that you get that success div. Uh, and the way this, this is made so easy is through this inheritance here from the base page class that makes those low level interactions easy so that all we have to do in the main page class here is basically call those methods, which we get through inheritance, and then pass the uh, locator tuples and maybe something else, right? Like some text here if we want to enter some text. But that makes this really uh, pretty, pretty clean. So now what we're going to do is let's run this actually. Let's run this test and see what happens uh, here. So let's run that in the terminal. It should uh, open this up, right? Maximize it. And then, then it's just closed. Okay, so what's happened? Failed errors too. Okay, so we ran two tests and we failed them both. So when we need to check on something. So element not interactable. Okay, so we've got some errors here. And I think actually if you dig into this, what you'll find, I'm not going to go read through the error messages here. Well, you'll find it's because we're not waiting for the page to load, basically. So we're looking for elements on the page that aren't there yet. So what we need to do is we need to use those um, weights that we've seen before in the section on weights uh, to make sure that we're actually waiting for the web elements to be selectable or clickable or what have you. So we need to do some more import. So from selenium dot web driver dot support, let's import expected conditions, right? 
we'll import that as EC. Uh, then we've got the select. What else do we have? From selenium.webdriver dot support dot UI to import we need to import that web driver weight right uh, and then let's from selenium let's do some try catches too or try accept common dot exceptions let's import no such element exception and element click intercepted exception and you'll see where where we um, put that later on and then from our settings file let's import uh, the wait time constant so I think that's just 10 seconds that's just so that we don't have constant sprinkled sprinkled everywhere so the first place we're gonna wait is in this get element uh, method so let's get rid of that and then start from scratch so we're going to do this try and then accept fill this out as we go uh, now we want to use that web driver wait method that we saw right the explicit wait so web driver wait we're going to wait we're going to pass it self dot driver and then some wait time until we're waiting until expected conditions, presence of element, located. Then uh, we need the locator type and the locator string. And that's all. And once that's done, if that runs, then we want to return that element. And that's how we get an element. Uh, and then accept no such element. Exception, if that's the case, we'll call that E. And we'll say, we'll just print, uh, let's make this a formatted string, so an F string element with um, locator type of locator string not found, and then print that error message too. All right, so that's how we'll do the get element there. And then the other thing that we want to fix up is the uh, click. So we want to wait to make sure something is actually clickable when we do that, when we try to click on it. So let's try. We're going to do web driver wait. We don't need to return anything, so I'm not going to store this as a as a as a variable. Um, driver wait self dot driver. Then you need the wait time. We're going to be waiting until expected condition, and we need element to be clickable. That's what we want to happen. Then we pass it that tuple of the locator. Uh, what is this first? It's locator type, and then it's locator string. So you're going to wait for that and then as soon as that's done you can click on it, right? Uh, since WebDriver wait will return that web element. And then accept uh, element click intercepted exception as E. So that's if you can't click on it for whatever reason. Uh, we're going to print F same type of error message. So element click intercepted for uh, locator type and of locator string and then print that print that error message so now let's give this another try and see what happens I think with these changes, so with the additions of the explicit weights and the uh, try accept blocks, we should be able to run these tests successfully now. So now let's run this. It'll maximize the window. 
and it's waiting. So let's see. Okay. Let's see. I've got to take another look at this. It's going to close down, fail to read the scripture. Timeout. So two tests fail. Okay. So uh, let me take a quick look at this. Okay, guys. So I took a quick look as to why we're getting we're getting some errors uh, running this, and I realized that there were a couple of the locators um, that needed to be changed. So the two locators that we want to change are the booking form anchor. Uh, so if you go to Chrome, let's go back over to Chrome here. Where you, you're going to want to do is actually get the we can get the um, the full XPath. So that's not always the most ideal way to do this, right? But for now, this is the way that we're going to do it uh, because it works. Um, so the booking form anchor here, you're still using XPath but you've got this uh, whole XPath string here in order to get to that link and to click it. And then the other one that you're gonna, gonna wanna change is the form success div. Uh, so the ID, I think the ID changes every time you uh, put it in there, every time you submit the form. Uh, so it's not a reliable way of, of clicking on it or checking that it's there. But what you can do, if we go back here, uh, and let's submit this form again, is uh, now we get to do an email, john at doe.com, uh, subject, subject, whatever, uh, and then submit the form. Let's do that. Thank you. So if I click on that, thank you. Uh, it's got a class that we can use for now. So form submission text is the class that we can use to find this because if you see the ID has changed from what it was before uh, so that ID is not reliable uh, in terms of in terms of testing right at least in terms of testing so if you change those ones that's the form success div and the booking form anchor to what you can get from Chrome let's go ahead and run this test again and we should be able to run successfully so opens it up clicks on it goes down to the form fills it all out done right boom just completed the first test now this is running fills it out done submitted awesome ran two tests in 15 seconds okay no failures so that's great right I mean that's kind of what we want to see we just ran two tests in selenium uh, on our web page to check two different things that we wanted to validate we wanted to test that an invalid form submission failed, which it did, right, based on the test that we wrote, and we wanted to test that the valid form submission worked, which it did, based on the test that we wrote. Uh, and all we had to do to kind of fix things up was to fix these locators that were wrong and then add these weights into the way we were clicking and getting elements on, on a page. Uh, so that's it for this lecture. And in some sense, we could stop there. In the next lecture, what I'm going to go through is just a, uh, a few things that we can do to make it a little bit more self-contained and improve our test just a little bit uh, before we call it a done deal. Thanks, everybody, for joining, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hey everyone, welcome back to our final guided project here where we're testing out the form filling on the Goldbugs main page. So what I'm going to want to do in this lecture is just improve slightly the way that we're testing this web page. So I'm going to start by running the Python files again to test the website. And let's just think about what's going on here. So it did one. And now it's going to do the other. OK, so we ran our two tests and they ran successfully. But let's think about what was going on and what we might want to do to improve it. 
So at a basic level, we're opening up this web driver and service and getting the URL twice, right, for both of our tests. For each one of them, this setup and this uh, teardown down here happen because these are test level methods in unit test. So that means they run for each one of these tests. But we're only testing one web page, so if we want to make it better, we might just want to have it only open up once. And so you might be asking, well, is there a way to do that in unit tests to only have this stuff run once so that we can maybe test the invalid form submission, right? Test the valid form submission uh, by only opening up that web page once and not having to do it twice. And the answer is yes, there is actually a way of doing that and it involves some class methods in unit tests. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to remove all of this stuff from our setup because we don't want to use this anymore. This is just a test level setup method and as is teardown. So the teardown is a test level teardown method. We don't want to use that. What instead we want to use is we want to use a tear down class, which is in unit test. And then we'll do a setup class as well. And for both of these to work, you need to add a decorator calling them a class method. So this is a little bit more of unit test than it is uh, Selenium specifically, but it's still a nice way to make your Selenium testing of your website slightly cleaner, slightly more, uh, you know, advanced, if you will, or a little bit, uh, a little bit cleaner, I guess is the good way to put it. So this is, we'll call this a class level setup method. Uh, and then for this as well, we have to add that decorator to call it a class method. So let's start with the setup method for the class. So we want to set the service the same way we did before. So service executable path is just that Chrome driver path. And the driver is just going to be the, the web driver again, right? So web driver dot Chrome and the service is the class dot service, right? That we just set up in this in this method. Then we can do class dot driver dot maximize window to maximize the window. We can get the URL class dot driver dot get. Uh, then we need that gold bugs URL. And then the other thing we can do here is we can move up that instantiation of the main page. So we can just say class.mainPage is going to be main page. Since we're passing the driver, we can just give it class.driver, right? And then we can just call class.mainPage uh, click booking form link, right? Because that's part of that main page object. So now we've got the class setup. Now let's do the class teardown. So this is uh, this is a class level teardown method. Uh, and of course we want to quit the driver, but now this is a class dot driver dot quit. And this is just convention. When you have a class method, you usually say class instead of self. Uh, but you could still say self if you wanted to. It just makes it a little bit more more obvious. So now let's take a look at our testing methods. So by moving this main page up into the class setup, we can get rid of the main page on both of these tests. So we don't need to instantiate it anymore. And we don't need to click on the booking form link anymore because we've already done that. But what we do have to do is say this is a self. This is now part of the class, right? So self.mainPage, get that. And now that's how we want to change all of these, uh, these references. And you can do the same thing with uh, the valid form submission. With one exception being that we're going to call 
So we're testing the invalid form submission uh, and filling out the non-required forms and then submitting the form. But since we're not closing the window anymore, what we can do is just fill out the required fields. We've already got that method set up in our page class, our main page class. So if you look out here, we've got filled required fields, fill non-required fields, fill all fields, right? So we've already got that method written. Uh, and then here, make this self.mainPage again. Self.mainPage. And that is it. Let's add some, let's add a doc string here because I've forgotten to add the doc string. So test the submission of a form with required fields filled out. Uh, and this is not a placeholder test method. This is test the rejection of a form with required fields not filled out. Save that. So again, let's go through what's going on here. We're using unit tests uh, setup class method to only set up this web driver session and get the URL once and then to set up that main page object uh, and get us down to the form once so that we don't have to do that twice, right? Or worry about the order of operations here. So now let's run this and see what happens relative to what we had before. So it opens up, maximizes the window. Uh, it should get the URL. So there we go, gets the URL, clicks on it. And there we go. So ran two tests in about the same time. Uh, and yeah, so you should see what you should have noticed there. If we ran it again, you'd see we're only opening up that Chrome browser once, right? We're not opening it up twice to run two different tests. And so in that way, our, our tests are a little bit cleaner, a little bit more efficient. Again, that's something of a, maybe more of a unit test functionality than Selenium functionality, but it's a way of, of making your Selenium test a lot cleaner and a lot easier to read and maintain. Okay, thanks everybody for joining this one. You should be proud of what you've done with this guided project, right? It's fairly large, uh, it took a while to do. So if we walk through what we did again, we filled out all these locator tuples. So we went through the web page to figure out where things are, how we can locate them, and then we stored them in this common class so that we could access them elsewhere. We filled out a, uh, our page object model. So we started with the base page object, expanded on it to use weights to get elements, uh, and built out these common web actions in that base page class. And then we use those common actions like click and entering text to build specific actions for the Goldbugs website, right? Especially or specifically filling out that, that booking form and then submitting it, as well as getting, getting the divs that we needed to get to check whether the, the form was submitted successfully or not. And then finally in our testing, we initially had the test level setups with unit tests, uh, tested filling stuff out and making sure that it worked or didn't work as appropriately. And we improved it a little bit by using the class methods and the class level setups and teardowns so that we're only opening that session once to do our tests of the gold bugs URL. So a lot of stuff that went into that project if you made it this far, great job. You know, you've learned a lot, hopefully, in terms of how you can use Selenium to automate your testing or to scrape data from a web page. Uh, but thanks everybody for joining this lecture and for going through this project.